He's obviously a phenomenal player yeah. when when short of time. I've, okay, I've followed a lot of Niels's games and things like the Tata Steel and the Dil Canze, and uh, and he's always phenomenally well prepared. But I feel that if he does get short of time, he's perhaps more vulnerable mm-hmm. than than David would be to to making a a, a, a mistake. Uh, so if David can out prepare. Nils and put him under pressure right from the very beginning of the game. It'll be interesting to see if that uh, that changes the the dynamic for uh, for the whole game. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, as long as I've known David, he's always been in time trouble. Uh, so, so he has a lot of experience uh, playing with little time on the clock. But um, and he has been in time trouble. I would say all the three games so far in this match. Um, and some, somehow it just feels a bit uh, unnecessary, at least in opening, where you know basically what move to play and then spend, you know, 30, 40 minutes on, on seven, eight moves um, to get that disadvantage on the clock. But in today's game, uh, so far, he's been blitzing out. Uh, so what have we, we have a couple of moves? Yeah, so we have C5, which I guess is, uh, it's not the move I've seen most often. I'm definitely not a Grunfeld uh expert here um but i would imagine that bishop g7 is maybe the most popular move in this position just to put pressure on c5 but okay so on c5 and then i wonder what the idea is if black if uh, if white plays d takes c5 uh i would imagine that we follow up with bishop g7 here um yeah, seems reasonable. So, yeah, we can't be knight take c3, bishop takes c3. That feels like black is already basically lost. Uh, so either bishop g7 or knight a6, maybe. But, but yeah, I wonder about some line like this, for example. Uh, th- this feels like it should be completely fine for, for black. For example, uh, if knight takes c3, bishop takes c3, queen takes d1. And uh, either white has to play king takes d1, and we should have good compensation just you know, yeah. the center for a while, or rook takes, and this is uh, you know absolutely nothing to white. In fact, black is almost certainly back. Right? Maybe yeah. knight, knight d7 or knight a6. I'm just getting the c5 on black. Absolutely. So, so this is obviously not the way that white wants to play the position, and indeed not what uh, what David has done at all. So instead of taking that pawn on c5 straight away. David has played the move rook to c1. And now I guess if the trick is if uh, black takes on d4, you have queen, queen a4 check. I'm not okay. sure. So queen a4 check, there would, there would be knight c6. Yes. And I don't see any disaster happening to us on this yeah. on this c6 square unless I'm unless I'm overlooking something. It feels like the bishop needs to already be. Yeah. Jumping into some really yeah, dangerous good, square, good and, uh, and it seems a little bit too slow for me. Um, I would guess. Uh, so knight b5 doesn't feel like it really does anything in this position. Uh, let's just say we take, for the sake of argument. Ah, so ah, much, much more simple. Ah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the rook can take on c8. Yeah. yeah, rook can take on c8. I've been looking at too many positions where yeah. we do some kind of uh, some kind of pawn sacrifice and, okay, there's just a loose bishop on, on c8. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so okay, definitely not pawn takes d4 in this position. So, okay. The current game possession. Uh, and I would imagine maybe bishop g7 here. Yeah. Looks, looks natural. That seems like the, the most logical move. And yeah, we have all of this tension in the in the middle of the board. Is white going to play? Uh, is white going to play e4 at any point? Uh, when does white take on c5? So I think takes on c5 here is just bad because we, we transpose back to the line. What happens now after? But in this position, what happens after knight takes d5? Okay, so knight takes d5. Aha, uh-huh, and then and then rook takes c5. Rook takes c5 you want to play? Yeah, that's right. yeah, and then we have to to spend a move defending the bishop on on c8. So we would have to go back, and this feels just like a pawn. Yeah, absolutely. 
This feels absolutely like a pawn. So, so maybe black has to be a bit accurate uh, with this next move. Yeah. So if we're having problems with the bishop on c8, uh, knight c6 is, strikes me as a very logical next move to consider. Mm -hmm. And again, we ask ourselves the question, why why is white not a pawn up after pawn takes c5 here? Um, because to me, it looks it looks like white's a pawn up. Uh, I don't see any immediate counterplay. Obviously, white's pieces are a little bit slow mm -hmm. getting developed on the king side here, but uh, I would be very, very worried uh, if I was playing black in this position that that white was going to have a couple of moves to consolidate and then we're just going to be a pawn down for no reason whatsoever. But that would be a disaster for Nils. I, I would say so. I mean, uh, I mean, I'm surprised that he's thinking quite so much here but i cannot believe that he's not in in some kind of book okay i'm gonna i'm gonna guess that the move is knight takes c3 mm -hmm. i'm gonna guess knight takes c3 bishop takes c3 yeah this makes much more sense and now can we play the move bishop g7 yeah and then we're transposing. Yeah. Some of the, uh, yeah. Now, if we see pawn takes c5, we transpose back to this three variation. And we, okay, we've seen very, very comfortable. Uh, and I would guess more likely we end up in some kind of d5 game. To maybe my, be my guess as to how the game is going to go. Mm -hmm. And we see maybe bishop takes c3, and white could recapture either way. Uh, something like this. Maybe rook takes instead, black castles, and okay, white can either get a, get some normal peace development, or we see Harry the H pawn make yep. it, make its entrance at around about this position. And you know, basically, we get the pawn down to this where we deliver the checkmate on on G seven. Yeah, this is this is David's plan. All right, we do have a couple of moves. Okay. Uh, let's see what they played. Okay, so half white, we got we got knight takes c3, bishop takes c3, and then instead of the move bishop to g7, we see bishop h6 attacking this rook on uh, on c1. I have to admit that that move looks a bit peculiar. Um, can can you just play e3 and block the block the diagonal? Sure. Try and develop. Um, so if we take on d4, so we, we've bought a move to get castled. I, I don't know if queen takes makes much of a difference here, but let's say c takes, bishop takes, castled. And this looks completely fine for black, unless white has some good move that I'm uh, that I'm missing, but I don't think so. Uh, yeah. there's, there's just knight c6 coming, for example, uh, hitting the bishop on d4. And it doesn't seem to me that black has any real problems here. Certainly yeah. from a structural point of view. I agree. This, this looks, is, looks quite equal. Um, but I, I would be more worried about white maybe playing d5 or d takes c5 here and meeting meeting the attack to the rook on c1 with uh, with attack down to the rook on h8. So let's say, for example, pawn takes c5. Now, if black would have just take on c1, I'm not sure I fully believe this. Takes, takes. Uh, black doesn't have time to go f6 and try and trap the bishop. Who's bishop on c1? Uh, I guess here there's there's queen a5, Jack, and oh, no, then bishop c3. Um, this doesn't look like it should it like more to. And and what well, black should be going for for the time being, white is is a pawn up in this position. So yeah, um, it's all very very sharp. I, I kind of expected that we'd have a few minutes to warm up into this yeah, yeah. into this game, but uh, uh, but straight away going it's, at uh, it. it's incredibly incredibly sharp. So uh, if pawn takes c five, I would have guessed that maybe we see the move castles and e three. And maybe here black has some decent compensation for the pawn. Um, 
again, I'm not, yeah, it's not, it's not clear. Um, I guess uh, white always can play b4 and a3 and just try and hold on. But we do actually have a couple of moves, so we can um, yeah. have a look. But it, this was a very interesting uh, Yeah, I'm intrigued as to... Yeah, I'm sure that this is this is absolutely in David David's notes. So there must be a reason why why yeah. take c5 isn't, isn't played in this position. Instead, we see he, he actually went for the move that you wanted to play, which okay. is uh, just pawn to e3. And now... Uh, C takes D4. Yeah, Bishop takes D4. We actually, we actually, uh, oh, no, no, sorry, we this actually is... have uh, another move in this position. Ah, Bishop B5 check, sorry. It's also interesting because you mentioned this Bishop H6 to kind of gain uh, a tempo you want to, to castle. And I guess David is trying to, to achieve the same with Bishop, uh, Bishop B5. Yeah, and maybe one idea here is just to gain some kind of structural advantage if well, if knight c6, we could take straight away and mess up the pawn structure. But maybe stronger is just an immediate bishop takes d4, queen takes d4. And, uh, okay, we have an attack on the rook mate trade and the knight on c6. Don't... Actually, I suspect that uh, white doesn't want to attempt to win the pawn on c6 yeah. just yet. Because it, it feels like rook takes c6. Bishop d7. Yeah. Looks nasty. And, uh, yeah, this is not the, this is not the pawn that... David was trying to win here. But, okay, we can take on t6 and then just leave the pawn there. Yeah. Play a sensible move like knight to f3, get ready to castle. And uh, and it feels to me like white white should be a little bit better in this ending. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, okay, lots of pieces on the board, but it, it feels already like uh, it's becoming a bit technical. And uh, yeah, white can just aim to play against the weakness of the pawn on c6 uh, the longer the game goes. So this seems to me like the, the major problem that, that Niels is going to have to, to deal with after bishop b5 check. Okay, and we do see the move knight to c6 played. I was just wondering if, uh, if instead we'd see the move bishop b7 instead. But, aha, uh -huh. one, one issue here is now that uh, we're going to move queen takes d4. Well, Obvi obviously... Uh, you don't want to castle now in in this position. Absolutely, that's 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 the way we've been relying on, on yeah. saving our rook on h8. But here there is a small flaw <laughs> with uh, with castle queen by just the queen just yeah. comes down, and we would have a very early a short day at the end to our uh, <laughs> to our commentary. And uh, yeah, so I, so I think bishop d7 is probably just a disaster after queen takes d4. What a sharp opening! You really have to, uh, yeah, yeah, you have to play the, the right moves. Yeah, but I'm just intuitively, I don't know if bishop takes c6 is because um, I mean the, the the light squared bishop for black can have a fantastic diagonal on a6, trying to prevent white from castling, and um, after bishop takes d4, the queen might come to a5 in some uh, variations. Yeah, um, especially the light squared bishop. Um, coming to a6 looks, I don't know, maybe it's not, uh, maybe it's not uh, an issue at all, but uh, so let's say after bishop takes the castle and queen of three, knight, bishop, knight of three, and then uh, yeah, so it's knight of three. I could maybe put the knight on e2, but okay, let's let's just demonstrate knight to f3 and then bishop a6. Uh, and obviously uh, you can take on, on c6, but um, I'm just a little bit worried about the white king. Maybe you have time to. Then I was thinking maybe just b5 or. Yeah, bishop b5, rook, uh, rook c5, a6, for example. Uh, you might have, yeah. Might if, have if, a5. if a4, I can play queen a5, Jack. Yeah. I think, and then pick up the ball on, a, um, on a4. So, yeah, so here white would at least have a big, big problem to solve, which is how we're going to get the king on e1 to, to some kind of safety. And one one solution to this is maybe just to to organise the exchange of queens somehow. Yeah. Uh, play a move like bishop c3 and try and move off. Uh, use the threat of queen d4 and our good old mating yeah. mating attack on h8 to to save the black. Uh, it's double edged. Both both uh, both players have. Uh, yeah, but I mean, even, even if the queen, ideas. Yeah, even if the queens come off though, it kind of reminds me of these martial endings that uh, if you have the two bishops. Yeah. Uh, and a few chances in the ending, but uh, it's very, very difficult to, to actually win any, any of these positions. Yeah. Obviously, there's the chance of it turning into an opposite color bishop position. Uh, I guess white is the one that's playing for the win here, but it's maybe not not such a big advantage. I just feel black has enough 
compensation for the bump uh, and the rooks uh, can be positioned quite quickly. And yeah, if you somehow manage to reorganize uh, to get the black squared, the dark squared bishop in a better position as well, I think black is doing. Right? Yeah, I think you make a good point. Uh, the fact that this bishop on uh, on h6 is slightly out of the game. If we could magically transport it over to yeah. b6, for example, I think black would have have zero problems. Uh, I may even be the one that was sort of trying to press in this position. Yeah. But with it slightly caught out of the game with no, no particularly obvious route back in, because, uh, okay, we don't, we really don't want to touch this pawn on f6 again and push it forward to f5. It, it feels like suddenly yeah. we're giving away uh, a lot of squares. But, um, but yeah, I wonder if we if we go back. Uh, I was just about to say that maybe maybe the idea would be to recapture on d4 with uh, with the queen in this kind of position. Queen takes the ball immediately. Forward. But again, I uh, it feels like we've got something very similar to that in the game. Wow. Let's just have a look. So so he started off with the move. Queen takes d4, forcing the queens off. Mm -hmm. uh, and now now we see castles. And bishop takes c6, b takes c6. And okay, so here is where we covered. Uh, we definitely don't want to play this move up takes c6 yeah. because of bishop b7. But uh, but we have our our Harry has, uh, right. has entered the action. Love to see it. With the move h4 here. Yeah, I mean it makes a lot of sense. Um... Yeah, so if you had move 13. For, for uh, Harry joining the action, then congratulations. That's a, that's a very good prediction. Um, okay, so one nice thing about this move, I guess, is that uh, we don't have to solve our problem of our king on e1. Yeah, I was just about to say that if if the if Black's the light square bishop ever goes to a6, you maybe the king can just stay on e1 for now, and if you even have some rook lift later on, uh, bringing the h1 rook. Uh, into the game. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, I mean, the king on e1 looks perfectly safe to me. Yeah. It, it, now there's no queen on the board. Bishop on h6 is the only piece that could could realistically put the king in check for any time. And it, it simply can't get over to the to the a5 diagonal to, no. to put any pressure on this king whatsoever. Uh, and I think there's a there's a strong positional idea behind h4 here. I mean, okay, so we, we might be slightly eyeing up h8 as a mate in the square, but mostly let's just Give some kind of null move to black. Let's say we go super defensive and play uh, bishop to, to b7. Uh, and now we play the move h5, uh, threaten to take on uh, on g6. And we're going to use this to force black to exchange off uh, the dark square bishop. If we go bishop to g5, then white can play knight f3, hit the bishop on g5. So maybe instead we see bishop g7. And okay, let's just say for simplicity, we take this off. And play knight f3, and black is left with this bad bishop on b7. And okay, if we can if we can manage to blockade the pawn by playing a move like uh, e5, uh, eventually knight d4, uh, and just put as much pressure as we possibly can on that pawn on c6, black is up uh, in for a very long defensive task in this kind of position. I would say. Yeah, I mean the the, the c6 pawn is just. Uh... Really, really weak, uh, in my yeah, in my opinion. You can double in the the C file, and um, I can't really see um, the benefits of having a bishop versus knight uh, in this type of position. Yeah. So okay, so the current game position is after H4, and okay, so I'm not expecting Mills to play a super defensive move. Uh, like bishop to b7 here. But uh, I'm wondering, so there's still not a threat of playing rook takes c6 because of bishop to b7. But I don't see a way for us to stop white from playing the move h5 here, for example. So okay, if we play bishop g4, we're just going to get our bishop trapped after f3. This feels like it's going to be some kind of disaster. Yeah. Uh, okay, this is no, I'm sorry, this is the end of the game. Bishop just lost on h5. So 
I would be very, very uncomfortable. And uh, David is clearly still in prep here, I would imagine. Uh, for the first time, we, we see him actually with the lead on the clock. Uh, only used a couple of minutes so far. And yeah, I would say Niels has a has a real problem to solve here. Yeah, absolutely. And and you mentioned it, uh, David has only spent a couple of minutes and we're already at move uh, 13. So <laughs> the other games, he's down to, I don't know, one hour and 10 minutes uh, after after the same amount of moves. And I just feel, yeah, David is really prepared. And uh, I think he has a, I think he's very happy with his position uh, out of the opening now. And uh, it reminds me a little bit of yesterday's game. Then David with the black pieces had the, the bishop here, but some weaknesses he had to, had to defend or at least uh, think about. And uh, yeah. I have a feeling it's a, it's a similar type of game today, but uh, this time, David, with the, with the white pieces. Yeah, it looks sort of even more technical today because, uh, okay, black, let's say the obvious black obviously doesn't have any knights in this position, mm -hmm. so uh, uh, it's kind of tricky to see how we generate tricks in this kind of position. But uh, I'm wondering maybe about the move bishop to e6. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, so obviously we're we're not defending this pawn on uh, c6, but firstly we we put pressure on the pawn on uh, on a2, and we also always have to move bishop d5 either after rook takes d6 or even maybe just you know let's say white goes a3, we play uh, bishop d5 here for example. Uh, I'm going to assume white plays a move like pawn to a3. And I was wondering if we could play e5, but maybe that's just a just a concession of e5. Maybe this isn't really achieving anything. But I don't know. What do you think about playing a move like f5 here? I mean, this is this is my uh, experience playing the Dutch coming out. I'm yeah. I'm, I'm not comfortable that I haven't that I've uh, I don't I haven't weakened my position enough. So I'd, <laughs> I'd like to make one more yeah. very, very committal pawn move. But but, but I. I mean, at first uh, it looks a bit uh, weakening, and it might be, might very well be that. But at the same time, you really have to to look after the the c six pawn, and um, if you have time, you can also try and pair uh, with rook e eight e five. Um, so maybe, yeah, maybe that's uh, that's a way to. What should White then try and do? Try and get the, the knight into the game? Yeah, somehow. so if if the knight can land magically on e5, yeah. uh, then uh, preferably with the dark side, which being sort of well, yeah. well, so... I would uh, say that's a dream setup uh, for White, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. So, you know, I, I do a lot of work with, with sort of coaching and in these kind of positions, I'd say, you know, want to talk to my students and say, you know, I'd, what's your ideal dream position sort of look like? And okay, so, you know, well, these two bishops swapped off, the dark square bishop swapped off, the knight sitting on, on e5 where it, it cannot be touched, uh, and then rooks on c5 and c1, pawn on b4, something like that. And uh, and the pawn on uh, on c6 would be doomed. You know, white would be looking to, to win it, plus other things. Mm -hmm. So uh, at the same time, this is obviously what Nils knows he's absolutely uh, would hate to, to do. So one exit, one way that black could avoid that, uh, which I don't know. So yeah, the one problem for black here is that he can never get the bishop back into the game because as soon as the bishop, let's play the move knight e2, as soon as the bishop goes to, to g7, it will immediately be swapped off. And then it all, it all turns quite sharp because if black was able to play the move pawn to e5, I guess this would solve most of the problems. But maybe it's not so easy to to organize that here. Um, One thing though for black is maybe to try and uh, get some counterplay with rook b8 uh, and if b4 a5 just to try and um, yeah let's say um, yeah so maybe maybe rook from f8 to b8 yeah uh, pawn pawn goes up to b4 and we go a5. We try and hit before before White has fully coordinated yeah. and, uh, and brought out this rook on h1. Um, so maybe something like like bishop c5, for example, pawn takes pawn. 
Uh, uh, so yeah, one issue with playing F F3 is we forced this weakness on, on E3, so we cannot take back on B4 without allowing bishop takes E3. So, so we'd be forced to play pawn takes pawn, and okay, something like rook A2 here, for example. Mm -hmm. And it feels like black is active enough in this position to not have too many problems. Yeah, absolutely. And and now if bishop takes E7, I guess you have rook E8, and then yeah, we suddenly, have, suddenly white. We have rook E8. We can take an E3 yeah. immediately again. This feels absolutely not like uh, what White is trying to do. Yeah. So White, White has to try and achieve all of these things. But yeah, I, I, I think you're right. We're quite likely to see something like this. And um, I'm expecting quite a long thing from, from Neil to, in this position, actually. Mm -hmm. But uh, but I don't see I like a your like alternative that, yeah, I, I like your suggestion, uh, Bishop E6. Mm -hmm. It's a developing move and um, makes it easier to defend uh, the pawn on, on c6. Yeah. Because there's no good way to stop uh, h5. So you have to focus maybe on, on, uh, on this, the other weakness in the, in the position. Yeah, absolutely. C6 and, and a7. Yeah. Uh, oh, well, I think a5 is maybe the other candidate move yeah. I, would, I would consider here. Uh, freeing up the rook on a8, maybe making it harder for white to play this a3 b4 plan. Yeah, and it is and, uh, it is thematic, you know, this minority pawn attack you know, on the queen side, uh, bring the rooks uh, over. And if if uh, white doesn't have time or manage to to break through on the king side, I think black could try and counterplay with this type of uh, plan. Yeah. yeah. And um, we are following uh, your uh, comments and questions on, uh, on uh, YouTube. And David writes, I'm surprised how prepared these players are. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know more about uh, preparation than me, Tom. But uh, yeah, I can just assume they put a lot of time and effort into preparing, not only for this match, but just in general, uh, at, the top, at the highest level in chess. How, how much time uh, they actually spend on, on prepare, preparing? It's a, it's a good question. I mean, uh, so I, I don't know how long ago this ma match was announced and when, when the players knew about it. But uh, yeah, I think at least a few months ago. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I assume these players have, have very, very long detailed files on, on all of these these things. I mean, even, even relative sidelines. I mean, we seen things like the World Championship match, just how uh, how far players have analysed even even relatively unusual lines, and the the value of getting the first supplies in. It don't it doesn't need to be theoretically uh, an advantage for white. You know, those are, are very few and far between. But if you can get to a position that you know you've looked at, you know, the day of the game, and your opponent is trying to remember. Things that uh, we, you know, looked at a few weeks ago, and you know, can get confused between, you know, the precise details of some of these lines. Then that's often where your advantage lies in the white pieces. I think it's interesting that we see this in game four. Yeah, uh, it's not unusual in these kind of long matches and for the first two or three games to be, you know, you fill out the opponent. You know, obviously these players will know uh, what openings the, their opponents have played in the past. But uh, you, you never know 100% for sure, you know. Uh, perhaps Nils was going to surprise David with some different opening. Uh, and so, so sort of first time you play d4, you see what your opponent does, and you, you, you play some fairly non-theoretical line, and then you start hitting him with, you know, uh, different sidelines one after another and yeah. really testing his things. So you're kind of saving up some of the uh, ideas for later in the match. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we sort of saw that from, from Mills in the first game. We saw uh, a very uh, a very committed attack on uh, on David's uh, Berlin uh, mm -hmm. in the Wolo Pez. But uh, but I don't expect Mills to repeat that line again. It was it really is a once and you know, you catch your opponent by surprise and then of course they're gonna go away, check up the line and yeah. and, and Find improvements. You know, find find improvements and yeah. be very very comfortable. So, um, yeah, this feels like the first slight opening win for for David, and 
And yeah, we have this long think for anyone else. How long, how long has he been considering this move for now? I think 15, about 15 minutes. Yeah, so this is our current position after H4. Yeah. Yeah, and I completely agree with you. And um, just looking at, uh, at the clocks, David has spent two minutes. Uh, it's just incredible. Uh, thinking how much time he's spent uh, in the three first games of the match. And you, you touched upon it, uh, the World Championship match. And it's amazing because both of the players playing in the World Championship match, they have a team of other strong, incredibly strong chess, strong chess players preparing for months and months. And obviously they cannot be able to use all of those preparations in one single match. So I would, I would assume that both uh, Magnus Carlsen and Janne Pomjakshin still has a lot of interesting ideas, which they might be able to play uh, in 2022 for the upcoming tournaments. And I wouldn't be surprised if, if Jan, for example, has a good year in terms of uh, his results. Yeah, I think we've even seen you know, that to, to some extent. Uh, he, he obviously went away for a little bit and then came back and did very well in the... Uh, I think it was the world blitz rather than the world record that uh, he lost out in the tiebreak. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's not unusual for, for both players to, to get a bump from, from playing in the world championship. And I, I assume it's one of the reasons that this, this match has been arranged is that it's it's uh, absolutely fantastic practice for, for both of these players to, to play, you know, a player of you know roughly their own their own playing strength. In a, in a 10 game match, you have to very, very seriously prepare. Uh, you know that your opponent is searching for any tiny um, chink in your in your opening armor. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if that gets exploited, then, you know, it can go one of two ways. Uh, the, the big disaster is that you lose some game, especially with the black pieces uh, early on in the match in your, in your favorite opening, and it's blasted wide open and you you're suddenly scrambling for what you can do uh, the remainder of the match. Uh, obviously, that hasn't happened at all here. But, um, but yeah, uh, I'm sure the players will have uh, huge amounts of ideas. May, maybe they even have a, a base outline for what they want to do in, in, in most of the games. You know, uh, each, each player will get five games with white. And so far, they've stuck to the same... The same first move so you know we've seen e4 from Niels every game uh, and d4 from david so um i don't know if that will be a trend that we that we see continue but um but yeah i think that uh perhaps the the preparation for this match is, is one of the most important features yeah. for, for both of these players yeah, absolutely and uh yeah maybe this can be um uh, maybe this will change the momentum a little bit for David if he feels that okay, finally I'm able to to put some pressure out of the opening. But he he also must have felt that Nils uh, somewhat winning the opening battle so far. Match, but just having a good experience, you know, you feel confident. You spend two minutes. Uh, you have a very pleasant position to play, I would say. And um, maybe that will give him that uh, confidence going forward um, to win this match. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, uh, it's like a football match, right? You know, the, yeah. it, the, this match is like a, it's, it's a game that's stuck at nil-nil and we just need that first goal so that, you know, it can explode into action. And, uh, even though the, the players are incentivized to, to win the games with the, with the prize structure of this match, it's still being incredibly cagey, yeah. you know, uh, Chess players absolutely hate losing, you know, perhaps more than, than they enjoy winning. Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's all very well in theory to say, oh, it doesn't matter, you know, lose one swashbuckling game with black and then I'll come out fighting the next day and I'll, I'll win with the white pieces. But, uh, but if, they, if that's going to happen, someone has to lose the first game. Yep. And, that, and in a match that's this tight, uh, I'm not expecting more than sort of two or three decisive games. And it may be just like we saw in the World Championship match. Was it five draws they had? Yeah, five draws. And then they played this epic game six. It yeah. lasted for uh, hours and hours and hours. Uh, and that's funny because um, historically, game six in World Championship matches have been decisive games. 
-hmm. many game six uh, have been discussed. So people were, there was something in the air that day uh, before game six, people had a feeling uh, we might see a decisive game. And I have to say, Jan Pomnepci was doing great in that game uh, for a long, long time. And then Magnus, you know, uh, in his typical style, managed to grind out the win uh, in the end game. Um, but I like the I like the the parallel to a football match because now we're approaching halftime soon. Uh, we've they played 30, 30 some minutes, and um, yeah, both have had chances defending well. But uh, like in football, if one of the the teams get get the goal, uh, the match will open up a little bit. You know, uh, you have attacks, counter attacks, and uh, yeah, we might see uh, with a win, for example, today. Uh, the match opening up a little bit and uh, gloves are off. Yeah, so today, for example, let, let's say hypothetically that, that David was able to win this game. Uh, perhaps Nils would then, you know, he, he has, let's say, uh, three opening options for, for tomorrow's game. Mm -hmm. And he goes, OK, I'm going to go for the, for the more risky of the three options here. I'm going to, you know, up the ante and, you know, and really go for it. And that can obviously go one of two ways. You can you can bounce back with the immediate victory, or you can you can put that extra pressure on yourself and and maybe you're uh, you're going for for some, some kind of full sacrifice that isn't completely sound and you're you're hoping to catch your opponent off guard and it and it backfires and and suddenly the match can be could be collapsing. Yep. So um absolutely so uh Nils will be very very determined not to to uh, to give up that first defeat and i don't know I, it always feels really unfortunate to say this sort of thing you know 40 minutes into what could potentially be a, a six seven hour game but uh but i think if nils could escape with a draw from this position i think he would absolutely bite your hand off if you if you offer that to him mm -hmm. right now uh he's been been slightly surprised in the opening he has just this this couple of small Positional issues that he has to deal with at some point, and uh, and and I really, I really liked H four in David's last one. Uh, really makes a lot of sense, and uh, yeah, Nils has been thinking now for over twenty minutes. Yeah. For one month. Um, yeah. Any sort of suggestions from from chat in this position? Uh, what do we, what do we think Nils should play here? Yeah. So, we I've covered the move bishop e6 and, and a5. We don't have any assistance here, so uh, help us out with some uh, some good uh, suggestions for, for Nils to play. Yeah, at least this is the kind of position that I feel we should be able to discuss yeah. uh, relatively easily without the use of a computer. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, you know, we embarrassed ourselves a little bit early <laughs> on, you know, hang hang one or two pieces yeah, yeah, in, a, I mean, in a very that's how it is a very a very sharp opening line but uh, okay the que the queens are off and, and yeah. all of the plans are, are very very strategic i mean and, and compared to some of the earlier games in the match i mean game 1 game 2 they're so complex uh, with all these different lines and variations and i agree with you this is a bit more straightforward and and more uh, strategic battle uh, and i think this is a type of position that will suit david David's playing style uh, more so than uh, Nils. So I think David is super happy with the development uh, in this game. Yeah, I'm just I'm searching around for for different ways to find this position as black. But uh, would you ever consider just give up d6 pawn and then try to to get it go active uh, somehow? I, I think absolutely, but uh, is it so, too early maybe to, to well. We have to do so. We have to create some kind of counterplay. Um, but okay, let's see the let's see the move should be six again and pawn to pawn to a three. Uh, I'm just trying to think of, of ways that maybe that might happen. So let's say let's create some threats in this. So let's say we play the move work after the eight. Uh, we have a, a nice cheapo, so we're hoping that David gets yeah. overexcited with pushing his eighth form, setting up threats like this. And whoops, the bishop on d4 falls, and uh, and we have this rather nasty pin on this diagonal. Uh, okay, so of course David won't play this, and he'll play a move like knight to f3, defend this. Uh, I'm struggling to think of a reason why we might give this pawn up. Okay, let's say we play a5. 
Uh, white takes this pawn, for example. Bishop d5, rook c7. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering if, if black is getting counterplay quickly enough here. Mm -hmm. uh, so rook to c8. Uh, any kind of ending, uh, the pieces that need to be activated more than anything else are the rooks. And okay, so this rook on h1 is still not in the game. White, white can still castle. It seems a bit yeah. odd to do that after having uh, played h4, but it's still it's still a legal possibility. Yeah, absolutely. Takes, takes, king d2. And this feels like the kind of position where black isn't that far away from having enough counterplay uh, for the pawn. But I I don't see a way to yeah. to do anything before that c1 comes in. So we could play the move like four, for example, threatening rook down to c2. But white just about has time to go rook t1. And again, it feels like we are... It feels like white is pre-rolling a bit, you know, yeah, playing, yeah. playing for two results, right? Uh, in yeah, this position. absolutely. And, you know, we'd, we'd be hoping to set up some kind of fortress as, uh, as black in position with 8-4. But uh, as Magnus tells us, there are no, yeah. there are no fortresses. <laughs> and uh, and He's my, not a believer yeah. in fortresses. And my, my suspicion is this ending is, is winning for white. So, so absolutely, there can be some uh, some... Ways of giving up the pawn like this, but uh, but we actually have a move from Nils, and, and as as expected, we we see Bishop e6. But I have an idea now. Uh, after Bishop e6, and then you take on c6. You want to take straight away. Yeah, and and the 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 point is after let's say Bishop d d5, you just go Rook c7, and after Bishop takes g2, uh, Rook eight. Now you're threatening a7 and. Uh, Probably not enough. Yeah, because, it, yeah. You go back and get the uh, a two pawn. Yeah, right? it feels like it. You're super uh, uncoordinated here as white. Yeah. So e even if I wasn't to take this pawn on a two, for example, if I swung this over, uh, compared to the previous line, uh, this rook on h two is uh, is a long way from uh, from joining us over where it needs to be. On, yeah. the, on the queen side, maybe, maybe, still, maybe you have knight e2, for example, and then you try and play f4, and then you get the rook to to d2 or yeah. Uh, okay, and I, I think you are going to force him to take this pawn on a2 yeah. at, at some point, and uh, yeah, it's probably nothing. Yeah, and, and I, uh, I think black has no problems at all. Yeah, in this position. so it's a bit too uh, too optimistic. There. Yeah, I would, I would be kind of surprised if we didn't see. Uh, a3 here. Oh, oh I'm going to wow. be. Kind of, I'm kind of surprised. <laughs> okay. Right. So, so that, have... that also makes sense because you have a um, concrete uh, threat now. Yeah. So just to see if we, if Black takes the pawn on a2, then h takes g6, and okay, not not such a complicated tactic. We we have to move the bishop on g7, and uh, I don't know if this is completely losing, but it seems to lose a pawn for. For no reason yeah. whatsoever here. So, so yeah, I don't, I don't think we'll see this. So, I, I guess we're just forcing Bishop back to G seven. Uh, again, Bishop G five is going to run into Knight F three. Yeah, there's, there's maybe some kind of argument for wanting to go this way so that if takes, we at least get control over the E five square. But but now it's almost tempting to yeah, you don't even take on G six. Yeah, like I, some other move. I guess we solve this problem. Uh, for the most part, I assume we're but playing. But do you prefer a playing a three or because b three is met by a five? I reckon. Yeah, but still, I feel the only problem in in White's position is, uh, yeah, those two pawns on the queen side can be um, put under some pressure. Um, with the eight pawn and rook b8 and, yeah. and the bishop on e6. Yeah, so I don't I don't feel like this position would be very much for white. Okay. Uh, in fact, it's a little bit awkward to take this pawn straight away. But, uh, actually, I was about to blunder all of my pieces. Yeah, yeah, nice. Like, oh, we have this nice, <laughs> nice simple, nice simple yeah, pin, but uh, nice, but uh, uh, yeah. But wow, I'm I'm surprised now. That, uh, yeah, Nils played the uh, last movie play now. So. Okay, I mean, yeah. So the move he's played is uh, is pawn to g five, 
And I think that uh, we can't talk about this without talking about the move Bishop G7. So my guess is that he simply felt that this was very comfortable for white for some reason. So I don't know if we're supposed to play knight f3 first. Uh, let's just have a look at what I would suggest as maybe the simple very Bishop takes g7, king takes g7. Uh, I guess we play a3. We can obviously flick in this move h6 check at some point. But I'm, I'm just wondering what Nils was afraid of in this kind of position, for example. And again, it feels like we, we have this counterplay fairly quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah. This looks okay for Black, I think. Yeah, this is... this you is... managed to trade off uh, A and C for A and, a and B, uh, Black should be fine, right? Yeah. yeah I don't even see a, a very easy way that, uh, that White could do that because any time that we uh, we start uh, trying to win the pawn on c6, yeah, black yeah. black is not going to go off the pawn on b4. Yeah, yeah. Black's going to play rook a1, yeah. and uh, yeah, this position feels. Yeah, we can take this pawn now, and rook b1 is coming. And, yeah. uh, very very bad news for white. So I don't think that kind of thing exactly would happen, but I'm I'm intrigued as to to what, what David would indeed have, have done. Um, I don't know, maybe maybe we've uh, misassessed the position and Nils is in fact, doesn't feel he has any problems at all. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, yeah. G, G5 is very, very combative. You know, it's saying that he wants to hold on to the two bishops for a little bit longer. Yeah. We, you know, even have dreams of, of doing terrible things, touching the F1 again. Yeah. And, you know, I've been I've been warned off <laughs> of playing the move F5. I think you know F6 makes more sense in some positions, but it's kind of saying, you know, okay, David, show me, show me what you got. What's your what's your plan? Yeah. Um, and there's even the the possibility that later on this pawn on H5 can become a weakness. Yeah. If uh, if the rook on if, if, white, if white develops some pieces and brings the rook to the center, then black can always play play bishop g4 at some point. Yeah. And okay, this one here, and you know white would be tied down to defending this pawn at some point. So it's it's a very very concrete move that I must admit I I was completely not expecting, uh, and it seems like maybe David was was not expecting this response as well. For the first time, maybe David is uh, is thinking for himself rather yeah. than, uh, than following his notes. So I, I'm going to predict that uh, that we see a first David Howell yeah. trademark thing. Think. Yeah, uh, absolutely. We we're what we're a couple of minutes. So he's been thinking two or three minutes. I'm going to I'm going to predict at, at more than fifteen minutes. Yeah, th this position. And uh, uh, I don't want to take you up on a bet because I, I agree with you. So I think it's time to we take a short break and um, we'll be back with the action in, uh, in a few minutes. So stay tuned. I moved away from the city 13 years ago. I worked as a journalist, I studied in university, but there was a sense of longing towards something a bit more real where I could actually create things and, and uh, be much closer to nature. I'm a vegan farmer. That's a bit unusual, but uh, that's what I am. It's a long story. I used to be one of those people that thought that veganism is impossible, very deeply entrenched in, in like the small scale uh, animal farming uh, community. You know, I was a leading proponent for keeping pigs and, and uh, doing animal husbandry, but with a human uh, touch. 
Well, as our business grew, our farm expanded and our shop started selling more and more meat and eggs and milk. It felt less as I was doing something good for the animals and more and more as I was just showing a happy face for uh, any kind of animal product consumption. It felt like I was a poster boy for, for the animal industry in itself. So I, I, uh, that didn't feel so good, to be honest. So we're picking for the bags and it's 15 bags. It makes uh, about three kilos, just a little bit extra to be sure. I came across veganism on YouTube, actually, and um, a lot of the things they were saying started to make a lot of sense. The first year or so was really difficult. I made a lot of enemies, unfortunately, because most of my friends were also farmers with animals on their farm. And when I started posting on Facebook that I was a vegan and I was against killing animals and all that stuff, and that wasn't too popular with my farmer friends. <laughs> there were just so many questions also that we had to answer. What are you gonna eat instead? It's not easy to make a dietary change, but it's even more difficult to make a change in a farm. Our whole infrastructure, everything we had on the farm was based around animals. We sold the animals, uh, took down all the fencing, we tore down the animal houses, uh, and uh, if you don't have animals, you still have to uh, produce something on your farm, obviously, and we put a lot of effort into growing different beans and legumes. There's enormous potential in switching from animal uh, agriculture into vegan agriculture, purely from an efficiency uh, viewpoint. You know, if you grow one hectare of beans and uh, compare that to one hectare of uh, grass for sheep, you will find that the beans produce, I think it's up to 10 times as many calories on the same amount of land. Animals aren't a very efficient way often to produce food, you know. You, your food kind of takes a, an extra way through the animal, you know. You grow grains, you give them to the animal, and then you eat the animal, you lose a lot on the way. Instead, if you grow grains and make that into a product that's eaten directly by humans, you know, you're just taking a shortcut and, and being more efficient also. We're approaching nine billion people here on the planet. We need to be more efficient with the land we already have. And I think yeah, going into vegan farming, that will be one of the most important steps we can take. I still have friends who have animals, uh, I don't mind that. There's many places that are not suitable for vegan farming. You can only grow grass there. This is one of them, it's a beautiful place. There's no one model that fits everybody. Uh, different farms have different uh, possibilities and you have to adapt to the way your farm is. And uh, this is uh, yeah, a beautiful place where animals graze. Uh, I like that also. But there should be alternatives. <laughs> We're not bound by tradition anymore. You can just, instead of doing like your parents or your neighbors do, Google your way and just find, uh, you know, some guy in New Zealand is doing a thing and copy that guy instead.
before seen gourmet concept shaped over millions of years featuring 100% natural ingredients and four Michelin starred chefs so put on your best clothes shine your shoes and get ready because you're going to Sweden the biggest gourmet restaurant in the world. That's right, we have turned our whole country into a restaurant. You see, here in Sweden, fine dining is just around the corner, in our nature, and everyone is invited. Together with our star chefs, we have composed a do-it-yourself menu from ingredients that you can forage in our forests fields and lakes. To make it easier for you to experience what our nature has to offer, we have placed tables and cooking kits in a few pretty nice spots around the country. Reserve your seat at visitsweden.com. If it's fully booked, don't worry. There's another 100 million acres of fine do-it-yourself dining available for you. Always close, always open. Simple, healthy, and delicious. Welcome to Sweden, the edible country. I don't really know what my expectations were when I grew up. I just wanted to make games. I didn't really consider where that would take me. Today, I am the chief creative officer here at Mojang in Stockholm. We have more than 120 million monthly active users and more than 200 million sold copies of Minecraft. I often get a question on why is Minecraft so successful? I believe it's the way you interact with the world. It's very simple and uh, you have a big impact on just small actions. You quickly realize that you can build anything so it gives you a very sense of uh, empowerment. <laughs> I came to Mojang because I've always been making games my entire life. Marcus Passion, he created Minecraft and his idea was to create more games with the support of the success of Minecraft. I got asked if I knew someone that could help them develop a new game. I said, well, I volunteer myself. For the first year, it was just me and Marcus working on Minecraft. It was really in the spirit, as we say in the, in the industry, like we were just doing things for fun. Sometimes we could have an idea on, on the Monday that was released on the Friday. So it was very high tempo <laughs> and uh, a lot of fun. When I started, the game had already sold 700,000 copies, uh, which was amazing and more or less unheard of in the, like, in the game scene. We believed that we had peaked but we quickly realized that Minecraft is here to stay. So that meant that I would take over the lead development of the creative vision for Minecraft. I think the most fun part about making games is the early phase where everything is possible. 
And it's both about creating a world, but also creating the rule sets of this world. When I look around, I always look at things and think about them in terms of game development. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's a, it's a blessing or a curse. For instance, when we were on a holiday in Singapore, and they have these amazing plants that grow on the trees, like flowers. And I was thinking, oh, that we could... Hi, everyone, and welcome back from uh, the break. Uh, we're live with game four of the special challenge match between uh, David Howell and Nils Grandelius. We're playing here in the heart of London at the Swedish Embassy. And we've, uh, yeah, we're uh, in, in an interesting position here in game four. We believe uh, David has a, has a slight edge, uh, but uh, it looks like Nils is putting up uh, a good fight and finding some, uh, some interesting uh, ideas. And I'm joined by international master Tom uh, Rendell. And uh, Tom, what's your uh, uh, evaluation of this position? Yeah, so when, when we went to break, we, were, we, we just saw the move G5 from Nils Grandelius, and both of us were a little bit surprised by this. And okay, we thought, you know, it's time for David to, to have a, a deep think and, uh, and, and choose a way of playing in this position. And okay, David did, did think for just over 10 minutes or so and chose the move knight to e2. And uh, okay, so now it's interesting because we have, have several pawns on three. We have this uh, pawn on c6, this pawn on e2. Uh, so if we, if we maybe start looking at what happens if we just play some captures. Uh, so it's black's move. Bishop takes pawn on a2, rook takes c6, hitting the bishop on uh, h6. And we could go back with the bishop or maybe play a move like pawn to f6. And it feels to me like if black was able to spend a couple of moves getting organized, uh, maybe swing the, the rook across from, uh, uh, from f8 across to c8 here. Uh, but he'd be doing completely okay. But instead, maybe we see the move rook c7, and black has problems both with the e7 pawn and the a7 pawn, uh, as well as the bishop on h6 being somewhat shut out by the, the pawn chain of f6, g5, uh, e7, f6, g5. So this looks like exactly what Mills is going to be trying to avoid. So. Uh, I think with the move knight e2, David is basically challenging Niels to, to come up with some kind of plan in this position. And I think, yeah, bishop takes a2 looks like a mistake to me. Uh, so maybe bishop d5 is one option just to defend this pawn on, on c6. And then maybe white looks to go f3 and e4 at some stage. Uh, or of course we can end up going defensive with with a move like rook f8 to c8. Although instinctively I never want to to just place my rook as a big defender behind the ball. You know it feels like uh, you know we could end up with some kind of very uncomfortable position uh, after bishop c5 and maybe a3 knight d4 coming in something like that. Feels like black doesn't have time to play that passively with, with for example, rook to c8. Me yeah, and so we, we were chatting a little bit in the in the break about uh, sort of the position more generally, and uh, this, I don't really know what the objective evaluation of the position is. We don't have we're not we're not following any computer engines at the moment. But okay, the queens are off. We, there should not be any ridiculous tactics in this. But it feels to me that if David wins the battle for the next few moves then he could end up with a clear advantage, either a pawn up or maybe changing these two bishops off under favorable circumstances uh, and pressure for a very long time. Or we could see uh, Nils uh, solve the, uh, the problems that he has for the moment, maybe exchange off a few pawns. Let's imagine hypothetically that all of these queenside pawns were to disappear uh, and white was to go king b2, I think we'd yeah. be heading for, for a draw very, very quickly. So I think it's it's up for David to keep tension in the position and to create problems for, for Niels to solve. And Niels has to show us concretely 
uh, a way to, to alleviate what, whatever pressure David has on his position. So I, I think we're, we're only in the second hour of this game, but it feels like a, an absolutely crucial hour that we have coming yeah, up. Absolutely. I think you I think you summed it up uh, really well there, and um, and yeah, I think the players will will have to uh, spend some time uh, on the next few moves. So um, please uh, post comments, uh, questions in the chat, and we'll uh, try and, and answer them as uh, as best we can. And also, do want to remind you that we we have this um, fundraiser. Uh, it's a joint effort uh, between uh, the Norwegian Refugee Council and Chess Twenty Four. Our goal is to raise $20,000 uh, throughout this match. And currently we're at $9,300, which is absolutely great. But uh, yeah, you can see the QR code uh, on the on the broadcast. And we will also post uh, the link uh, to the, the website as well. So uh, if you have any money at all to spare, it would be great if you want to contribute to this uh, great cause in, uh, in difficult times. Absolutely, yeah. No, I mean, you've already been so generous so far, but yeah, please give generously. But uh, yeah, so so now we have Nils uh, with some, some serious thinking to do. So what, what would you play in this position? Sorry to, to put you on the spot. Yeah, there, I, but, mean, uh, uh, I mean, I mean, I kind of agree with you. I, I, I hate to defend. Uh, I think um, often you have to try and come up with some some counterplay or put your opponent to the test as well. Um, I don't know necessarily if you want to give up the pawn on c6 straight away, but I just feel like uh, black should be okay in some of the different lines, even with the, with the pawn down. Um, I would try and, and put some pressure on, on the queen side. Um, but I guess the timing has to be right. Ideally, I would like to push a5, rook b8, those type of moves. But um, uh, in the me but in the meantime, you do maybe you can just take on on c6. Uh, yeah, I think this is why David's last move is really clever, actually. Yeah. Because you know, if we'd seen a move like b3 to uh, to defend the pawn, then then all of this play yeah. with, with a5, a4 makes a, makes a huge amount of sense, and. Whereas if we play a3, then, okay, we've stuck the pawns on the same color as our bishop. There's, you know, you can already sort of dream of situations where we have an opposite color bishop ending. Okay. Pawn pushes down here, yeah. bishop goes to b3, we sit there and black has, and, a and, and black has, has some kind of blockade. Uh, but for me, the biggest problem that black has is this bishop on h6. And uh, we discussed this a little bit when Nils played the move pawn to g5. Um, and yeah, the question more than what is he going to do about the pawn on c6 is how is that bishop on uh, on g5 ever ever rejoining things? Because if we were to bring it back, so after the move knight to e2, uh, if the bishop was to drop back to g7, um, we could even take that straight away. Would you consider h6? Or? Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, I would consider h6. So let's see, yeah, this, this variation hypothetically takes, takes, uh, takes a2. And okay, we can capture on c6 with either, either piece. Um, maybe knight takes is very strong here. Something like this. Rook comes into d5. So if we give black a moment, then he wants to bring the bishop back to d5. So. So I'd rather not, not allow black to do that. F6. And, and now what to do with the king? Yeah, just, let's, yeah. Say, king let's say king e2. And yeah, we just need some time to, I guess here we're spending to play rook a1 and yeah. go after the pawn on a7. Absolutely. And yeah, David, David is attempting to play very, very simply. Uh, he wants to, to end up being one pawn up on the, on the queen side, and then we're going to push the b pawn and win the game. Yeah. And uh, it feels like this knight is slightly loose on c6, but the big problem for, for black is that he would love to be able to, to pin that knight with, uh, with rook to c8. But unfortunately, this is going to run into rook to c7 and rook to c8. And that's black, black's problem, the, the knight on c6 targeting both a7 and, 
and the more uh, deadly uh, knight takes uh, e7 check in some uh, some variations. Um, yeah, so I, I think even though the position is not super tactical, uh, everything is very, very concrete and it, it comes down to one or two tempi. So I think if Black had a move to play King to F7, I think this would solve a huge amount of problems. And now, now if we could play Rook C8 or, or Pawn to A6, for example, I think Black would be fine. But here is going to be one move too slow after Rook to A1. Uh, we should go back somewhere and then we recapture this uh, yeah. on A7. Not sure which way we should take that. Maybe we should be. Uh, I wanted to be greedy and double looks mm -hmm. like this, but there there are always tricks. We can go yeah. A6 and uh, and there's a last E4 check. Nice, uh, nice tactic. Uh, Bortnik on uh, chat is saying Bishop C5, hit E7, double on the D file, two. Uh, two versus one, queen side pressure, Dave for the win. So that was probably after after bishop takes a2. Yeah. So, so I, yeah, so we, we were expecting the move rook takes c6. Yeah. I, it's hard to believe that uh, that there can be a better move than, than taking this pawn. And yeah, um, and, and now black doesn't have bishop d5, which is. Uh, David's point, I guess, uh, targeting the bishop now. Yeah, and, this, and just to show you, for example, it feels like this would be bad for black. Eight takes, and then we can either play the move h6 straight away, or we can play maybe knight to d4 first. This is... But, but I have an idea. I don't know if it works, but if you go a couple moves back okay. um, in this position, uh, yeah, after bishop for g7, and then play... Uh, Play h6. And then the point is, uh, you can never really take on g2 in the end. That's my point. So now, if bishop d5, yeah. you play rook c5 uh, with the threat. Uh, yeah, you, just, then... you just take on g5, uh, yeah. basically. I don't know if it's, a, if it's a better version of uh, what you showed, but um, it just feels a bit more pleasant for white. Anyways, and then the pawn on h6. Can be a bit of a nuisance for um, for um, for black later in the game. Yeah, we always have this back rank uh, threats as well. Yeah, it's what uh, what Kasparov would term uh, the the alien in the in, in the black position. Yeah. And uh, and okay, with with more pieces on the board, obviously it can contribute to to a mating attack on G seven. But yeah, like you said, it gives black constant back rank problems. And in a rook and pawn ending. Uh, there's always the chance that, you know, many, many moves ahead that the rook on, on c6 will swing behind the pass pawn, pick up on h7, and uh, and we have a, a ready-made winning plan. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a, it's a double-edged sword, of course. So the, that pawn on h6, if instead of getting to a rook and pawn ending, we were to get to a king and pawn ending, yeah. then the king can just wander up and, exactly. and eat this pawn at yeah. some point. And, uh, so it's kind of a committal move, uh, I would say. Yeah. But but again, um, yeah, we've seen yeah, we've so seen Rook takes c six, and now Neil just uh, he's thinking here. He hasn't played move f six, so that's what we're expecting, I guess. For f six. I'm slightly concerned that he's played Bishop takes a two without. Uh, so if if I was to think in in this position for a long time. Uh, and play the move bishop take day two, I would expect that it takes d6 to be played yeah. very quickly. Uh, I'm sure Mills has in mind which way he, he intended to respond. And uh, often I feel that this kind of pause after such an obvious move is a sign of indecision. Mm -hmm. That, uh, you know, maybe he intended to play f6 in this position and suddenly he's seen something and thinks, oh, it's not not quite as comfortable as, uh, as, as I'm believe before let me just check my other options um instinctively i hate the idea of playing e6 uh yeah but uh, you know i'm imagining some disaster scenario where the knight somehow lands so, so. lands on wow. lands on f6 and in, and again we we move very swiftly from this this nice sedate yeah. uh positional grinds to let's checkmate the black king Absolutely. Uh, and 
Okay, so, you know, uh, black cannot obviously play the move right, uh, bishop back to d5. Then we simply drop this on h6. Hmm. I, this feels like a very easy way to lose the game. I'm giving here knight e4. Uh, we're now going to be forced into playing uh, my least favorite missile pawn move called Brett Fire. Maybe? No, okay. I mean, this is this has to be, yeah, has to be kaput. And then you take on h7. Yeah, and we take. Well, no, I mean, uh, if the king goes to the diagonal, then we we pick up some kind of exchange yeah. with knight e7 check. And uh, king f7. This is ah, this is actually know. that's wow. That's just mate. That's just mate. Wow. So, yeah. So the, the black king is uh, potentially in trouble. In some of these lines. Yeah. It's it. It's super interesting, and it's definitely something uh, that humans have learned from computers yeah. in this last ten years. And, you know, the talk of all of the alpha zero stockfish games, uh, and it, you know, I think it's just a joke at at, uh, at top level these days that if you need an idea in an opening, you you play h four. Yeah, and it's just you know, it's the it's the ready made move for any position, and it's precisely for these kind of uh, enduring. Bits of pressure mm -hmm. that uh, that the computers are just so good at now, and you know, the top uh, the top human players are obviously going to be looking to learn absolutely everything they can. So yeah, I I would I think e6 is horrendous blunder, and, uh, and I would be very surprised to see it played. So, but that just means that okay, so we have f6 or uh, or bishop e6, maybe bishop e6. We haven't seen here. It's the it's perhaps the least committal move, mm -hmm. uh, not moving any pawns here. But uh, then I guess White has to consider rook rook c seven. Yeah, and we and we target both of these pawns. And then Chat was talking about you know uh, we have the move c five in every position, and we have the famous principle of two weaknesses, which is that. But if we if we're only trying to win the pawn on a seven, then theoretically, even in a bad position. Black can organize all of their pieces to, to sit and defend that form. But uh, but if we if we put additional pressure both on uh, on e7 and a7, then black is going to be stretched yeah. in in defending both of those areas at once. Comes to c5, the knight flows nicely into d4, and this is looking like bad news for, for black in this position. Absolutely. Right. And, um, and and speaking of Harry, the, the h bomb, I just have to credit Simon Williams, who's been playing that move for 30 years. And now, finally, the top uh, AI computers uh, are agreeing with him. So he was uh, way ahead of his time uh, in this, uh, with this aggressive uh, palm push, uh, often in the opening. Yeah. And as you said, I think many of the top players, uh, we have countless uh, games where they push uh, h4 or h5. In the in uh, openings and positions where uh, you haven't really seen it before, so it is a development um, um, we've, we've seen now for years. It's yeah. quite interesting. Yeah. So I mean, uh, I guess we can go we can go all the way back if we want to, and you know, so famously, you know, we uh, we normally see H four ideas. You know, the classic one, I guess, would be uh, would be something like something like this. The so so called uh, 150 attack, but and okay, we see this move in the Sicilian dragon as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, but here the idea is very clear. We go eight, h5. Black is supposed to castle kingside, and we deliver mate. Yeah. None of none of this subtle stuff. Um, and okay, the, these kind of h4 ideas have been known for for decades and decades in terms of foot theory. But what we've moved to in in recent times, if we if we go back to to the position we have in front of us. Is, is the fact that these kind of H5, H4, H5 ideas uh, have enduring pressure into the end game. And it's, it's not just about this, you know, oh, maybe we'll get a, a quick checkmate and, you know, uh, checkmate on H7, checkmate on H8. But yeah, the, this kind of pressure. And the, the biggest impact we've seen so far of this H pawn pushing down the board is this ongoing problem that Black has that we've spoken about multiple times. Yeah. This bishop on H6. You know, I think we're gonna we're gonna mention it many more times. Yeah. How is that bishop going to get back into the game, uh, or is it just gonna sit there? Mm -hmm. 
And okay, so am I right in saying Tribute Six has now been played? Yeah, this is correct. And okay, we were expecting we we're expecting Rook C7. Yeah, I mean it's definitely a move you you want to look at. Um... Yeah, there's Rook C7. We could also play. Yeah, for sure. So Bishop C5 is an interesting one, and I would guess that this is a mistake, but I think maybe it's a very instructive mistake. So what I want to do with this is clear the space to go knight e4, put pressure on here. Obviously, we've got this nasty pen along the ticked rank with our rook. Uh, and what we're hoping is for our opponent to go, go defensive. You know, uh, nice simple chess. We attack the pawn on e7, they defend. We attack the bishop on e6, and black is in a huge amount of trouble. Yeah. But I think what we would see instead would be uh, an immediate black counterattack, either with the move bishop to g7 or with rook f to c8. Mm -hmm. uh, possibly they're interchangeable. Let's say something like rook c8, rook takes c8, rook takes c8. And OK, white has a choice of pawns to capture on e7 or a7. But now that we've actually won the pawn, uh, there's a sort of famous expression, you know, uh, uh, I'm happy every time I lose one of my pawns, it's one less weakness to defend. Yeah. So now, now that the, pro, the pawn has been taken and we're actually a pawn down, sometimes uh, the game becomes more fun. Like that. Now, now there's no pawn on c6. That's an open line for our rook to swing in. Our rook is very pretty down on c2. And even if this doesn't mean that we win material back straight away, uh, this feels like a, a very positive transformation for uh, Absolutely. And, and in this position, Black might be able to play, uh, maybe even play uh, a move like Rook, you know, Bishop uh, G7. Because yeah. uh, after Rook takes B2, uh, if you take on G5 now, Rook takes not so easy to. Yeah. And, and even the A pawn on, can start running. So even though White is up a pawn, um, that's yeah. a very dangerous pawn. Yeah. And, the... and suddenly the Bishop is a great piece on G7, the long diagonal. Yeah, yeah. I, I I suspect Black is uh, maybe even straight up winning. There's a, yeah. There might be a bishop c4 in this yeah. position as well. I, mean, I, I don't actually see a way to finish the game in this kind of position, but this, this yeah. strikes me as, uh, yeah, this, this isn't going to appear over the board. No. Uh, a very, very common mistake uh, when, when you have this kind of pressure is to attempt to cash in too quickly and say, you know, how can I... Uh, how can I turn this position into an extra pawn? And in doing so, you lose all control over the position. You learn, you lose, uh, you you let the bishop escape from its tomb on h6. Yeah. Um, so what I think we will we will see from David is uh, if he if he is to win a pawn, he will want to do do that and remain in control of the position. And I wonder if maybe now is the moment to simply take a time out for this position. And play the move king to d2. Yeah, I was looking at that move. It, it makes a lot of sense because you want to bring uh, all the pieces into the game. And uh, for now, white has control in the c file. But uh, you can also try and get the other rook either to c1 or a1 to, to add some more pressure, um, attacking both from the seventh rank, possibly, and also in the half open uh, a, a file. Absolutely. And so, for example, you know, one possible line here would be the move uh, rook g8. Uh, white could defend by doubling up on this side of the board. Okay, let's say rook takes rook, rook takes rook. And now uh, white is the one that's kept control over this, yeah. this open file. And black cannot uh, cannot challenge because after rook c8 takes, takes. This time around, white will be very, very happy to say thank you for this before. And, uh, and even even bishop g4 doesn't work because of knight g3 and f3, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, a that's a very nice spot. Yeah, so that, we can uh, do this and then f3. Yeah, just, uh, and uh, yeah, and just, it seems just, to be yeah, pawn up probably winning for white. Absolutely. Um, so, um, I, I'm nowhere near as strong a player as David, but. Uh, my attitude to playing is is very different to him. Uh, I I would consider myself to be a very long way away from a perfectionist with a chess player. Mm -hmm. I, what, I, what what is your playing style? So would you say I uh, I like to just pose problems to my opponent. So you know if uh, 
I find it very hard to believe that King D2 is not one of the two best moves in the possession. So I'd like to play King D2 fairly quickly and confidently and say, you know, Niels, you've spent a lot of time on the clock already. We are, you know, what move are we at at the moment? It's, uh, We're at, um, let's see. Move, um... I've lost track of where we are. I think we're at move uh, yeah sixteen. Move six, move sixteen. Yeah, there's still you've still got a lot of moves to make. Uh, I don't want you to think in my time. I want to you know mm -hmm. play this move, get up, have a little bit of a wander around, feel feel very good about myself. Um, but yeah, uh, of course, in this kind of position, you, it may be that you only get one chance. And uh, David, I suspect, feels that he has to be super accurate for a number of moves in order to uh, to get most out of uh, what is definitely some kind of open advantage or, uh, or, or preparation advantage that he's managed to create in this game. Absolutely. But but now I've seen the move King D2, King D I, I can't see any other move. I, I really like that move. And, uh, and for me, it feels like a multi-purpose move as well, because we're approaching, uh, I mean, this probably will be considered an endgame uh, just uh, pretty yeah. soon. And you want to bring the king. You want to have an active king in the end game. And let's say they trade uh, a rook or both pair of rooks, then the white king is much better placed than the, the black king on, on g8. So um, yeah, I really like uh, I really like king d2. Yeah, it just we, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, we're, you're you're right about the king on g8. It's potentially two problem pieces for for black in this profession. And yeah. I mean, I guess I'm, uh, you know, I'm representing the, 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 you know, team. Are we team England or are we team, team England rather than team uh, UK? But yeah, yeah, to team England for for David. I, I'd be feeling very optimistic. Yeah, sitting in this position. And um, I guess even though I'm Norwegian, I, I'll be, I'll be rooting for Nils uh, Scandinavian uh, stick together. Uh, I'm also obviously good friends with both of them, uh, a colleague of David. Such a nice guy, but uh, yeah, I hope um, would be good for the match that we we got to win. Uh, I think that will spice spice things up a bit. Um, Absolutely, and you know, and uh, I, I've known David for for a very very long time. I mean, not a, not only we were we both English juniors, but uh, actually from the same region, both from, oh, really both from Sussex, and uh, so uh, I'm. Three or four years older than David, so uh, so I used to play him a lot in sort of the local local team things mm -hmm. and counter stuff. So I started out with a very good record against a, a nice young David. Uh, I remember I played him maybe when he was six, and he gave me a piece very quickly. Yeah. I was very happy. And then over the years, my record has got steadily worse. <laughs> uh, I, I know the feeling. Uh, I've mm -hmm. experienced the same with all these young and yeah, great Norwegian players uh, coming for the last few years. And, yeah. uh, but I do remember, I mean, both you, David, Simon Williams, Lawrence Trent, all these uh, nice um, English players going to Gibraltar. Uh, and we also had a lot of Norwegian players uh, going there. And uh, yeah, I discussed this a bit with Lawrence as well. But it's nice that we, we, we've we kind of found each other there in Gibraltar. We had players from all over the world, but the Norwegians and the, and the English players uh, had a connection somehow. And uh, I have, I would say, lifelong friends from from meeting other chess players in in that tournament. And and uh, we mentioned Paul Robson uh, on on the show yesterday. Such a lovely guy. Uh, so yeah, um, yeah. It's a shame that that tournament is now, at least uh, in the in the next few years, won't be won't be hosted. And and the famous Coleta Hotel is now demolished or will be demolished. But yeah, I have so, so many great memories uh, meeting you guys, uh, playing some chess. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, in fact, the, you know, Stuart Congress is now obviously the organ main organizer yeah. at uh, uh, another, uh, another another Sussex player, uh, yeah. actually from uh, from Hastings, the, the same town as me. Also a great chess player. Oh, yeah, no, and, fan, uh, fan, fantastic. So it's back in the day, obviously, yeah. as front player yeah. today as well, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think he had the same clock handling skills that David has. Ah, yeah. He, uh, yeah, famously, but tending to play these incredibly sharp positions mm -hmm. with, with absolutely no time on the clock, and, you know, uh, brings it, bringing a lot of energy in, uh, to the board. And, uh, Is that a Sussex thing, or what, how's your uh, time handling compared um, to those two? I would say 
I would naturally, I naturally want to play, play a lot more quickly. Mm. Uh, it's normally I'm assigned, assigned that things are going pretty badly if my time is disappearing. Yeah. But um, but uh, but I've been known to end up in, in one or two times trying to cross up. But no, I I don't think I have uh, perhaps the chronic addiction yeah. that most that the, those players would. Have. I mean, it does seem like David, for example, he is a time trouble addict. I mean, something happens to his body; he gets a reaction of, of being down on the clock and and being in this immense time scrambles. But I'm so surprised uh, time and again that. He manages to play so well, you know, with two, three minutes on the clock in a classical game, you have 10, 15 moves to play. And uh, even at the very, very top level, I would guess Alexander Grichuk uh, is uh, the same type of player, always down on the clock, but always manages to, to find the best moves. Uh, it's, uh, it's incredible. I mean, I mean, I'm impressed. At the same time, it's like, why would you put yourself in that position? Uh, over and over, but um, they do have some experience. So. Absolutely, I mean, I think it's it's an interesting one because uh, for me, David's single biggest strength is that he doesn't blunder. Mm -hmm. You know, if he, uh, he even under pressure, even very short of time, you know, he's he may not play the absolute best move, but it's really, really unusual to see him uh, just make a very, very sizable mistake. Uh, and you know, I. These days, uh, it's been a while since I played David in uh, in a proper slow play game, but but I, I play him in blitz and you know three minutes plus two seconds to move. And sometimes, even there, uh, he will use all of his time really quickly. Mm -hmm. I have these memories of playing him, and you know, and I have a minute on the clock, and he has ten seconds plus the two seconds to move. And I think, okay, I just yeah. keep, keep playing quickly. I put him under pressure, and he and he'll crack. And the completely the opposite happens. He, you know. Carries on serenely moving, you know, his, his time never going up, his time never going down. Yeah. And 20 moves later, you know, I, ha I have to resign. And yeah. And, uh, but, but it would be, it would definitely be wrong to say that it, it doesn't affect him. Mm -hmm. uh, in yesterday's, uh, sorry, in the game two days ago, uh, he was very short on time, around about move 35 or so. And uh, if he'd had 20 minutes on the clock, uh, I think he would have been furious with the way he played. He he had such a, a comfortable position and was very, very close to winning. Yeah. And his advantage completely evaporated between move uh, move 30 and move 40. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not like it doesn't come with a with a penalty. Yeah. Uh, and we see even we see this from players like Chris Chuck as well. However uh, good you are when short of time. Uh, you have to be giving away something when you when you do this. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think, I mean, Lawrence mentioned this. Uh, maybe other players as well or chess commentators. Maybe just maybe if if David didn't get into all these time troubles, maybe he would be established twenty seven hundred a player. Uh, obviously, both Nils and David has crossed the twenty seven hundred uh, mark, but it just goes to show that it's so difficult as well to stay there. Once you reach twenty seven hundred, and um, yeah, uh, I think I think the the challenge for for a player like David, is, especially, is that uh, he, uh, I don't know how many games, how many slow play games he plays a year. I, you know, yeah, um, that's a good point. He, I mean, he's he's living in Norway now, yeah, living in Oslo, yeah, and uh, and obviously he's got his his commentate commentary work with the yeah. with the Grand Chess Tour, the Champions Chess Tour, the Champions, yeah. Champions Chess Tour. And uh, I I don't know what else he does if he but you know he, he does bits of writing but he's a he, he feels like he's a full time chess personality rather yeah. than, than full time player. full time chess player yeah absolutely um but he did you know he did play managed to play some tournaments uh, last year he played in Riga did oh. brilliantly there uh, almost qualified for the the candidates and uh, he played uh, was it some team. In championship, you know, where he didn't do uh, as well um, as he did in Riga, but mm -hmm. yeah. So obviously, I think he's a bit rusty, but uh, but most players are, I guess, after the pandemic, where most of the action has been uh, online and on the Champions Chess Tour and and so on. And uh, but I think it's a good point, and it must be difficult for him to to balance, you know, the professional work life with 
let's say, trying to reach 2700 again, uh, to find that balance both in life and uh, divide up his time and spare time and, and so on. No, absolutely. And, you know, it's something I, I can speak from experience, you know. Uh, I mean, I, I obviously have fond memories of, of going and playing in Gibraltar when I was sort of uh, 18, 19, 20 years old. And, and then, you know, my, my attention was fully on chess and, uh, you know, getting the, getting the IM title and crossing 2500. And, but basically, some, uh, since then, I've been a full-time chess coach. And it's kind of similar with the, uh, to the commentary thing. That obviously your full time job is is looking at chess, you're looking at chess for other people, mm -hmm. but you're not. Uh, but then you have to find the motivation to, you know, you get up early in the day and do two hours work on your own game yeah. before you, you know, yeah. go you go and then do the commentary, or uh, or do you say, oh, you know, what, I'm uh, I'm being paid nicely for, for yeah. the commentary thing. I need a break I'm, from, I'm, from I'm, all the chess. I need a break. Yeah. I'll, let me do something else. Maybe have some kind of other hobby, mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, it's, it's about finding that motivation to, Eric, for the players of this standard, they, they need to be doing you know, hours of, of work every day, pretty yeah. much, when they're outside of a tournament. Yes. And uh, and that's the challenge. Because when you talk about the pandemic, obviously, a huge number of players came out incredibly sharp, and incredibly well prepared at the end of the pandemic. Yeah. You know, we see uh, the continued rise of the, of the young Indian players. And uh, it does not look like they wasted their 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 two years. You know, I'm I'm sure they would have played a little bit of blitz online, but uh, but a huge amount of work. Yeah, and, and would, it would have been and, done. And that's a very work. yeah, it's a very good point. And and at, at, on the one hand, you feel sorry for them for not being able to play more tournaments, uh, but that they are, on the other hand, they probably worked so uh, much on their chess with preparations, openings with. Uh, everything and and now you see they gain 20 points per tournament you know and uh, speaking of that i played uh, my last over the board tournament was in during norway chess last year uh, and i played in this uh this uh, side event and i was playing you know young norwegians who hadn't played in a tournament so they were massively underrated i think i lost 40 rating points you know losing to 15 year olds that were Two three hundred points uh, underrated and uh, yeah, so but it's good that all these uh, players of all ages, I was uh, especially for younger players, that they're able to to come back and and travel and and play more more chess. So that's great. Yeah, no, no, I, I think the narrative that I've been saying is that you know, uh, for all of these youngsters who weren't able to play for the two years, it it doesn't seem to have done them any harm. I mean, Alouazers obviously the most prominent example yeah you know he didn't get to play you know uh for a long time you know uh but come, comes back to over the board chest phenomenally strong you know perhaps the the most improved player at, at the very top level yeah absolutely. so um so yeah i won't be feeling too sorry for them for the no I, I agree with that but uh but tom tell us a little bit more uh how does your uh, everyday life look like when you're coaching and what type of coaching do you do, uh, and so on? So, uh, so I'm working as a as a full time chess coach in London, and I kind of split my time between between working in schools. It was probably the majority of my of my week, uh, going in sort of doing lunchtime clubs and a few a few after school clubs, because uh, let's face it, nobody else wants coaching, uh, sort of one o'clock on a on a Tuesday afternoon. Uh, and so I, I do that and then I have uh, have my private students that I fit in and around that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, say living in London, there, there's so much opportunity for, for chess coaches. Yeah, I, you know, I imagine. Uh, I have no idea what the number of, uh, of, of professional chess coaches working in London is, but I, I suspect we're talking three figures. Wow. But, yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, so there's certainly plenty, plenty of work to go to go around and um yeah so no i i i really enjoy the coaching uh anything about explaining uh ideas to people and uh and and stuff like that and it you know i find playing chess can be very very stressful mm -hmm. you know and even you know doing a broadcast like this you know, occasionally we're going to make some mistakes and i'll suggest, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll suggest a very bad move and it's it's fine to go oh that, that was silly we can take the move back and uh and I and we don't have to play the the rest of the game down a pawn for, for no reason. Yeah. So you know, so I consider this kind of thing to be kind of a, a luxury, 
you know, it's because it, it's very easy for me to sort of criticize the players and, you know, say, David, why haven't you played the move King D2? I would have played King D2 in, in two minutes. What mm -hmm. are you doing? But I don't have to play this position. Yeah. I, it, 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 you know. Uh, no, but I, 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 I see your point. And, and obviously, I do a lot of work with chess as well. And, and, and yeah, it's, it's a different feeling, I would say, when, when you're sitting at the board or, you know, playing uh, yourself. Um, and, and probably I've come to a point where I just enjoy working with chess instead of actually playing that much um, for myself. Uh, to put it that way um but when you do the so you have different types of uh coaching do you do online both online and uh, in uh, schools and clubs and so on uh, absolutely i mean uh to be honest i'm uh i used to sort of move away from doing online and part of the reason is that you know if you're living in london then you know obviously there's a high cost of living so if you uh, if I do online coaching, then, then I'm competing with ev absolutely everybody, yeah. and the, the the prices vary quite a lot mm -hmm. uh, for what you can charge online. But obviously, with the with the pandemic, everything moved online. Yeah. And uh, but in many ways, we're we're very fortunate in the chess world that uh, obviously there it takes some getting used to. But um, but uh, just like everybody else, I became an expert in Zoom very very quickly. Yeah. And uh, actually, all of almost all of the schools, uh, when when the kids were were uh, doing the school from home, the, we would pretty much fit it in exactly as normal and do the clubs at, at lunchtime or yeah. clubs after school. That's good. So there, there there really wasn't that much transition for, for that kind of thing. Yeah. But uh, I have to say that if if I get a choice, um, I would always rather do face to face coaching. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I travelled into London yesterday to, to see one of my students, uh, and for a long time I was coaching him online. And it, of course, it's it's incredibly convenient because there's no um, there's no transport time, or anything like that. And it's it's very in, in, in some ways it's actually easier to to coach online because you know you upload your files and uh, and they're all there. And you know you, you, even things like not having to reset the pieces mm -hmm. on on the board, you, you save a lot of time. But you you do lose that human interaction, yeah. And uh, uh, and I think most most students, and I think uh, I think teachers also, it, it's just nice to physically be there. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, absolutely, uh, I agree with that, and uh, it's nice that we now can um, can meet up again uh, in person. Absolutely. So. Uh, it feels like we, it's been a while since we've discussed the game game situation. So I, I've strongly predicted the move King D2. It, it feels like there must be an alternative that, that David is considering. I mean, I don't know if, there, if there's anything from chat, what, what moves you might, yeah, you might let's play just, here. Um, let's just see what the, the chat is saying. Uh, I'll just go through a few comments. Um, Feral Acción is saying, seems White is looking strong. Yeah, we also believe uh, White has uh, has an edge. Uh, Artonics Black purely on the defensive, but looks defendable. Okay, and uh, this was uh, a while ago. But uh, Jelly Monster David has plenty of time for once. Yeah, you don't see that often. And then Bortnik saying, in "My inner evaluation bar says Dave has got this." Mm. And then uh, Ender beat David for the win. So David have some fans here in the chat. Uh, Angela Monster, yeah, the White hasn't castled yet and probably won't castle. Uh, that's our prediction. And Bert Nick appreciating our uh, different uh, analysis. Long line, very nice. Okay. But, yeah, I want, I'm interested to see the move castles just as a yeah as, as an alternative to uh, going King D2. Don't know if there's a there there could be some scenarios where the king is slightly vulnerable on D2, I suppose. So, we castle. Does this this change anything very much? I just really like having the king uh, in, in the in the center in the, in the end game, um, and I can't see the dark squared uh, bishop or nils to be any danger. Yeah, I, I have yeah, to say, intuitively, it doesn't doesn't really. Yeah, yeah, it does, it, it doesn't seem like there's much to calculate with the move castle. So there, there are obviously many many different ways that players choose uh choose the best move 
and uh, there's the sort of think like a grandmaster, the cutoff way of thinking, which is you have you have these big, long variations. So you know, so you pick your candidate moves. Your candidate moves are, let's say, uh, king d2, castles, bishop c5. You know, let's pick those three for example. You analyze all three of those moves for as long as you possibly can, and then at the end of every variation, you then give an evaluation. And you compare your three evaluations and you go for whatever you think is the biggest advantage. Yeah. Uh, that would be the sort of very traditional uh, structured way of doing it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But uh, I would consider myself to be far, far lazier than that. So for, first point of principle, uh, I calculate a variation with King D2. Uh, so we saw this variation with King D2, Rook C8, Rook C1, for example. And then uh, the whole time we look at this variation, I say, is there any reason that I would rather have my king back on g1 rather than on d2? Uh, so rather than, you know, proper structural analysis, uh, we'd call this comparative analysis. Mm -hmm. It's like compared to the two positions, do I want my king on d2 or g1? And I've yet to find a single concrete reason why I want the king to be on g1. So why would I waste a huge amount of time uh, calculating the move castles king side when, in all likelihood, it's going to be worse than king d2, yeah. uh, you know, for, for exactly the same reason in every single line. You could, you know, we could look at five different variations to confirm all of that. Mm -hmm. But I would think, because it's not only the waste of time uh, in a game like this, you know, David has plenty of time, but it, it requires a lot of effort. And uh, these are very, very long games, they're, they're seven hours. And the only person in the world that can keep up the pressure of an hour is Magnus Carlsen yeah. or a computer. Those are those are the two possibilities. Personally, for myself, uh, uh, I consider a game to be a battle of the critical moment, and uh, and this doesn't yet feel super critical to me. Uh, it feels like at some point White is going to have to calculate some very nice line, but. Uh, obviously, I'm not analysing this as in-depth as David is, but, but yeah, it, you know, I'm obviously repeating myself, but I would go to you too and say, but say to Black, you have a big problem to solve. Yeah, absolutely. And, we, and after you play your move, I'm going to work out what to do. But... And just in general, I mean, we have what many viewers are, are new to chess. Um, me and Lawrence, the other days, so we've tried them help them with some you know general advice and and this is a very concrete example uh which you showed uh with this you compare the two different lines and ask yourself what's the difference with having the king on g1 compared to d2 and 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 one very obvious uh thing is let's say the rooks come off and then and then the king is just better placed right you don't have to spend three moves to get the king from uh from the g1 to d2 yeah, absolutely. And, and, and the king is safe in this position. I mean, it's completely safe. There's nothing to worry about. And uh, now the king can come towards the, the pawn on a6 and bring the knight. And uh, you're probably just winning this game. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, the some of the moves I used there were sluts, you know. Yeah. yeah. They, they, they weren't the best moves. But yeah, just to demonstrate it looks coming off in a, in a semi-logical way. And then, yeah, the king is, uh, is exactly where the action is going to be. The game is going to be decided on whether or not White can pick up this pawn on, on A6. Yeah. And if we have, have our king sitting on G1, it obviously has no impact whatsoever upon uh, upon that pawn on A6. By, by the time it gets there, the, the Black King will have been able to, to make it play yeah. over. And this time around, it yeah, was one, of the, one of the first uh, general principles I learned when I started playing chess. You know, King has to contribute in, in the end game. And I guess the fewer the pieces, the more important the king is in the, in the end game. And as we can see here, it's all about uh, promoting a pawn. Often that's the objective in in end games. Uh, your king is often an important piece, both to attack your opponent's uh, pawns or to defend your own pawns. And in this case, white king wants to support uh, the attack on the a6 pawn. And um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, David's now been thinking for for more than more than half an hour uh, about this position. Maybe now is a 
an interesting moment to to, to go to a break. Perhaps. Yeah, sure. So let's, let's, have a, let's have a short break so while, while David is thinking, and um, we'll be back uh, back in a few minutes. See you soon. I don't really know what my expectations were when I grew up. I just wanted to make games. I didn't really consider where that would take me. Today, I am the chief creative officer here at Mojang in Stockholm. We have more than 120 million monthly active users and more than 200 million sold copies of Minecraft. I often get a question on why is Minecraft so successful? I believe it's the way you interact with the world. It's very simple and uh, you have a big impact on just small actions. You quickly realize that you can build anything, so it gives you a very sense of uh, empowerment. <laughs> I came to Mojang because I've always been making games my entire life. Marcus Passion, he created Minecraft, and his idea was to create more games with the support of the success of Minecraft. I got asked if I knew someone that could help them develop a new game. I said, well, I volunteer myself. For the first year, it was just me and Marcus working on Minecraft. It was really in the spirit, as we say in the, in the industry, like we were just doing things for fun. Sometimes we could have an idea on, on the Monday that was released on the Friday. So it was very high tempo <laughs> and uh, a lot of fun. When I started, the game had already sold 700,000 copies, uh, which was amazing and more or less unheard of in the, like, in the game scene. We believed that we had peaked but we quickly realized that Minecraft is here to stay. So that meant that I would take over the lead development of the creative vision for Minecraft. I think the most fun part about making games is the early phase where everything is possible. And it's both about creating a world, but also creating the rule sets of this world. When I look around, I always look at things and think about them in terms of game development. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's a, it's a blessing or a curse. For instance, when we were on a holiday in Singapore, and they have these amazing plants that grow on the trees, like flowers. And I was thinking, oh, that we could use that. <laughs> like, Sweden might be a good place uh, to be a nerd. <laughs> Well, we have these really long, dark winters, uh, so it's not strange if anyone just stays indoors a whole weekend and working on something on their computers. That's potentially one of the reasons why we have so many good music artists uh, and also game developers, and we're, we have the time to really geek out on specific topics. Så vi har ju precis snapshotat lite olika features till Caves och Clips, till exempel koppar. Och vi har fått in lite olika feedback, så jag tänkte kolla lite med dig vad du tänker. Today I'm more guiding and directing ideas. And uh, Agnes Larsson is now leading the design team for Minecraft. We know that kids play a lot of Minecraft. So when we add new features, we try to consider if we can make this feature in a way that teaches them something. One of the reasons why we added bees was to put attention to that bees are very important for pollination but also for the way we produce food. And also Minecraft is a fancy world and not everything works as it does in real life obviously. <laughs> When 
When I play Minecraft with my son, yeah. I build things and my son, he wants to go on an adventure. <laughs> so he just says, come on dad, come on dad, we need to go. And I'll say, okay, I'll follow you. When we're out exploring, I'm more like, oh, can we go back now? <laughs> <laughs> Can we continue building on, on the castle instead? <laughs> and he's like, I know that. <laughs> I'm always thinking about what I'm working on next. <laughs> you never really sit down and say, oh, this is it. It never really ends. <laughs> you just follow your drive. I kept Chessable a secret for three years at least, uh, and I was using it for myself. And I, you know, maybe never expected how, how big it would become. I have always been into games, and uh, I think games are fun ways to, to pass your time. Um, sometimes they can be educational as well, but I think chess is the perfect game that, that has it all. It's a game that not only entertains you, but also teaches you about life skills, from things like time management to the consequences of your moves or your actions. You know, once you make a move, you cannot take it back. I really fell in love with the game. And of course, given my competitive nature, I wanted to get better at it. And I found it extremely difficult after watching countless videos and reading some books. You would um, put in all that effort, and then when you get to the board, it's like, it all disappeared, it all vanished, and you performed at the exact same level you were before that. And uh, I looked around for a solution that could perhaps use the latest technology, the la latest learning science um, out there uh, to help you learn chess, and there was, there was nothing. So that's how the, the idea was born. I've been building things since I was 14, and I always enjoy bringing a community together around a product. And yeah, I mean, we got a lot of energy from the chess community as well. Uh, really from, from day one, when we announced Chessable, there was thousands of people who, who thought this was a good idea that had to be realized. And they've been fantastic with words of encouragement, support, advice, ideas on how to improve the product. And I believe they've been listened to over these years and Chessable is exactly what that initial community wanted. And it's part of our product process to actually keep listening to them going forward into the next years. Chessable is definitely a product that was built by players, for players. I think we have stuck to that vision and it continues to be exactly the same. What has changed is we now have a lot more great people in chess helping us realize this. Now, when I started, it was John and I, there was two of us, and then at some point we had three or four people. We had a small community around it. But now there is really an incredible amount of people that I never imagined all pulling in the same direction. So the, the future is bright. It really excites me what we can achieve together. And uh, I just look forward to it. It's been absolutely incredible to see the reception by some of the top grandmasters in the world, um, like Grandmaster Anish Giri and Erwin Olami. And this sort of validation across the spectrum of players is fantastic and it's really what keeps the entire team going. So, fabulous. Hi, my name is David Senemaza Kramali. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Chessable and the Chief Operating Officer of the Play Magnus Group. I moved away from the city 13 years ago. I worked as a journalist, I studied in university, but there was a sense of 
longing towards something a bit more real where I could actually create things and, and uh, be much closer to nature. I'm a vegan farmer. That's a bit unusual, but uh, that's what I am. It's a long story. I used to be one of those people that thought that. Hi, and welcome back to Game 4 in this uh, special challenge match between uh, David Howell and uh, Nils Grandelius. They're playing in the heart of London uh, at the Swedish Embassy. And uh, this is game four uh, in this very exciting match. Uh, we do believe um, David has, a, has an advantage in this uh, position. And uh, with me today, I'm joined by international master, master Tom Rendell, who will soon uh, put us up to, to status quo in this, uh, the status of this position. But we have a lot of... Um, people following today's game on chat so i'll just um, catch up uh, on some of it uh Jukke is saying i hope to see nils commentate more in the future he was fantastic when he joined howell and hauska during the world championship match absolutely uh, he did a great job and hopefully he'll uh, he'll be back uh, soon pete rolling saying superb com commentary well done thank you so much pete i appreciate it and uh, Bortnik, hey Tom, I remember you used to upload some Blitz chess games on YouTube some years ago. They were brilliant. Thoughts on future upload? Wow, yeah, no, I, I absolutely. I used to do to do a show called uh, called Hack Attack, mm -hmm. uh, which was yeah mostly me messing around playing Blitz and uh, ended up on YouTube and stuff like that. Uh, for the for the most part, I'm a very very occasional streamer, so. Uh, I did something during the pandemic. I did some um, uh, one of these marathon uh, tournaments. Uh, I streamed maybe like fourteen hours out of the twenty-four, just oh, like playing yeah. some some terrible blitz. And it's certainly getting worse the <laughs> longer it went on. But uh, but for the most part, I feel that you know to be to be a streamer is a really big commitment in terms of time. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so from from time to time, I will pop up and hopefully do things and. Uh, uh, actually, one of my one of my friends uh, was talking about uh, doing a bullet thing on Tuesday evening, uh, also to raise money for, uh, for the situation in Ukraine. Uh, and so, possibly, I'm going to come on and play play some some bullet games against him on on Tuesday evening sometime. Okay, that's great. Um, but uh, no, for the for the most part, I'm I'm a full time coach, so simply not the time to to, to stream. Yeah, uh, on a very regular basis. And, uh, and and speaking of that, we do have a, a fundraiser, a joint effort between uh, the Norwegian Refugee Council and Chess24. And there is a QR code um, here uh, on the broadcast. We'll also post uh, the link to the, um, the the site you can donate, and uh, it's it's for a great cause. Uh, so if you have any money to spare, uh, we would appreciate you. Contributing, uh, we're let's update and see. Yeah, we're up to nine thousand three hundred, uh, which is fantastic. But uh, our goal is actually twenty thousand throughout this match, and uh, every little contribution will help uh, reaching that goal. Uh, and then we'll try and uh, cap up, um, catch up to the position. We do have some uh, suggestions from uh, from chat. Uh, Tom Sheldon, uh, why not rook c7, attacking two pawns? And uh, Tom Jace, uh, what about king d2, bishop d5 for black, giving up h6 the rook? Oh, that, that is an idea that I, I confess had not crossed my mind. So, so we're going to come back to, to f4, which occurred to me during the break. David has now been thinking for uh, 45 minutes. 45 minutes. So king d2, bishop d5. So in some ways, it almost answers two questions at once. The reason I don't want to play rook c7 immediately here is because it, for me, it solves black's problem of this, yep. of this awkward pin. But saying that we can play this wow. onto f6 and say the rook on h6 is trapped. 
Well, if it was black to move again and we could play the move King to G7, then I think that would be true. Uh, the rook would be uh, would simply be lost here. But my suspicions are that uh, that with a whole move to do something, that white should be able to drum up some counterplay. So, for example, if we play the move knight to G3, now an immediate king to G7 would now fail to knight F5 check. He would be forced to move away again. Uh, and black cannot go pawn to E6 because that would let the rook escape on F6. So maybe we'd be forced into playing a move like bishop e6. And I don't know, I haven't fully solved this problem of, of how we're going to get this work out. But I'm incredibly suspicious. And if f4, you just take on f4? Yeah, yeah, I was wondering if we could get f4 in. I don't know if we're one move to... Yeah, no, king to seven. Yeah, yeah, it's not like uh, white can be in any... I don't think that white is ever in any real trouble here, um, even if we play yeah. rookie one here. I was about to suggest this look something. It gets a bit complicated. because in, in the could, worst, yeah. worst case, you might... Uh, okay, yeah, let's say then you can... Yeah, take care for just, example. just something like this. Uh, yeah, and the king is still. Yeah, but I my, I suspect black would uh, would it, shouldn't be losing in this position. So uh, yeah, but it's a it's a very good. Um, it's a, it's an intriguing idea that yeah. that has completely bypassed me, and I I think we are at least seeing why uh, why David has spent so much time. Yeah. Uh, on this on this move because of variations like this. So, but is there any improvements to to f4 uh, in this position? Uh, um, I I'm almost certain that the answer is yes. So uh, my feeling is the move knight e4 probably very strong um, because there, there has to be a limit yeah. for how long. And now king g7 knight takes g5. Yeah, yeah, precisely, and. You know, I guess you could try and play this, but even here we can give back the material with rook takes h7. Yeah. And knight takes and knight eight, knight eight, six. Yeah, yeah. And okay, all, all opposite kind of, kind of bishop endings are drawn, but I'm I'm not sure about this one. Feels yeah, uh, this winning. feels like it should be winning with the extra two pawns. So uh yeah, I find it hard to believe that, that this kind of thing would be would be playable. But so I don't know about an immediate bishop d5, but maybe it's something to bear in mind later on. But if we go back to this position, for a long time I could see no other move than playing king to d3. But let's let's try the move pawn to f4. This would justify uh, a 50-minute think in my book. So uh, first thing to say is that we actually have a have a concrete threat, which is to push the pawn forward to f5. And win the bishop on h6. Although, as we've seen with the rook getting trapped on h6, that is uh, that that's by no means complete. Uh, and the the idea here is that if we could maybe persuade uh, Black to play a move like g4. Uh, okay, we have this f5 move, uh, but we also have ideas of playing rook h4, and the king is is actually very very short on squares here. Yeah. So we're not a million miles away from from some kind of tactic here. But no, I think the, imme the immediate threat is uh, is obviously f five. So um, so I guess the most logical thing for black to do is to play pawn takes pawn. And let's imagine for a second we, we just recapture and. Uh, first thing to say is if we could magically give a check with the rook on g3, that would be the end of the game. But there, at the moment, there's no no immediate route to do that. Um, but again, it's another reason to be very, very uncomfortable. As well. So I would guess that this is what David is trying to analyze, mm -hmm. because we were talking earlier about comparing the moves king d2 and Carlos. And I think if, the, if these were the only two moves we would consider, uh, maybe maybe we could think for five minutes about this kind of thing, mm -hmm. but uh, but no, the uh, 
the only justification for this kind of thing is that we're considering something committed. Either F4 is a very, very good move, but potentially it could be uh, it could be giving away all of our advantage. It's very, very concrete, very quickly. Um, so if this is the direction that the game goes down, then I think things will become incredibly sharp. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think we should stick with this for the moment. Uh, and see if we can maybe find a, a good move for black in this position. So with this pin over here, well, maybe we can play the move bishop g7, try and try and go, go for some kind of pawn sacrifice to mm -hmm. solve our problems. Yeah, I mean, uh, white's uh, dark square bishop is a very good piece. Um, so if you manage to to play that off, I think it's uh, it's pretty good for black because then suddenly rook b8 becomes a great threat as well uh, at some point. Yeah, getting into the position. Um, maybe you can also try rook d8 uh, instead of with, uh, g7. Is that possible? Rook f8. But then maybe maybe you have rook a6 or. Just trying to keep the, the pin. Yeah, but I mean, this is where we'd be going super committal. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, obviously, if we swap the rooks off here, then, then we lose any kind of pressure on the sixth rank. And I, I don't think it's enough. We've seen many examples of white simply going pawn grabbing, and it never never works out yeah. well. But, you know, uh, black is the only one that's playing in this kind of position. Probably get close to winning in this kind of position. Right? Uh, but I guess rook a6 would also allow a lot of this counterplay with rook c2. Uh, and for example, uh, we, we no longer have time to play to play f5. Uh, although we're, we're not winning a piece with the move rook takes c2. We, we either got rook takes c2 or bishop c4. But it looks really good for, um, for yeah, black. Yeah, it looks really good for black. Here we have the, the rook trapped on h6. Yeah. And we, we haven't given up the piece. So... Uh, this is uh, this seems all very clear, but uh, amusingly, we've uh, we do have a move from David, wow. and it's okay. and uh, he obviously can see a reason why he would yeah. he would like the king on g one rather than d two. Um, I think if if David goes on and he wins this game, or, or or if we get a chance to speak to him later on, this will be the, the, the first moment I ask him about, or, or maybe one of the more important moments. Why? Why did you choose uh, Castle's King instead of the new King D two? Because everything that that we were discussing about the position, the idea of having the King yeah. uh, in the middle of the board for the for the ending, perhaps going after a weak A pawn, even the fact that uh, the pawn on H five is now a little bit more loose now that it's lost the protection of the rook on H one. Um, I would guess that it's about combining the two things that we've been talking about. Maybe F4 didn't work, mm -hmm. but the big advantage of having of playing castles instead of King D1, it's not that the king is uh, is on D1, it's that our rook is on F1. Yeah. So maybe what David wants to do is deliver checkmate or win the piece. So castles. How, how to prepare F4. Yeah, yeah, prepare F4, F5. And also we were talking about uh, lines where the G line opens up uh, after after F4, and we were saying that okay, we can't actually give a check on G3 because the, the rook can't go to H3 because of G6. Here after F4, uh, the rook does have a way of swinging over. It can go rook F3 to G3, and potentially we have yeah. this this mating attack on the heel on G8. That's a very good point. And 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 one thing in this position for Black it. At least, let's say that if this was a blitz game, we are so focused on um, the C file in in some ways. You have to you have to um, get rid of that rook. So it's it's kind of a an idea that it's. I mean, I think Nils will will look into it and and uh, and everything. But that that white castle in order to prepare F four is something that can you know uh, come as a surprise because you are expecting maybe rook F C one and continue pressuring the C file, go to the seventh rank. Uh, so yeah, maybe maybe this is actually mm. combining some of the ideas we've been discussing and 
and and uh, and a way of keeping up the pressure. Um, for, yeah. For white, the only thing now after is, is rook c8, uh, an option. So what to do in this position? Yeah. So my feeling is that maybe the way that David's playing is that he feels like castles waters rook fc8 because mm -hmm. of the threat of f4, and that uh, here it's it's definitely unrealistic to play rook a6. Guess. Yeah. Don't know about Bishop C4. I mean, this kind of thing is not inconceivable. Yeah. And we were talking about all these lines with F6 and trapping the bishop, uh, trapping the trapping the rook. It's slightly more plausible here. And we've also got this this thing down to, to F1. But uh, maybe there's still knight G3 in this position. It, it's certainly something yeah. that, that both sides have to consider for the time being. But I, I would it be... seems more committal to go to, to a6 yeah. and uh, more complicated. Yeah, I my expectation is that uh, David feels that, yeah, rook c8 is sort of forced or it's the move he's expecting and that he would just be happy to meet it with rook c1. And now he's simply threatening to win a pawn yeah. uh, by taking on, on c8 and taking on a7. And this time around... Uh, Black won't get the counterplay that he's been getting in the, in, in these previous variations. So maybe, let's say, for example, Black is forced to take on c6. Pick c6, but pick c6. Um, and I, yeah. But okay, maybe, uh, yeah, in this position, we would rather have our king on d2. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but, we, but White still has a very good position here. And if, if Carson and Kingside Forces black to accept this very, very passive position. And you can't always get everything that you want. That's, and, that's and, a good point. Yeah. And, and David feels that this is uh, this is more than enough. And uh, it just feels like try to to hang on to the to the a pawn somehow. I don't know, a six or uh, then rook c seven is just uh, really annoying. Uh, and then bishop c5, perhaps, afterwards. I uh, have to go really passive. Yeah. Um, so often what, what a player will want to do in these kind of scenarios is start thinking about how they can lose a pawn in the best possible way. Yeah. You know, not all not all endings are, are losing just because, uh, because we go a pawn down. But in all these variations at the moment, white is the one that starts off with the more active look. So... Black is playing playing catch up. You know, we go rook the eight in this position. Again, white is not going to be greedy and take this pawn on e seven. At least I think it's it's unlikely. I mean, potentially here you you even could because there are some lines where you have h six and potentially back rank for them. And that's king f eight in this position. I think more likely if we see a move like rook d eight, white will say no, no, I'm not I'm not interested in taking this pawn just now. I'm just going to play the move. Uh, knight to d4 here, and I will win this pawn on e7 when I'm good and ready. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, uh, you know, if we're if we're forced to to go on the defensive here, then I, you know, yeah. I think the position is basically already lost. And you know, we take on e6 for example. Yeah, um, this is a hopeless for for black. Absolutely. Um, so uh, yeah, I can appreciate the the reason behind the very. Very long think from David. Mm -hmm. And um, are there other other moves for for Nils uh, to consider? I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> if not, we're probably quite optimistic uh, for David. Um, oh yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, again, we're not we're not following en the engine here, but uh, but it feels that's our gut feeling. Yeah. Yeah. I think with a you know reasonably confident. I mean, it's difficult to tell exactly how large the advantage is. I have a tendency in my own games. Uh, I'm, I tend to be very very optimistic. Mm -hmm. uh, I would feel that uh, somehow I'm very very close to winning this. When you know maybe the true assessment is you know. You know but, 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 but that's the thing as well because people are asking you know why why aren't you using computers why why can't we see the evaluation and. You have to remember that this is a super strong computer's uh, evaluation of the position, and uh, 
with a rating of, I don't know, 3,400 or, you know, and, and I would say often if, if the computer says it's, I don't know, depends on the position, but my point is, uh, let's say 0 0.5 uh, uh, can be, for a human, uh, it feels like it can be 1 or 1 1.5 because um, the opponent will, will not necessarily find all these uh, computer moves uh, in the, on the defense. And um, this might very well be uh, a case like that. The computer says 0 0.4 for white, 0 0.5. And then, uh, but in practice, it, it's much, much more a comfortable advantage uh, because obviously you're playing uh, a human uh, opponent. Um, if that makes sense. Uh, Absolutely. So I, I think it's actually it's a really helpful way of looking at, uh, at evaluation. So if I was playing in this position with white, I would feel that uh, black is one bad move away from losing the game. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying, you know. Maybe rook f c eight, for example, is simply not the best move in this position. And after after a move like rook f c eight, white is very very close to winning. Yeah. For for example, I don't know for for a fact that that's true. Uh, whereas you'd say even if this position is only a little bit better for white, white can make three or four careless moves. Yeah. And if you if what you know, we're not talking about you know blundering the rook or something like that. We make three or four inaccurate moves, and still the assessment will be equal. So white has this uh, this luxury of being able to to try a whole number of things, and okay, if it doesn't work out, we're not risking that much. Whereas it it feels it's it's not an objective evaluation, but it feels like black's position on the precipice, and uh, and one one bad move and it falls off, and absolutely, and, and, and it can be game over. So so I think we are at a a very very critical moment in the game. Not very surprisingly, after after a fifty minute think from from David, and of course Nils would have been sitting there, I assume, analysing for for a large amount of this time, uh, and even even if it took him a while to expect move castles, I, I'm sure he will have calculated this amount of time himself, mm -hmm. and it it doesn't at least seem to me that there is uh, an obvious way to solve problems. No, I mean. We we talk candidate moves. Uh, we have rook f c eight in this position. Uh, we have maybe bishop e seven, uh, at least getting out of uh, any kind of problems on the sixth rank. But but I I guess something like this and knight d four is going to be very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And uh, bishop d five maybe runs into some kind of knight f five check. Yeah, not yeah. sure how this is looking. Um, yeah, it's not into d6, yeah. and yeah, I I suspect every single one of white's pieces is better than blacks. So suddenly, you may be even threatening e4, e5, just to yeah. I mean, we have all these issues over here. Black is forced to play something like this, but yeah. suddenly we're not talking about the principle of two weaknesses. Everything in black's position is a weakness. So it's just a question, you know. And then white can bring the other rook. Yeah, we can play rook a1 to target this pawn and to target rook a5 and yeah. come across in this direction. And and, and again, uh, there's there's some work to be done, but it feels like it's it should be a technical win for white in this kind of, yeah, this kind of scenario. Mm -hmm. So so bishop g7 uh, certainly does not solve the, the problems in this position. And then what else are we left with? Um, yeah, I, I would love to find a way to, to lose a pawn to black uh, and get some, some play. Uh, but uh, as soon as I, I find that idea, I will, I will let you know. <laughs> but uh, this is the most confident I've felt about David's position. Um, and uh, Gabe, but maybe the difference between myself and David as a player, you know, I would have gone King D2 in two minutes. Yep. David thinks for 50 minutes and suddenly, you know, strong players have this, this tendency. They they play a move and you think the opposition's okay. And then a couple of minutes after they make their move, you say, aha, uh -huh, I, I like my position far less than... Uh, but I'm really looking forward to, to hearing David's uh, thoughts after the game uh, on that very critical uh, moment. Uh, and, uh, and as you said, I mean, maybe that's uh, one of the big differences between 
being a player uh, of your strength, 2400 and, and 2650, 2700, um, because there must be a reason uh, that David is using Castle uh, instead of Indy 2. And um, maybe just has this gut feeling telling him this uh, intuition. Uh, and this this is a critical moment in the game. I, I would I would spend a lot of time now um, to to find the best continuation in order to maintain my advantage. And uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's it's super instructive. Obviously, we have a move from Mills, but we'll come to that in a second. But yeah, we come back to this moment where David had the long fifty minute think. Uh, it seems. Uh, really easy to get caught up in the narrative that we were we were looking at, which is White is pressing mm -hmm. uh, on the on the queen side. We're going after this weak pawn on a7. We're going after this weak pawn on, on e7. And so common sense tells us that we play king d2. That's where we want our king for the for the ending that we're in. And you know, and then then we we're ready to swing our rook across to to c1 or to a1 here. Uh, but David thinks for, for a long time and says, okay, obviously I have all of these ideas of, of attack A7 and E7, but you know what? If I play castles, I also have this idea of playing F4 and uh, and going for an attack on this side of the board or, or picking up the bishop on H6. And the combination of attacking on two sides of the board rather yeah. than one side of the board is the is the straw that breaks the camel's back. And, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, uh, and okay, Niels has played the move we expected, which is rook f8. Uh, yeah, we didn't see a clear alternative to that. And now I really am expecting David to play rook, uh, rook on f1 to c1 reasonably quick. Yeah, um, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, we talked a little bit about this, and there are some interesting things going on here, and. Actually, no, I'm going to take that back. I think, yeah, David is going to have a bit of a think here. Uh, maybe rook a6 and f4 is still worth considering. Mm, yeah. Um, but if if it's a choice between these two lines, then that's very, very bad news for, for, Nils, black, yeah. for, for Nils, because I, I think I can confidently say that, that white is already uh, a lot better after but, Rook C1 here. And, 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 and Rook FC1 just feels like a, a solid, a bit more safe approach. You know you have a good position. You know what the plan is uh, next uh, next moves. Uh, while Rook A6, uh, yeah, that's a lot more to, to analyze and to calculate. And it might be the best move in the position, uh, objectively. But uh, you're also giving Black a chance at some point to, to come into the rank maybe to activate the light squared bishop um some threats on you know c4 yeah it feels it feels like uh we might potentially be like letting black off the hook mm -hmm. and maybe for the first time there's a moment that we can play something like bishop seven take take knight d4 and maybe here we can find some way of of giving up a pawn and getting pressure on b2 uh, even even this position. Ah, oh, so here, Maybe. do we have bishop c4? Yeah, it might have actually. Calculate here. Rook eight. Yeah, rook eight. Rook eight We take, take. We have this cheeky threat of mate, but okay, this 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 can't actually work. Pawn is uh, is marching as well after rook g7, uh -huh. h6, but it's probably. But yeah, we we, we don't have time to yeah. play. We need we need to play h6 and king takes here yeah. all in one go. And but, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, if 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 I had the white pieces in this position, I would probably just have played rook f c1. It just feels as the solid, um, safe approach where you maintain a comfortable advantage. Um, but, uh, I mean, he still have some time on the clock, and um, if he feels that rook a six is worth uh, looking into, I'm, I'm sure he'll do that. But uh, he might dismiss it, you know, after a couple of minutes, and then just play. 
one. Yeah, and and very often this is the kind of practical decision that you would you you have to make in a game uh, before um, before Carlson. He probably felt he'd spent enough time yeah. uh, on these things. And it, it, okay, I've got this backup option of Rook FC one. Uh, if we get to this position, then I can check to see if Rook A six is an even strong move. Mm-hmm. But uh, there's no point searching for a second good move in a position before you reach it. Yeah, uh, that's, and, a, that's you know, a good, good point. Um, and, we, and, we, and we get a completely different type of game uh, after Rook C one or Rook A six. You know, it goes from um, quite straightforward, I would say, for white after rook c1 and after rook a6. It might get a bit messy. Uh, you might invite black into the game uh, in some some variations. And uh, I just feel uh, the way I know David as a person, as a player, I th- uh, my gut is telling me he'll play rook c1, but um, we'll see. Yeah. I mean, the fact that he hasn't moved already... Yeah. I- are there I, other moves I, than, um, yeah? You can, you, can, you can play rook takes rook. So let's just check to see. Uh, let's just check to see if there's. If we were to go all, all this way, let's put the rook down here. Is that enough if you, yeah, now take and take on e6? Yeah, we can either take on e6 straight away. Uh, I wondered if we could. Try and be very greedy and play move like Rook C1 mm-hmm. first. Because, yeah, if, if we take, then we've obviously got a very, very pleasant position. Yeah. But it feels like if the king hides on F7, that we might have a hard time actually winning yeah. this position. It, it's all very well to say, oh, well, you know, I've got a better position. Yeah, but, you know, it might be a whole but, but, but a moral victory is not the is not the victory that, yeah. that David is after here. Maybe, maybe play the move Rook C1. Uh, but again, I find it a little bit difficult to believe because we're still not threatening to take and play rook c8, and maybe threatening to go rook c7. Do you, do you have, yeah, that looks like a good move as well, but maybe, can, I mean, can he play the bishop g4? Or is too ambitious? You might have some. So why are you in his book? There's black here. You might have some back rank yeah, problems uh, yeah. at some point after f3 and yeah. take on h5. Yeah. So we've got here a knight f5 check. Yes. Very, must be very close. Oh, um, okay. Also, uh, maybe you just have f5 yeah. after king just yeah, threatening so rook g. We've got bishop d4 floating around d4, yeah. well, So this kind of position you can't, you know. Yeah. This looks here and this very one, dangerous. And this wins. Yeah. So no 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 I think uh before is too greedy. Yeah. But so but, rook but, b seven then in this position. Rook b seven here. Just try and yeah, and white has to be has to be better in this position, but it doesn't immediately feel like a like a winning advantage. Yeah. And uh all the pressure is all on the king side now. Uh for a long time we've been talking about uh, if we see this current position, uh, white being better almost on both sides of the board. Uh, and as soon as the, the a7 and b2 pawns get exchanged off, that's one less thing for black to worry about. White will be committed to, to only winning on the king's side. Uh, and yeah, so so that's an incredibly committed decision. Absolutely. But, but okay, it is the most fought in line. Uh, rook takes for that cue. But I guess it's also not impossible for black to recapture with the bishop. Um, yeah, make, it makes some sense. It looks a little bit passive. But uh, maybe black can just hold on to everything here and then say, okay, what are you going to do here? In, in two or three move ti- moves yeah. time, I will have no no real problem I guess, I guess that's all black needs just a couple of moves to to shuffle around a little bit and uh yeah get the rook into the game maybe try and trade off uh, the bishop yeah we have this perennial problem with the of the bishop on h6 and also uh white spot on b2 without the bishop uh, will become a target for, for black so yeah so that's why i i i prefer uh rook just to make uh 
Yeah, but it's, it's interesting. We can play a move like this, and it's remarkably difficult for Black to now yeah. uh, disentangle. Because, um, yeah, we can obviously no longer move the bishop without... But maybe, we have, maybe now we have to play a move like f6 and play f5. Yeah, uh, but now but now, how do you get this... Yeah, you, you, through... I mean, maybe f8, e5, but... Yeah, you're going to... Yeah, every single time you touch a pawn, then that's, yeah. that's another weakness that you're going... You're committing to, to make at some point. You know, we can we're gonna attack here and I don't know, start looking to hop into one of these two yeah. squares and uh, and yeah, again deeply, deeply unpleasant for black. So Absolutely. uh I'm reluctant to play F6 until I absolutely have have to. So what I again what I would like to do is to swing the rook to B5 perhaps. Again it yeah, again, it comes down to whether or not white can cause problems before black is coordinated. But uh, e5, for example, maybe black has time for the b6. And uh, okay, we can see rook a5, we should see. And that's that. yeah. but I think, uh, <laughs> no, this, of course, this won't happen. But... Um, okay, but David is having a lot of think, and we do have some uh, some interesting questions from from the chat. Uh, one for you, Tom, from uh, Bortnik. Do you spend much time on teaching the end game to your beginner intermediate students, or does the end game only become relevant once a player has the ability to reach it? Um, so it's a good question. I feel like the first thing you learn is just opening things because you know forget opening theory you need to know where your pieces yeah. are going at, at the start of the game and and a few basic tactics on how to how to not blunder pieces but then the single most important thing is how to win a game of chess and uh most games of chess at a beginner or intermediate level someone will blunder a piece i think it's much easier to uh to learn how to exchange pieces and you know get yourself a queen in the ending mm -hmm. than it is to to consistently made in the middle game yeah so i think just naturally uh the end game should come up in the analysis of games too yeah uh, as soon as you're not dropping pieces that's when you should be thinking well how am i actually going to to win end game you know things about things like uh bringing your king to the middle once the queens are exchanged off uh, and the importance of uh books being active uh for the most part, I don't think you need to know huge amounts of endgame theory, although uh, King and Pawn against King is just such a, it's such a lovely example to study, not only because it's important, but it's also the easiest example uh, of being able to analyse five or six moves ahead for, for a player at a relative beginning level with only three pieces on the board. You can obviously, you know, you can expect them to try and work out. Okay, we will, uh, if you know the king of one engine, you know the king has to go back directly in front of the pawn in order yeah. to hold on the draw. But you can say, okay, what happens if the king goes back uh, on the diagonal, and what happens if it goes straight back? And ask them to look three or four moves ahead. Mm -hmm. And it's the first time as a player you get to to look ahead like that. And it's one of the reasons that people find the end game so difficult, including incredibly strong. Because uh, most of the time we play chess moves on field. And in the ending, you might have some idea what the best move is. But because there, there are less pieces on the board, you have the, the chance to calculate much further ahead sometimes. You know, it, it might be realistic to say, okay, if all the rooks come off the board, uh, are we winning the pawn on A7 in 12 moves time? And for players of, of uh, David and Mills' standard, that's a realistic thing for them to be looking at. Whereas in a complicated middle game, they're probably most of the time looking to all four moves ahead at a maximum because there are a number of different ways the game could go. So, yeah, as soon as you're not blundering pieces, you should be studying the end at least a little bit. Mm -hmm. And also there's some, um, yeah, I mean, king and pawn opposition. You also have these famous, uh, well-known... Uh, the corner pawns versus king. You could just keep the king in the corner uh, to pre uh, promotion square. You have the, the opposite colored bishop pawn versus king. 
So there are some concrete, uh, easy examples uh, that you should know at some point. And um, I also remember one of my fir very first uh, chess tournaments. I I had uh, king and rook versus king, and I did. I wasn't able to checkmate. And I told myself, this is the first and last time I will ever not be able to uh, to win uh, a position like that. So I went home, and I, uh, my father and I looked at how to win uh, king and rook versus uh, king. And um, I mean, it's all a lot with chess is is about learning by doing. You know, you have to you have to experience uh, these difficult positions sometimes, and and learn from it basically. And uh, yeah, it's it's what's uh, fascinating fascinating about chess. At least in the beginning, you will learn different things uh, almost in each game. Uh, so analyze your games and. If you have a coach, that's great, obviously. And uh, yeah, but mm -hmm. it's, it's so much to take in. So you have to be organized as well, I guess. And take 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 things step by step. Uh, um, absolutely. And, you know, uh, and another thing, I mean, you made a really good point about you have to learn by doing. And uh, so, but when it comes to the ending, for example, you could, uh, you could study a bit like uh, 100 end games you must know, for example. Uh, or, or any any good end, end game book, uh, but if you're if you're just uh, sitting at home studying that book day after day after day, and you're not and you're not playing chess, even even let's say you know rapid play chess online rather than blitz, like so in like fifteen minutes each, uh, it may be that, uh, that during the course of reading this book, you learn thirty or forty new things. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're not playing chess, by the time you've actually played some chess games, you know. Uh, if none of these things are coming up, six months later, you will have forgotten almost every single one of them. Whereas if you work through the book a little bit, let's say you look at sort of three or four things, uh, and then you play a whole bunch of games, and then you say, okay, I'm, I'm going to try and, you know, concentrate on making sure I use my rooks more actively in end games, or, or exchange off pieces in the right way, or, or, or whatever it is, or, you know, uh, understand uh how to use past pawns in the ending for example. You, you, you study that for a little bit you play 10 games of chess and then you can analyze how well you did in those set of games okay you haven't learned 30 or 40 things but uh maybe the one or two things that you have learned have an actual chance of sinking in and uh you know knowing it for the for the long term mm -hmm. um i had a student who uh, came to me and he said that he didn't want to play chess because he felt he was so bad. What he wanted me to do was to take him from a beginner to a much stronger player so that he could turn up and play some chess uh, and, and be a good player. Before he started playing in a club? Yeah, but, but yeah, before, yeah, 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 he'd yeah. play a little bit online, mm -hmm. but, but yeah, he's like, you know, maybe like a, a rated 1,000, 1,200, but yeah, mm -hmm. make, make me an 1,800 player and then I will go and play some chess. And obviously, it's a you know a complete result. You know, you, you try and say, well, you know, we can, we can do a few interesting things, but you know, it might be a really nice idea if you know if you go and play some games, and yeah, you're probably going to lose some games. Yeah. You're going to make some mistakes, and but uh, but yeah, the idea of learning everything in theory, uh, even even like opening stuff. I know that the top players, for example, will organise training matches. Mm -hmm. that they play in secret and. Uh, you know, if you're going to play uh, the Sicilian for the first time, you've been a lifelong E4, E5 player. It doesn't matter how much uh, studying you've done of the theory. Uh, until you've played some games over the board, you don't develop the feel for the positions that you need to. So, so players will study the open theory and then organize training games between each other, for example. Uh, obviously, with the advantage of the games never appearing on the database, and they get get a feel for how to play the position so that when they sit down and they play it for their first real uh, important tournament game, that they already, not only do they know the theory behind it, but they, they've they already developed some of the practical know-how for, for how the game is going to progress. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and it's a bit sad, you know, if people are afraid to, to play in tournaments or join a local chess club because they they feel they're not good enough or we have the same thing in norway because population of five million uh something and uh it's it's being said that 
hundreds of thousands of Norwegians are playing online every week. But there's only, I, I think, about 3,000 uh, members of the Norwegian Chess Federation. And that just goes to show that I think this is a, uh, a common, uh, not a problem, but people uh, has a challenge in terms of actually uh, going out there, meeting people from the, the chess community. And my, I mean, my feeling is that 98% uh, of all chess players are really nice people and welcoming people. I mean, uh, so yeah, I encourage all of you to, to join a local chess club. Uh, and you'll meet you'll meet people, you'll meet friends. Uh, that's what I'm, what I did, you know, 20 years ago when I started traveling and playing tournaments. So yeah, don't be too afraid of uh, of going out there, and and you will lose a lot of games in the beginning. But uh, we've all been there, and and that makes it even more satisfying when you actually start uh, start winning, and uh, you feel the progression, and you see your rating uh, jumps up, and and so on. But you just have to. Yeah, go for it. Absolutely. And, you know, I think for the most part, uh, you know, chess is a, it can be a lifelong commitment for people, but uh, I think most of us wouldn't continue on with the game. You know, we have a lot of chess players have a love-hate relationship with the game itself. But uh, but if you take away the social aspect from all of that, then uh, I think, you know, we'd see far more people giving up the game. Yeah. So, yeah, going along to a club and, uh, you know, uh, and if, if the first club you don't go go to isn't as welcoming as you would like, then, then find another one. Yeah. You know? I know in, in London there's a, there's a great variety of clubs uh, that sort of cater to all level of abilities. How, and, how many clubs do you reckon there is in, in London? Oh, that's approximately? Right. Uh, 30 maybe, yeah. some, something like that. You know, uh, I'm a member of, uh, of Hammersmith Chess Club and, uh, and it recently made the... Uh, the bold decision to buy to buy a new venue or to, to mm. co uh, buy the building with other with other mind sports, so they've got a permanent place to to go to. And uh, uh, I grew up playing chess, and you know we've all played chess in many different environments. I played in uh, in school halls and you know yeah. some you know freezing cold places in the middle of the winter. But uh, you know, fond memories of the Hastings Congress used to take place on the pier, of course. Mm -hmm. Absolutely freezing cold. The, the, every single year, the toilets would freeze over. Yeah, uh, and you know, and okay, it had character, but uh, but no, there were some there were some really good clubs out there, and uh, and yeah, the for the most part, they're very very welcoming, and uh, there should always be someone there to, to greet you. And, and and okay, and we have a move from David. Uh, so again, you know, he thinks for a long time. You know, you remember David used to have an advantage on the clock in this game. Yeah, he uh, he got the preparation in, but uh, yeah, he was I don't know at least twenty thirty minutes up I think after the opening. Yeah, and I was down by twenty minutes. Okay, so he takes on C eight. Um, yeah, that was one of the moves we we were anticipating. Um, what do you think uh, Nils will do now? Uh, Capture with the bishop or the rook. Uh, I th I think I assumed that capturing with the bishop was the was going to be a mistake because of uh, of how active white was getting with with this kind of idea. Yeah. Okay, one to a five. So instinctively, I wanted to play like this, uh, and I imagine that David is not intending to play the move bishop takes a seven. This was the kind of thing that we were we were saying. Uh, probably black might survive this. Uh, yeah, this yeah. And, so. Unless we have some kind of cunning way to get our rook to the back rank mm -hmm. really quickly and cause some immediate problems, that this this should perhaps be okay. Well, I imagine uh, that David would probably play rook a one here. I, if I had to make a prediction, it'd be something like rook six c eight rook a one, and yeah. if if black black cannot go passive here, because with the rooks off, we, we've seen this kind of position yeah. many times, and, and, so, and uh, we feel this should be comfortably winning for white. Mm -hmm. So can black play the move rook to c two? Obviously, uh, 
similar to Knight on. But does it achieve two? that much? It, I guess in worst case, you can always go Knight G3 or even. Yeah, I was yeah, I was trying to do a quick calculation for the rook takes a seven here, but I think it's just a pipe dream. Um, ah, that's an interesting idea, though. Um, yeah, and then show. Yeah, so if we if if we check, I don't think works because if we go h six here, black has to oh, yeah. go yeah. f and, and prevent bishop into g seven. But I was just starting to wonder if it was completely ridiculous to do this and then take on e seven. And say to Black, you have a, a whole move to defend against uh, against the idea of rookie eight. But it it seems somewhat far fetched. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if Bishop C five, King G seven, and King King wriggles away. Uh, I mean, may, we'd have perpetual. We, yeah, we'd have a repetition of moves here mm -hmm. with Bishop D four, King F eight. But. But I, I don't see that White is playing there. So um, it, it was an idea, but, but yeah, but interesting. I mean, it's been it's been a theme throughout the game as well. The back rank issues for for Black. Um, yeah, so I think you know, back in in the more realistic things, we find a good square for this knight. We could go to c3. I'm not sure how much of a difference it is. I think knight, knight g3 has to be the has to be the most logical move here. Uh, and then it so looks, the, then it looks like out. white might might be able to to win that pawn on a seven. Yeah. Can you now play your uh, disgusting move f five just to try and? Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure it really threatens very much. much. Well, yeah, uh, you know we can go f five f four, but but so what? I think we can. Yeah, you know, we have what takes you seven here, maybe. But even if we just go knight e four. I'm not really seeing it. From, yeah. Yeah. Now you also threaten uh, rookie. Uh, maybe. Yeah. May, we can we can hope for some kind of trick like this mm -hmm. and, and counter play on G2. So it's not it's not a million miles off working, but um, but yeah. But yeah, I, I I don't I don't believe it as a as a concept for the moment. I think more likely black uh, uses uses that tempo to play bishop back to g7. Um, but this time round, we are we are properly going a pawn down, uh, and we might reach one of these very technical endings. We'll work out whether we play rook takes a7 first or bishop takes g7. But okay, just just to give you an example, we can take on g7 and take here, and f6 then rook b7 maybe and there's 94 check floating around as well mm -hmm. so let's just say we get to this kind of thing wow and uh... and we have we have ourselves uh, a rook rook knight and four against rook bishop and three and my understanding uh, of the material imbalance is that generally if all the pawns are on one side of the board you would rather have the have the knight than the bishop mm -hmm. um and that this seems like a non-ideal pawn structure for black to be defending, uh, which is a, a lot of ways of saying that I'm not sure if white is winning or not. Mm -hmm. But certainly it's not uh, a textbook draw, uh, and it's not something that black will be comfortable going into and saying, uh, it, it's fine, uh, this ending is defendable. Mm -hmm. um, it is right on the borderline between winning and, and, and uh, for white or, or or black miserably holding on for a draw and you know but david will play this position for, forever yeah, yeah. It's this this will be the actual seven yeah. seven hour game if we get to this ending it might be a long long game so uh we we have seen neil's recapture rook takes here which is what we expected and i felt like early on we were doing okay with the predictions but uh as the players have been spending more and more time uh, they've obviously been going more in depth into the position. We've started to not do so well, but but okay. So candidate moves here. Rook a1 uh, is what I would want to play very quickly, but you could make a case for knight c3. Mm -hmm. uh, stopping the rook from coming down to c2. But the, the way that I would approach this position 
is that rook a1 is the more forcing line. If, if I can't find a way for black to solve problems after rook a1, then, then it should be the best move. Mm -hmm. uh, as if black has some way of solving the problems, then, then knight c3 is our fallback. Um, but uh, but again, I imagine that David will, you know, David has 30 minutes on his clock. Why not have 25 minutes? <laughs> and, you know, five minutes is plenty to, to reach through. Absolutely. So we went, we're somehow only at move 19. David played, what, 12 moves very, very quickly. Yeah. And, and, uh, he spent almost one and a half hour, I believe. Yeah. From the last seven minutes. But should we have a, a quick uh, breather uh, while David is uh, thinking? Um, we're in this exciting in-game position. We still believe David has uh, has an advantage, but uh, we also see some some chances for Cornels to to make the draw. So we'll be back in a few minutes to to follow the the action. So stay tuned. It's time to take control of your journey towards chess mastery. Magnus Carlsen introduces Chessable, the definitive solution for studying chess. Move Trainer uses the science of spaced repetition to identify your strengths and eliminate your weaknesses. There's no need to set up a board, remember which page you're on, or keep track of all the moves you miss. Get started now and join our growing community of over 100,000 chess enthusiasts. Chessable, take control of your journey towards chess mastery. I moved away from the city 13 years ago. I worked as a journalist, I studied in university, but there was a sense of longing towards something a bit more real where I could actually create things and, and uh, be much closer to nature. I'm a vegan farmer. That's a bit unusual, but uh, that's what I am. It's a long story. I used to be one of those people that thought that veganism is impossible, very deeply entrenched in, in like the small scale uh, animal farming uh, community. You know, I was a leading proponent for keeping pigs and, and doing animal husbandry, but with a human uh, touch. Well, as our business grew, our farm expanded and our shop started selling more and more meat and eggs and milk. It felt less as I was doing something good for the animals and more and more as I was just showing a happy face for uh, any kind of animal product consumption. It felt like I was a poster boy for, for the animal industry in itself. So I, I, uh, that didn't feel so good, to be honest. So we're picking for the bags and it's 15 bags that makes about three kilos, just a little bit extra to be sure. I came across veganism on YouTube actually and um, a lot of the things they were saying started to make a lot of sense. The first year or so was really difficult. I made a lot of enemies, unfortunately, because most of my friends were also farmers with animals on their farm. And when I started posting on Facebook that I was a vegan and I was against killing animals and all that stuff, and that wasn't too popular with my farmer friends. <laughs> there were just so many questions also that we had to answer. What are you going to eat instead? It's not easy to make a dietary change, but it's even more difficult to make a change in a farm. Our whole infrastructure, everything we had on the farm, was based around animals. We sold the animals, uh, took down all the fencing, we tore down the animal houses. Uh, and uh, if you don't have animals, you still have to uh, produce something on your farm, obviously. And we put a lot of effort into growing different beans and legumes.
there's enormous potential in switching from animal uh, agriculture into vegan agriculture purely from an efficiency uh, s viewpoint. You know, if you grow one hectare of beans and uh, compare that to one hectare of uh, grass for sheep, you will find that the beans produce, I think it's up to 10 times as many calories on the same amount of land. Animals aren't a very efficient way often to produce food, you know. You, your food kind of takes a, an extra way through the animal, you know. You grow grains, you give them to the animal, and then you eat the animal, you lose a lot on the way. Instead, if you grow grains and make that into a product that's eaten directly by humans, you know, you're just taking a shortcut and, and being more efficient also. We're approaching nine billion people here on the planet. We need to be more efficient with the land we already have. And I think yeah, going into vegan farming, that will be one of the most important steps we can take. I still have friends who have animals. Uh, I don't mind that. There's many places that are not suitable for vegan farming. You can only grow grass there. This is one of them. It's a beautiful place. There's no one model that fits everybody. Uh, different farms have different uh, possibilities and you have to adapt to the way your farm is. And uh, this is uh, yeah, a beautiful place where animals graze. I, I like that also. But there should be alternatives. <laughs> We're not bound by tradition anymore. You can just, instead of doing like your parents or your neighbors do, Google your way and just find, uh, you know, some guy in New Zealand who's doing a thing and copy that guy instead.
Hey guys, and welcome back to the fourth fourth game in the special challenge match between David Howell from England and Nils Grandelius from Sweden. They're playing in the heart of London in the Swedish embassy. And today I'm joined by uh, international master uh, Tom Rennell. And um, we have this interesting end game now, uh, Tom. Looks like David has uh, a slight... Uh, advantage and we've had a, we had a couple of moves um since we went on break so let's uh let's get up to the position yeah what absolutely so so where were we before before the break uh we were sitting in this position here and we were discussing the options for, for why and that and we said okay we take this pawn on uh on a7 but that seemed premature because it allows look down to c2 we were, we were wondering maybe would David choose between going knight c3 and rook, o, uh, rook a1 here. Uh, but of course David likes to confound our expectation. And, uh, I'm sure for very concrete reasons he's decided to take the pawn on a7. Uh, we did at least predict how the game would continue after that. So rook c2, knight d4, rook takes b2. So now the, the playing field has narrowed. The, the pawns have gone from the, from the queen side. And almost all of the attention can now be turned to, to the king side, where where Black still has multiple problems uh, to deal with here. And David played the move bishop c5, simply attacking the pawn on on e7, and we were speculating during the break uh, which way uh, Niels would defend this pawn. I thought maybe he'd go rook down to b7, but I guess it's a shame to to move the rook away. From active square on the seventh rank. Uh, I think King F8 simply wouldn't have worked in this position after, after Rook A1. And the Rook comes into the back rank and this feels uh, simply like Black is probably going to be losing a pawn very, very quickly. Uh, so instead we've seen the move Bishop to F8 here. And it feels like we're, we're getting to the business end of, uh, of this game. And uh, David has a lot of options in this position. Uh, it, it must be somewhat better for White. At any time, White can choose to play the move knight takes e6, f takes e6. And to this ending where White has all of the pluses, uh, the, the much better pawn structure, the more active bishop. We can get the, rook, the back rank, for example, maybe go g4 and, and fit the but with there being so few pieces on the board and, and four pawns each all on the king side, even with all of these advantages, uh, it doesn't seem to me like this is enough to, to be winning. At least I wouldn't wouldn't feel confident uh, about winning this. Right. So I think David is is looking for more here, uh, not completely ruling out the idea of taking the bishop on e6, but perhaps looking to probe for, for further weaknesses somewhere else first, maybe starting off with a move like play one and again threaten to invade on the back rank. I think if, if white manages to get the rook to a8, it looks really promising. Yeah. Creating a pin. Yeah, and despite the fact that we're in the ending, uh, everything is still tactical. So, uh, yeah, like you said, if the rook reaches a8, then, then bad news. Uh, then things are very, very unpleasant for, for Black. He'd like to go King G7, for example, for, uh, to side that, that pin. Unfortunately, we walk into to a rather unpleasant walk, uh, and we drop the rook on B2. And then there's another interesting uh, theme, uh, tactical theme. That's um, if you if you do make a move for, for Black, let's say Rook, rook B7, or yeah, and then Rook A8, and then. Uh, if you want to try and play king g7, now h6 might be a... And if you go back, you have maybe knight c6 and things like that. Um, looks really unpleasant. Ouch. Uh, yeah, ouch is, would, be, would be my assessment of this position. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately for black, it's one of those positions where if you can hold the pawn on uh, e7, then everything is okay. As soon as that goes, you know, the, the kingdom falls. And, and what's interesting in, in, in this line, at least, the H bomb is actually winning the game for, for White. Yeah. Basically. Our old friend Harry. Yeah. Uh, just been slowly marching down the board as the game uh, progresses. Every time we forget about it and think that, you know, it, it's rollers done for the, yeah. for the game, it, 
it pops up again. <laughs> uh, Last trick. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So the, it looks like there are a number of ways to get a, a terrible possession for, for black up the rook a1. But, and uh, if you try rook a2, you probably just play rook b1 again and try and Oh, it. yeah. I'd actually forgot about this. Um, yeah, I guess we play rook b1 here and remove the threat down to, to here. Maybe, maybe now we can try and rook a5, harass. Yeah. yeah, play rook a5. Um, Not give. Yeah, lack of it's, moment. It's, it's a good move. Do, do does this win a pawn? A take. Play knight c six. Mm. Another attack. Well, uh, wow. Yeah. And you you don't actually have a way of you know of defending anything at all. And again, we get to one of these endings where it's only the, the single pawn, but it feels feels super uncomfortable. Well, the knight is not does not have that many escape scores. Yeah, this kind of position. Yeah, the knight is a bit a bit awkward uh, square. Yeah, but it, it it feels like with there not being any ways of actually trapping it, that we should be able to. Uh, yeah, we but, should. But how how is this ending if if uh, the knight were was traded off for the the bishop? If the knight was traded off for, for the, versus three. the for the bishop. Uh, black would have excellent drawing chances. Mm -hmm. uh, it wouldn't be a straightforward draw. Um, let's. I'm just trying to think of some. Yeah, let's yeah just, I was just thinking. You know. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah. Uh, back to move. Let's play h6. Yeah. Rook c, rook c7. Let's just say that we go this way yeah. and take some. Now, uh, the ideal pawn structure for black in this kind of ending. Would be to have a single pawn chain with only one weakness. So, so that would be pawns on f f seven g six h five, mm -hmm. and there I would be comfortable saying uh, the game is a textbook draw. Uh, without having that situation, um, white is going to have a number of different ways of, of playing. You know, we can uh, try and walk the king up to, to g four. Try and you know maybe threaten to go to f four at some point. Some moment, try and force black to push the f pawn, and uh, and and I guess if, if black uh, plays, you know, f six at some point, and, and you get in rook yeah. seven rank, then it looks a bit uh, difficult. Yeah, this kind of position, you know, okay. king yeah, king, king, for king king g eight, for example. This feels like it should be it should be it should be winning. For yeah, yeah. So I think uh, it's a it's a very bad version. Of, uh, of looking three versus, mm -hmm. uh, I again, uh, yeah, I don't think the exact evaluation of the ending is that. I would expect White to win it more. Um, yeah, that's, in, uh, that's interesting. In, in practice, but but also I don't think that that uh, White would be the one seeking to exchange off the knight for bishop. I suspect we would probably try and keep the knight on the board for a little bit. I would guess if the rooks came off instead of the knight and bishop, but knight and four is quite likely to be winning against the bishop and three. Although, uh, having said that, ironically, the pawn on h5 would actually be uh, uh, be vulnerable to, to the bishop coming to yep. g4 in some scenarios. So, so a lot of perhaps, and it depends, but uh, but obviously this isn't what black is trying to, to get yesterday. Um, but so what are we what were we looking at here? That was Bishop F8, Rook A1. Mm -hmm. Okay, David properly using up his time here. Um, but I guess this is also another critical moment um, in in the end game. Um, when you have the obvious choice of uh, taking on E6, but I guess David is now asking himself, is that enough uh, to win the game? Or should he try and activate the rook and uh, and try and get him into either a7, a8, and uh, yeah, try and make some um, some tactical blows there uh, yeah. around the black king. Just wondering about the move knight c6 as ah, well. Yeah, uh, I, I was going to suggest it as a as a uh, a way of playing badly going after the pawn, but I'm not actually sure it's so clear for black to defend so 
I'll give you an example variation, something like e2. Uh, let, let, yeah, knight takes e7, it takes e7, e7. So in theory, this makes a lot of sense for black uh, losing a pawn, but going into an opposite color bishop ending. But even this ending uh, remains deeply unpleasant because we have to waste a move according onto this five pawn, let's say we eight six. That gives white a moment to play bishop f6. And uh, even with just the bishop and rooks on the board, white is still attempting to get checkmate in this position. And if black is forced to passively defend and bring the rook to d1, and we can use the, the fact that the black rook is tied to the back rank to give us a free hand mm -hmm. elsewhere, you know, find the right moment to push f4. Uh, yeah, I guess find the right moment to push f4, but you know, we, uh, Black's king and rook are, uh, are committed to being tied down for the foreseeable future. We play f3 uh, at some moment, then white never has to worry about the h5 pawn, and Black is only defending for a very long time, and, uh, and I don't feel good about Black. Even only one pawn down in a in an opposite color bishop and look in English. Both both the black rook and the black king is kind of tied tied down to to Spain on, on the eighth uh, eighth rank. Um, yeah, I have to yeah. say the, these are the positions that I find the most unpleasant to defend because uh, it it doesn't feel hopeless. But what there is is there there's no counterplay. Yeah, there's no there's no time limit on how long you can be tortured. In, you know, just in sit and wait yeah, and yeah, yeah. do nothing and yeah. then uh, it's so easy to slip up uh, yeah. yeah you know you, yeah what you want to do is carry on playing quickly you want to keep on shuffling your rooks between two squares and saying go and do something but for every single move that you do that you have to calculate is this the move where my opponent is going to play f4 yeah. uh, and win it's like oh, okay so he, he can't go f4 in this position he goes four we shuffle the Rip back and forth for a couple of times, and then we can get to the d3, and then we have to calculate f4 all over again. And uh, and none of this is actually going to happen because David has uh, has gone for the concrete knight takes e6. Uh, I have to say, David has a very different idea of how to play this position to me. Um, I think he feels that he must be winning a pawn by force here. Because if we were to give uh, if we were to give black enough tempi to defend, let me play a bad move for white here. I can't imagine F3 is critical. And we have time to play bishop seven. And we can sort of sit with the bishop on F6 and H6. And I have a hard time believing that white is breaking through in this position. But uh, okay, this is with one one careless move. Uh, so rook c1 is the current position. And okay, let's say for the moment black plays king f7. Um, wow, well, this is this is not what I was expecting. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. Um, <coughs> And if, it's a bit funny because um, if this now fizzles out in a draw, I, I just feel both players in, in all the four games with the white pieces has had, um, if not serious advantage, at, uh, I mean, pleasant advantage and, and just slightly failed to, to convert um, those promising positions. And um, it will be interesting to see if that's the case uh, today as well. But uh, I still believe David has has the better better position and uh, Mills has to defend, but um, yeah, yeah. And we're, okay, and we've seen King F seven from Mills very quickly. Yeah. I think it's a it's it a, good, a lot of sense. It's a good practical decision. It's uh, it, it was the only clear way of improving the position. And at this point, uh, it's nice to play a quick move because okay, we're on move twenty three now. Now with not very many pieces on the board, uh, fourteen minutes. Uh, to make 17 moves, not a dire situation for David at all. Uh, I think the chances of him making a blunder and losing uh, 
Japan is incredibly, incredibly small. But there, if this position is good for White, there will be one key moment between now and move, uh, move forward. And if David has 30 seconds to make that decision rather than five minutes to make that decision, then that can make the difference between him finding the, the winning idea and not finding it. But, um, but it's interesting because we've had a couple of critical moments now. So, so after the game, just to get some insight uh, on, uh, you know, what was the most castles instead of King, uh, King did two. Take the pawn on uh, a seven, take the rook on c8 instead of uh, doubling uh, the rooks in the file. We've had a couple of uh, what I feel are critical moments. And just to, to, to hear David's um, uh, reasoning behind behind that and get some insight would be very interesting. Oh, it's, it's going to be fascinating because it, it does feel like it's been a game of, uh, of David has been the one with the creative ideas. Obviously, that right from the opening, he. Uh, he showed an interesting, uh, uh, an excellent preparation. And Nils has simply been trying to hold on yeah. for a long time. And obviously, you know, he's been looking at all of David's ideas as well. But Nate, David has been the one time and time again where we said there were three or four interesting ways of playing the possession. Whereas Black has been walking this tight way. Okay, well, if I if I see a move and it doesn't lose, then, then it's a good move. Yeah. Um, but okay, so we have seen quite a fast reply from David. He's played bishop to d4, uh, gaining a tempo on the rook. And one interesting thing here is I'm going to play a move which I don't think is the best. Let's say I go rook b3. Uh, now, if we were to put the rook down onto c7, uh, black is unable to. to uh, get this bishop on f8 back in the game. Yeah. If there's been any more constant for black than the problem of having a couple of weak pawns, it's been uh, what to do with that bishop. Yeah. It was stuck on h6 for a very long time, and in this position it's stuck on f8. And the, the obvious tactical point is here that uh, if we haven't played the move bishop g7, then we can simply take on g7 and take on e7, and here we win two pawns yeah. rather than one. That's uh, absolutely game over. And that, yeah, that's absolutely game over. Even if the rook was back on b6 and defending this pawn, I, I wouldn't fancy black chances in the ending anyway. But, uh, but certainly it doesn't feel like in this kind of position, black would be able to escape without at least giving up a crucial. But maybe he has to go back to, to b7 to avoid this because it looks really unpleasant. If, if white gets the rook to c7, then plays f3, king h2, it's suddenly coming up the board, improving. Yeah, so the downside though is that at the moment the rook is doing a really good job of, of uh, holding the seventh rank. Mm -hmm. As soon as it goes back here, we've now freed up the king on g1 to go for a little what, go for a little wander. I assume that we're going to look to do something like this at some point. Um, I don't know. It's a it's a fascinating ending that we've got yeah. because uh, I know this position is very good for White, but uh, how David has made the decision that uh, this is probably enough to win uh, because he had so many really uh, promising options and uh, he went for this you know relatively quickly. Um, yeah, and, absolutely. And um, yeah, he's he's certainly not risking anything at all in this kind of position. But maybe, yeah, but, maybe, but, maybe that's what he wanted, just to have a risk-free uh, two result uh, end game. Um, but maybe he he has slightly misplayed it. I don't. I don't know. So I think the first thing to do is uh, what happens if Black essentially sits in this position. Yeah. Uh, well, there is going to be the possibility of exchanging off the bishops. I mean, you do have some pawn breaks at some point. Um, yeah. but let's put the chalk on the t6. Yeah. Uh, maybe we could have played this before playing king h2 to prevent bishop g7. But okay, so we say you can never play bishop g7 again because uh, not only are we at pawn down, but the rook is absolutely dominating yeah. in the sixth rank here. And uh, uh, I'm up. Uh, 
I'm confident saying that this is a winning ending for White. I think White can organise F4 at the right moment and we can get to the pass yeah. the on the Kings if we need to. It should be winning. Yeah, I think I think they should be winning. So this feels like uh, we've we're forcing Black to, to just pass. So let, let's, for example, just imagine that Black is going to shuffle. Now, uh, actually, I wonder if E4 is the, is the right square to. It's crossed my mind yeah. that Black might go with E6 at some point. But, uh, let's, in the moment, ignore this. And it also protect uh, the bishop as uh, a core. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What I want to do is get to some position like this, play F4 at exactly the right moment, uh, and if Black doesn't take, then it's incredibly uncomfortable. And if they do take, and we have this G5 yeah. break in, and uh, yeah, this position this will be winning. Yeah. This position will be winning. So, uh, David's claim, as I understand it, going into this line, is that he will be able to find some position where Black can do nothing, and he can improve his position and improve his position up until the moment he can break through almost certainly with the move F4. Mm -hmm. And we will not see David play F4 until it wins. And, and, and as you pointed out, I mean, if, if Black ever tries to play Rook D6, he just play Rook C7 with the same type of <clears throat> theme, right? I can never go Bishop G7 because either E7 or E6 will fall. Yeah. Uh, so, and what we would need to do, I, I find it hard to believe that Black can sit passively for the entire time and do nothing. But at some moment, you have to swing back into counterplay. And this is the, the balancing act that, uh, that White will have to do. But yeah, King E4 here would be careless. Maybe we'll play yeah, G4. G4 and say, OK, we're going to do this and this. And what, what are you going to do about this as Black? Maybe, yeah, maybe I have to try Rook A this position. Uh -huh. So yeah, we go, we go rook a2 and we're trying to stop this. And we can put our king on a couple of different squares. Yeah, this is the kind of grim way that you, you want to hold on. You maybe you say, well, we try and force the king to g3, and white again threatens to play f4, and black goes rook yeah. a3, so that if we go f4, we're at least to recap the king. Mm -hmm. I mean, this ending is still incredibly unpleasant for black. Yeah. But uh, white, white uh, doesn't have to commit to doing this. Uh, White can play for 40 moves, uh, trying everything else yeah. uh, to be able to recap with the pawn on F4. And if it doesn't work, then we get to this ending and, and Black will have to defend this. But I I suspect White can organise a way of getting F4 in. I don't know if going Bishop C3 might be asking for trouble. Because, of, yeah. We're, I'm trying to unpin the e pawn, but obviously now if uh, we still couldn't play f4 in this possession. Yeah, because of because it's seven, right? right. Yeah, I'm starting to, to be more optimistic now after some of those uh, optimistic on David's behalf. Uh, I'm a g4 <laughs> bringing the king in, and then at the right time, try and play f4. And, well, that's obviously, um, maybe, um, yeah, we'll be looking at maybe he saw this many, many moves ago, probably did. Um, yeah, yeah, he's obviously thought very, very deeply about this position because, yeah, purely from a superficial nature, uh, we agreed this position must obviously be very comfortable for white, yeah. but, but yeah, rook bishop and four against rook bishop and four, you think even the worst possible scenario. You should be able to scrape into some kind of, you know, pull down, rook and pawn ending, and yeah. Uh, you know, and yeah, and, and hold on, and yeah, but uh, but definitely not so simple. Uh, yeah, I I think David has gone for this not because it's uh, you know it it is it, he's obviously not risking anything, but uh, I think he will be furious if he doesn't win this game. Yeah, I, 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 agree I, with I, you. I I think he considers. His advantage to be maybe to, maybe to even be bigger and, and also maybe even bigger than he had in game two for the white pieces. Yeah. Um, 
but again, up with with with, with no counterplay whatsoever. Yeah. In that, that scenario, I think he had a uh, yeah, he did have a very very large advantage, but probably for only one or two wins. Yeah, whatever the size of his advantage right now, it's not going away uh, anytime soon. I expect unless uh, we see the move with B five from from Nils. I wonder if this means he's going to concretely uh, mm. attempt to solve it immediately with pawn to e5. I think, I think this is Neil saying, I will not sit around uh, and wait for you to get your dream possession. Yeah. Uh, if I allow you to play g4 and king to e4, then I agree with you. Yeah. White is winning. So even if e5 is an incredibly ugly move to play, uh, I have to play it. Yeah. Um, so it feels to me like maybe rook c6 is the most logical move here so that uh, if the pawn does come forward to e5 at least the king isn't immediately escaping but but uh, now at least we're making some moves with some of our pieces and okay the, the bishop on f6 is, is, uh, is not the world's most exciting bishop but it doesn't need to be, because generally to win this game, earlier on I was talking about White needing to play the move f4 in order to, to, uh, to ever win this game. And here, if we put the bishop on f6, it's a miserable piece right up until the moment White plays f4. And then suddenly it will spring back into life. Yeah. And uh, it's doing a good job just holding holding uh, things together Yeah. Uh, on f6. Um, and yeah, no. So I was talking earlier about you know when you play a really strong player, uh, they make a move and suddenly it causes you to reevaluate the possession. We were we were looking at this position with the with the rook on e two, and we were talking about the rook going uh, either to a two or back to b seven, uh, and we really really didn't like that position whatsoever. But suddenly with the move rook to b five, uh, black has maybe a positional threat. Um, and and yeah, yeah and it looks like a yeah, good defensive move by Nils. Yeah. He realizes that he has to has to come up with something. Yeah. So if not uh, David will just uh, improve the position and move by move. Yeah I think it's incredibly timely as well. Uh, and one of the things that makes me think that David could have overlooked a move like this, but if uh, if White had the pawn on g4 already, uh, then we could start start to consider playing uh, f4 at some point. Mm -hmm. But uh, but at the moment uh, we have no tempo to stop f5. Play f4 straight away. Black will simply take and play rook takes h5. And okay, the, the extra pawn is. Completely meaningless in this direction, but, but uh, the players yeah. can hands in a very draw here, reasonably safe, I, I, I suspect. So simply going f4 is is not an option for White at the moment. But I, I have an important question in this position. How okay? Uh, how do you assess Rook c5 and that uh, type of ending? Still very drawish, or can White ever try to win on this? The rooks are traded up. So here takes takes. And then try and achieve. Yeah, that's probably not easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, I'm I'm trying to stop and pause and think what the what the dream kind of scenario is. Uh white can definitely try to play this possession. Uh again, I think it doesn't change what white's plan is very much. Yeah. We're going to put the king on e4. Uh, an attempt to play f4, but it's certainly a more realistic fortress position for black. Yeah. Uh, I would guess a draw. Yeah. I, 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 even even I, though you get two versus one, one on the on the king side is probably not enough. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, even that is not a guarantee because black can play the move e5. Yeah. Once uh, the move e5 straight away, and it's it's horrendously. Uh, bad to look at, but if we have some position like this, even for example, one of the worst bishops you will ever see. But 
Yeah. Uh, but, it, but this bishop on, on c5 cannot hit both g5 and e5 at the same time. Uh, and I simply don't see a way of making progress. That's sort of imagining the, the king somehow getting in round the back, but I think it's it's not yeah. going it's not going to happen. So I think this is a fortress. So uh, David will definitely have considered this. It almost forces the rook exchange, but but I'm not surprised at all to see David keep the rooks on the board with the move rook to c7. <clears throat> and now what I would expect is to see the move e5 reasonably soon, because again. Uh, what move is Black going to play to make his position better? Uh, we know that as White, we're going to play e4, king g2, king e4. Maybe there's one move that we could make. Maybe we go h6 here. But that, that's about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so the critical question is what happens if e5 is played straight away? Um, and I don't know if it makes a massive difference. Where the bishop goes there. You can obviously go to c5 or to c3. So let's, for example, just put on, uh, on c5 for the sake of argument for the moment. And yeah, maybe white can, uh, no black can. Uh... There's still there's still not time to go to G7 to F6. Um, okay, what about King X? Okay, so King E6. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not threatening to go okay, King B5, I don't think. Let me play pawn to G. Um, one thing that white can obviously try and uh, sorry that black can try and do is to play e4 at the, at the white moment. So uh, maybe yeah to stop the the king going to that square. Maybe this is black's kind of defensive idea to go e5 e4. Also kind of stopping f4 as well. Yeah, stopping f4, stopping the king from going to its square. But now now white can reroute, and that pawn on e4 is a is a target. Uh, it's just a case of how do we attack all of these pawns? Mm -hmm. um, you know, why would we come back with this bishop? Uh, and we're we're actually threatening to win the bishop on f8. Uh, okay, no. Well, okay, maybe maybe not win, but we're we're forcing the king back to f7. Um, Oh, such a tough position. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, so if White is able to pick up the e4 pawn again, I think it's winning. So maybe we we well, fought, we force the king back either with a check or with something like this, and, and, then, and then play with c4. And here again, we would be threatening to win the pawn by moving bishop. And, you know, maybe even bishop h8 sometimes, but uh, but. And the king goes back to e6. Again, okay, but the king, the king is not. Yeah, and because, the king cannot hold on to the pawn like this. Oh, and also maybe after, for example. Um, I mean, yeah, or, that, or, and we have or, yeah, 48. Yeah, yeah, looks really, really good. Um, yeah. So if if that pawn pushes all the way down to, to e4, then uh, how is how is black yeah. going to hold on to this pawn? Um, I guess you have to be able to defend it somehow if you're playing that move. Um, yeah. Because if, if the e4 pawn drops, then I feel very optimistic on, on David's behalf. Yeah, yeah. Um, Although I, you know, it's a bit easier to, to get f4 in. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering exactly how white wins the pawn. It's black can attempt to be irritating by attacking the bit. H8 or? Yeah, we can either put it on H8. I was wondering about yeah. just going to, to E5 and back. This seems like a nice, comfortable way of doing it. And, and the pawn is due. Yeah. So, so pushing that pawn forward to E4, it feels like uh, the pawn will drop off. 
So if we can't push the pawn forward there, then what is to stop this plan of uh, king g2 and rounding to e4? And yeah, I mean, I think it's yeah, it's very very difficult times for 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 Niels. Uh, yeah, he, he will definitely be sweating. Uh, definitely be sweating a bit uh, on this end game. Yeah, because yeah, we, we we've come very close to, to yeah. being critical of David for, for some of his yeah. positions. But, but it might just but be genius. It, uh, it, yeah, it's so difficult to tell uh, during a game. Is it you know? Is it a masterpiece? You know? Yeah. Uh, uh, I find in my own games it's a it's a very dangerous thing to to be annotating the game whilst you're playing. Yeah. You know, you know oh, and I play this move exclamation mark and <laughs> oh, my, and here my opponent completely un, failed to understand the ascending and uh, and went passive. You know, uh, it's a it's a super tempting way of playing. And it's a it's a very destructive and usually very unhelpful thing to do in a game. Yeah. And while Nils is uh, thinking, we have, uh, I'm checking uh, the chat, uh, and uh, Boltnik was just saying, uh, thanks for the tip, I will now go out in the world and join a chess club, so good luck, that's great to hear. And then we have a question for you, uh, Tom, uh, let's see. Um, let's see, yeah, from Radders in the Wild, uh, are you hoping to make GM? Uh, soon and do you currently have any norms yes loving the commentary guys okay so so actually i have uh, i have one one grandmaster norm uh, actually from from gibraltar ah, yeah. uh, back in 2007 i think i think it was uh, i had you know, a, a good run of results uh the, the only i've only ever had two opponents uh, refuse to shake my hand after the game and uh, and not and leave without setting up the board and it happened two days in a row. Wow! In, in, in Gibraltar, <laughs> both against uh, against grandmasters, and wow. both of them obviously quite fancied their chances, and, yeah. uh, and uh, things all went wrong. One one of them came came to me the next day, and he said that uh, it was the third or fourth time that he needed to to win a game to cross twenty five hundred and get the GM title. And uh, so, no, actually, yeah, he wasn't a GM at the time, uh, but uh, and and he was. Plus a lot in, in that game, and uh, and actually ended up messing it up completely, and then losing on time, despite the fact. So with, with him, like I said, you know, I completely understand, yeah. you know, but uh, but it was just bizarre that the next day the same thing happened. <laughs> and the the arbiter came up to me and said, "What are what are you doing to me? Yeah, yeah. Like, like, they keep blundering against me." So so I do regard that even though I, I must have played okay to get the. GM norm in that tournament, I, I rode my luck a little bit. Yeah. Uh, as for ambitions for the GM title, my ambition is to play these chess. You know, I've been a full time chess coach for a while, and you know, my, my rating has been below 2400 for, for a number of years. But uh, I, did, I did try and use some of the pandemic time to brush up on one or two areas of my game that I felt were. Were severely lacking, mm -hmm. and at least the I've only played a few games since we've we've come back, but uh, uh, but early results are somewhat promising, and you know I, I've had been able to play some opening theory, which has been nice. So yeah, I would like to play decent chess, and if it, and if in the course of of playing G, decent chess, GM norms were to appear, uh, the other question is is when to actually go and play yeah. you know, big tournaments. Yeah. To find the time, and, yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, maybe maybe some hopes to play a tournament in the summer. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and also I guess that's a good advice um, for beginners or you know your students. Just the goal should be to play good chess and good chess moves. You know, not focus too much about norms or rating, or uh, focus more on the on the process itself. And, uh, not always be result oriented, but uh, yeah. Play good games. And, uh... Yeah, if you're going to play chess for a long time, I think it's really, really important. Best advice I can give is that you have to be able to forgive yourself. Yeah, you know, we we're all going to make mistakes at, at any level, right up to the world championship. And uh, especially for me, you know, I feel like I've done lots of work on my opening, so I sort of said, okay, I'm going to go out, 
and I'm going to enjoy the games. And at least I'm going to feel that uh, that most of the time, I'm going to whether I'm playing with white or black, I'm going to come out with a possession that I can. Uh, but I haven't played a lot of chess over the board for for a couple of years, and if if it turns out that I'm rather rusty in calculation, that kind of thing, well, I've done no work on it. I'm going to, I'll, I'll forgive myself a few mistakes here and there. You know, and, you know, we all have to ride our luck in, yeah. in situations. So, uh, but then again, part of my enthusiasm is I just haven't lost a game yet. No, that's great. It's in October. So, uh, so to it, keep it, this it, it's, it's very easy to keep the levels of enthusiasm you know, <laughs> uh, going under under those, those kind of circumstances. Yeah. But, but yeah, hopeful to play some decent chat. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good advice for everyone following. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this could potentially be a very long game. So uh, join us in the conversation uh, in the chat. So we'll try and answer as best we can. And I also want to remind you, uh, we are doing, uh, we are raising money, uh, a joint effort uh, between the Norwegian Refugee Council and um, Chess24. And uh, we do have uh, a little bit more money. Uh, so we're up to 9,500 now. The goal is still to reach uh, $20,000 uh, throughout this match. So uh, if you have anything to spare uh, and to contribute to this great cause, that would be um, very helpful. And uh, you can see this uh, QR code, which everyone should be familiar with now after the pandemic. Uh, Take your phone, uh, put the camera on, and uh, take it up to the QR code, and uh, the process should be quite uh, straightforward. Absolutely, I think uh, so. Now we're we're on move twenty five. Nils has has been thinking for a while, and uh, uh, he has a, a really important decision to make. Is he going to sit and defend this position, or is he going to twist and? Uh, and you know, try and mix it up with a move like like pawn to e5. It's an incredibly committed decision. I suspect that once we get a move or two, that things will start to happen very very quickly. Yeah, so so maybe if we take a break for, yeah. for a few minutes now and then come back and that see, like, uh, see it past the time control. Sounds like a good plan. So we'll be back shortly um, and uh, follow uh, the action uh, when it resumes. So see you soon. I'm ahead of the game before seen gourmet concept shaped over millions of years featuring 100% natural ingredients and four Michelin starred chefs so put on your best clothes shine your shoes and get ready because you're going to Sweden the biggest gourmet restaurant in the world. That's right, we have turned our whole country into a restaurant. You see, here in Sweden, fine dining is just around the corner, in our nature. And everyone is invited. Together with our star chefs, we have composed a do-it-yourself menu from ingredients that you can forage in our forests, 
fields and lakes. To make it easier for you to experience what our nature has to offer, we have placed tables and cooking kits in a few pretty nice spots around the country. Reserve your seat at visitsweden.com. If it's fully booked, don't worry. There's another 100 million acres of fine do-it-yourself dining available for you. Always close, always open. Simple, healthy and delicious. Welcome to Sweden, the edible country. I don't really know what my expectations were when I grew up. I just wanted to make games. I didn't really consider where that would take me. Today, I am the chief creative officer here at Mojang in Stockholm. We have more than 120 million monthly active users and more than 200 million sold copies of Minecraft. I often get a question on why is Minecraft so successful? I believe it's the way you interact with the world. It's very simple and uh, you have a big impact on just small actions. You quickly realize that you can build anything, so it gives you a very sense of uh, empowerment. <laughs> I came to Mojang because I've always been making games my entire life. Marcus Passion, he created Minecraft and his idea was to create more games with the support of the success of Minecraft. I got asked if I knew someone that could help them develop a new game. I said, well, I volunteer myself. For the first year, it was just me and Marcus working on Minecraft. It was really in the spirit, as we say in the, in the industry, like we were just doing things for fun. Sometimes we could have an idea on, on the Monday that was released on the Friday. So it was very high tempo <laughs> and uh, a lot of fun. When I started, the game had already sold 700,000 copies, uh, which was amazing and more or less unheard of in the, like, in the game scene. We believed that we had peaked but we quickly realized that Minecraft is here to stay. So that meant that I would take over the lead development of the creative vision for Minecraft. I think the most fun part about making games is the early phase where everything is possible. And it's both about creating a world, but also creating the rule sets of this world. When I look around, I always look at things and think about them in terms of game development. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's a, it's a blessing or a curse. For instance, when we were on a holiday in Singapore, and they have these amazing plants that grow on the trees, like flowers. And I was thinking, oh, we could use that. <laughs> like, Sweden might be a good place uh, to be a nerd. <laughs> Well, we have these really long, dark winters, uh, so it's not strange if anyone just stays indoors a whole weekend and working on something on their computers. That's potentially one of the reasons why we have so many good music artists uh, and also game developers, and we're, we have the time to really geek out on specific topics. Så vi har ju precis snapshotat lite olika features till Kivs och Klivs, till exempel koppar. Och vi har fått in lite olika feedback, så jag tänkte kolla lite med dig vad du tänker. Today I'm more guiding and directing ideas. And uh, Agnes Larsson is now leading the design team for Minecraft. We know that kids play a lot of Minecraft. So when we add new features, we try to consider if we can make this feature in a way that teaches them something. One of the reasons why we added bees was to put attention to that bees are very important for pollination but also for the way we produce food. And also Minecraft is a fancy world and not everything works as it does in real life obviously. <laughs> When 
When I play Minecraft with my son, yeah. I build things and my son, he wants to go on an adventure. <laughs> so he just says, come on dad, come on dad, we need to go. And I'll say, okay, I, I'll follow you. When we're out, out exploring, I'm more like, oh, can we go back? Hey, and welcome back. Uh, we're now in the, uh, at the very end of game four in this special challenge match between David Howell and uh, Nils Cornelius being played here in the center of London at the Swedish embassy. And uh, we've reached an interesting position. We'll catch up with the moves uh, shortly. And uh, yeah, Tom, show us what's uh, what's going on. Absolutely. So uh, last we saw it before the break, uh, Nils was thinking for a while in this position here with the five. And we were speculating that either he had to sit passively and wait or maybe he had to uh, start pushing the seed bomb down the board at some point. But Niels has found a, a third way, and uh, and I very much like this decision here. What he's done is he's found the move uh, king to e8, and this threatens to play king to d8, harassing the rook on, on c6. So if, uh, if white was to make a, uh, a passing move, king f1, king d8, rook c6, king d7, and suddenly this rook would be embarrassed on, on c6 would in fact drop the bishop on c5. So that, that would be hugely embarrassing. Uh, and of course, White would like to move the bishop away from, from c5 uh, with, with a move like bishop to d4, but that would drop the pawn on, on h5 here. So what this has done is it's, it's, uh, it's forced David to play the move rook c8 check. And okay, if the king goes back to f7, then David is, is very happy. With the kind of position that we had before. Uh, can again look to bring the king into the game like this and this looked very, very unpleasant for black. But instead of going to f7, the king comes out to h7. And this actually alters the exchange of black's biggest problem piece. Uh, the question you've asked me more than anything else is, what are we going to do about that bishop on, that was on h6 and yeah. is now back on f8? And finally, black has found a way to exchange that bishop off the board. Now, this hasn't solved every single problem. After rook g8, rook takes h5, rook takes g4, it's clear that white still has by far the, the better pawn structure in this, in this ending. But we're down to only rook and three pawns for each side. And the, the most important feature is whether or not we can go about creating a passed pawn. So, uh, double pawns are obviously an issue, and they can be they can be slightly weak. But if White was to uh, is to go about uh, pushing pawns in this position, uh, let's imagine these pawns coming down the board. Uh, eventually, the pawn is going to go to f five, and then it will be exchanged off for one of the uh, for one of the double pawns. So White cannot create a passed pawn just by pushing the position. Um, and I think, I mean, as you mentioned, <laughs> the dark squared bishop for Nils has been uh, a huge problem uh, throughout throughout the game. So that must be a great exchange for him, even though he's probably now in, in a slightly worse rook and uh, pawn ending. I just have a feeling that this should be holdable. Uh, but what's, I'm not an expert in, in rook ending, so, so what's the best strategy for Nils now uh, going forward? Should he, for example, the pawns on e7, e6, should he ever advance them or should he, should he just sit and wait? And where to, what to do with the, with the rook and, and the pawn on h7? A really good question uh, because any kind of pawn move in, at any stage of the game is committed. Mm -hmm. Pawns are, you know, it's the object, pawns are the only pieces that can't go backwards. So, if you put the rook on a bad square, then it's fine. You can move it back to a better square later on. But if you do that with a pawn, then it's it's on a bad square forever. I think my instinct would be to leave the pawns where they are. And if I answer it in a slightly different way, uh, as white, what I would be hoping for, uh, let's put the rook on f5. What I would be hoping for is some position like this, for example. Uh, well, I can bring the king up to f3, I can push the pawn up to, uh, to g5, for example, something like this, and rook h6, where I can uh, 
threatening to play both f5 and keep the rook yep. down to h7. And my starting point as black is I don't want to have this possession. So, uh, so my instinct was to maybe get some possession. Uh, let's just put the rook on, on a square. Like h so that the rook could sit relatively comfortably on the f5 square uh, and maybe make it harder for the white king to enter whilst defending the pawn on, on h5 and, and not being just a, not only defending. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the wor worst case scenario for rook is to be trapped on, on, a, on very few squares. So, you know, imagine the rook boxed in on h4, for example. That would be, that would be a disaster for, for black here. So this feels like a very active way of setting up a fortress. So this position, and then put the king on f7, and say, OK, go, go on then. How are you going to make progress without pawns being exchanged? Because every pawn exchange is going to favor black. If, all, if the pawns come off and white has uh, king rook and only one pawn against the king and the rook, unless something very strange has happened to the place of the black king, then the game will be a draw. So, uh, so should we see what, what Niels is doing at the moment? Uh, he, he's gone for it the other way around, which is that he's deciding he wants to put the king on f7 straight away. And that means that he can't be tied down to defending the, the pawn on h7 after f7, because the rook can simply be booted out of, uh, of its preferred square on g7. So it would have to go back. So uh, it doesn't seem to me that David can stop, excuse me, can stop the king from going to f7. Um, I mean, he can try rook f4, but that doesn't achieve much. Yeah, at some point, the thing, the thing that I hate most about rook and pawn endings, I feel like I understand rooks. The, uh, I can talk about rook, and pawn, uh, rook activity and the perfect square for rook. But the problem with rook and pawn endings is that they can become king and pawn endings. Yeah. And I, can black play them with rook f5 in this possession? Well, rook f5 is either uh, a lovely safe move, which forces the rook on f4 to move away, and we can play the move king f7, or it loses because because uh, white is able to get the king up and. Yeah, and uh, and do some complicated thing. And the the only way that I can uh, work out whether or not this is true is by calculating it. And uh, if I was to attempt to calculate this right now, you would have twenty minutes of me of, uh, of me sitting in silence with my head in my hands. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and but it's a, it's a practical problem for that. And uh, now I fully admit that the transition of going from any kind of ending into a king and pawn ending yeah. is not only is it scary. From a calculation point of view, as a strong player, there's an embarrassment. Right, this position should be a draw, and if and uh, if I was to go from a drawn position and ex and offer the exchange of rooks into a losing king pawn ending, yep. you know, especially with everyone watching on a computer, you know, it could be that rook f five, the computer will either say zero zero zero, it will or it will say plus five, yeah, because the computer can calculate why it's getting a queen, you know, by fours pretty much. And I'm leaning towards it being a draw, but uh, but I have to be incredibly nervous about it. And then I mean, you make a great point, and uh, and the players, if they haven't studied that exact pawn uh, king and pawn ending, uh, they they won't have time uh, either to kind of if they need a few minutes to to calculate because they are uh, still at uh, move thirty one. Uh, but now he's played it. He, he's played it. It he, happened rook f4 and rook f5. Yeah, he, he obviously believes in it because, okay, uh, if we couldn't play rook f5, then we have no easy way of improving our position because, you know, th this is where our king wants to be. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, Niels is obviously an even stronger player. And, you know, he's, he's studied endings far more than I have and, and far fast the calculator but uh i hope for his sake you know even though i'm supporting david uh i can't imagine a more unpleasant way of losing the game than 
for rook to hf5 to be willing to move to this position. So purely on that basis, I'm going to say that that uh, that the king and pawn ending should be a draw. Uh, but if the king and pawn ending is a draw, then I also believe that the rook and pawn ending should also be a draw. White can play the move rook h4 or... Uh, then you get the chance to play h5, right? Yeah, then you get the chance to play a, and a, king a, f7, a, a h5 just... and you play king here. And it, it has to feel that the worst is behind this. Yeah. You know, I, I know Dave and I, uh, actually, I don't know. Yeah, we still we still have to be a bit careful. Yeah. If we didn't have e5, then then e4 was coming in, and uh, and bad things could happen. But but but, but is, is there a good way to 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 exercise uh, like training uh, in different pawning king and pawning things uh, if you want to improve because it is quite complicated. Yeah. I, it, I mean, even at the yeah my level, your level. I mean. You, you so you, same way you would train anything you you have to do it i mean if if you wanted to train it right now and you were watching this game then you could just you would set this position up on a board then have a look at computer evaluation and do your best to calculate what you think will happen after after rook takes it f5 e takes f5 mm. and uh, you would write down all of your notes on that position uh and come to whatever your conclusion is and then you know, then turn on an engine and, and work out what the truth is, and compare your analysis to 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 the truth, yeah. and work out. You know, let's say it turns out that uh, it's winning for white. Uh, work out what it was that you overlooked, and say, okay, I I missed this particular kind of trick. Uh, maybe it's something like a, a king triangulation where we where we lose a move with the king, forcing our opponent to move rather than in our own. Uh, but yeah, we work. But yeah, we train at it. We see if we get it right. If we get it right, then fantastic. We find another position. You know, you can just play through games uh, where strong players have the option to exchange the pieces. So, okay, what happens if we exchange pieces in this position? Yeah. And then, yeah, you learn, you have to learn by doing. And and it, because it's much more easy to to uh, to remember different rook and pawn endings, and then say, okay, I know this is a draw because of this and this. But well, you have all these different types of uh, king and pawn endings, which is completely different from a rook uh, rook ending. Um, so uh, yeah, it's definitely more uh, often more complex um, these different uh, king and pawn endings. Yeah, it's a it's a completely different skill because yeah, we we were talking about you know knowing where pieces should belong, and you know in the uh, actually, when you see top players, especially when they get short of time, I think thinking in particular of the, the tiebreak games between Aronian and Nakamura from the uh, from the um, the Grand Prix yeah. uh, event, uh, where the evaluation kept on varying between you know uh, the rook and pawn ending being drawn and, and winning for, for Nakamura, and, and it's because the players do not instinctively know what the best move is. The only way that you can work out the best move is sometimes by stuff as basic as counting. You know, it's a, it almost feels like you want to get your finger out and start pointing at the board and say, I go here and he goes there. And you know, sometimes you count, you know, it's, okay, it takes seven moves for me to get myself a queen and it takes eight moves for my opponent to get yep. a queen. So, so we get to the position like that. And if you're playing uh, on increment with 30 seconds or a minute to make that decision, you simply don't have time to do the necessary calculation. And it doesn't matter how strong a player you are, you've not seen the end game position before. You can't go, oh, well, all my experience as a player is that, uh, you know, Rook takes five is the best move in this position because it's, it's a binary result. It's either good or it's bad. Uh, there's no, it's not a gray area here. And, you can't, the only way of, uh, of working out for sure is by working out for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you do also see the top players go wrong in rook and uh, pawn endings, but also in king and pawn endings. I remember Firuja losing a drawn king and pawn ending against Magnus in Norway chess two years ago. So it even happens to the best players in the world. Um, and as you said, with low time on the clock, it's, uh, it's always true. To calculate, um, so study your endings. That's uh, 
that's a good advice. Yeah, but okay. I mean, uh, my prediction is that the rook is going back to h4, uh, and this this at least forces the the pawn maybe forward to uh, to h5 because what what I'll I'll say. Uh, based on my experiences, that this is the the kind of nightmare scenario. Yeah. Uh, without without doing the calculation, the rook is now passive on f7 forever. And again, king king here. Now all white need white has two things we can go after. We can go after the h7 pawn. But if we can get the king up to e5, then we win the game. Yeah. And I. It feels to me like white should be able to do this. We can we can play f4 and pawn all the way up to g5 first if we feel that will help us. But I'm fairly certain that okay, it's incredibly incredibly unpleasant for black, not outright losing. Uh, I'm sure that uh, that if we see rook h4, that we will see h5. Okay, yeah. And uh, now that we're in this ending. Some predictions of to come through again. So yeah, uh, a nice quick decision from Nails. He was expecting Rook H4, maybe a slight sigh of relief, as as David also thinks that the the King and Pawn ending is is a draw. Yeah, you know, no nothing nothing has been overlooked here, and we are the closest that I've felt in a very very long time to to Black player in a fortress mm -hmm. and saying, okay, I'm going to put the King. On f7, maybe on f6, and I'll put the rook on whatever square, either on g5 to maybe harass on this direction, or maybe put the rook all the way over on a5 so we have maximum checking distance away from the rook. Uh, yeah, it's also another really useful idea in rook and one endings. If you're going to put the rook, uh, let's just go white and move f3. If you're going to put the rook anywhere over here, then you might as well put it all the way over. Yeah. Uh, and the, the one difference that has is that if you ever end up checking for the king like this, that, uh, that the king doesn't have the option of ever coming to attack the uh, If instead we put the rook on, on a5, for the king to ever approach the rook, it would have to come all the way over to the, to the b file. And as soon as the king gets over to the B file, the rook is suddenly going to swing back over to the other side of the get board. You know what? It's going to take that king that on B2 many, many more moves to rejoin the action yeah. compared to that rook. That's, that's so. very, very instructive. Um, and speaking of endgames, uh, Jay Scott has a question. Um, we're all looking for the most instructive, instructive collections of positions. Do they exist, or should we just go through random games plus our own games? Um, do they exist in books or courses? Um, so he's talking more in general, I guess. Uh, so not necessarily uh, games, but uh, my general feeling is that there's that maybe there is a perfect resource out there, but I I don't think it matters. Uh, I think uh, find find some positions and work on those. And, you know, if you feel like they're not they're not exactly right, then then tweak it. But uh, but uh, I often think that, uh, you know, chess players looking to improve say, well, you know what, I just haven't found the right chess book. If I find the right chess book that tells me what the secret is, then, and, and the right set of positions for me to study, and that will be, uh, that will be what tips it over the edge. That, that will be what leads to the understanding. Just find some positions. You know? It doesn't matter. It can be positions from newspapers, for, from the games that you're you're watching online, the, there's a whole set of games from the Bundesliga. Today. I don't know how many games were broadcast on Just Twenty Four in the Bundesliga, but may, maybe fifty games, yeah. something like that. There will be ten interesting end game positions. Yeah. Go as soon as this game finishes. Go find those games and find ten interesting positions. Note them down. Those are your ten positions to have a look at next. Are they the perfect positions? Probably not, but. They are the, they're the next set of positions for you to look at. Yeah, absolutely. And and um, go check out Chessable. They have different uh, courses on everything, basically. So everything from concrete uh, different openings to, to end games to tactics. Uh, and also, um, one of my favorite chess books is actually by the great uh, uh, 
annan. Mm-hmm. Uh, the man Magnus Carlsen uh, said uh, was too intelligent. They were become a uh, world champion. In yeah. chess. But he has a great book, um, Learning Chess Move by Move. Uh, so that's a collection of uh, games played by some of the best chess players in history. And, uh, you know, different topics uh, for each game. We have like the opening, middle game, end game uh, with some very instructive uh, commentary and, uh, yeah, games. So, so check that one on, out. And also, yeah, as I said, chessable. That's everything you need to uh, to improve as a chess player. Okay, so let, let's have a look at what's what's happened in the game. So, had a few more moves. Uh, H5 was indeed played. As we as we say, you know, uh, White this time puts the rook on it as, as far away as possible in case that we're, we're get, not only does that give us any checking options, but it obviously prevents Black from putting the rook on its maximum uh, situation. So the rook can only go to B5. But, okay, so King F7. Rook a2, and this this may feel like it's going backwards, but uh, okay, what he's trying to do is uh, to bring his king in without committing to, to paying any board moves. For example, if we were to play the move f4 at any stage, then e5 is probably going to solve all of our problems as black. Well. Yeah. And we have to do a quick check that, that all of the endings are, are going to be okay for us, but this time around, uh, I, I don't think black is risking anything whatsoever going into the king ending. So, uh, so f4 would be a horrendous blunder. In term, it may not change the objective evaluation of position, assuming the position is a draw, but uh, but any practical winning chance will evaporate if he plays f4 too quickly. So he's played the rook back to a2 in order to free up the king to go for a wander uh, either over to g3. Well, we have our old favourite of, uh, of can the king wander up to, yeah. to e4 uh, and then play the move back. Mm-hmm. Um, but so do, do you think still there are some chances for David or is this uh, just a draw with a good defensive play? I, I mean, I think both. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, there's no reason to uh, to offer a draw in this position, we it would take something truly spectacular for for White to lose this game. And uh, often I find that White players, uh, if another way of improving in, in endings is to actually play them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the most common excuse I would have from a student for. Uh, for offering a draw here as white is that uh, they didn't know how they were going to win the game. And the answer is that almost no one knows how they're going to win the game. I bet Magnus doesn't know a lot of the time how he's going to win the game. But the first thing that you have to do to win the game is to keep it going. Uh, while the game is still going, uh, Black has to play moves at any any time he can make an inaccurate move. Most of the time you won't be playing a 2600 bar. And, uh, you know, many hours into the game, people start to do silly things that they wouldn't ordinarily do, you know, uh, seek a really uh, forcing way to, to force the ball rather than sitting and defending for, for another hour. So you can use the fact that Black is still having a miserable time in this possession, your advantage, you know, create some practical chances. Uh, if we want to, we can walk the king to e4 decide that that doesn't work yeah. and then we can walk the king slowly back over to the h4 point go you know what i'm going to try with the king on h4 a little bit and we're risking very little in, yeah. doing, in doing so and and i mean players like you know magnus carlson it would be interesting to see how many of his games are won in the fourth or fifth hour you know from maybe a fairly equal position and then slowly slowly He's moving, he's trying, um, he's trying everything uh, in his power to try and, and win the game. Um, so if it's not like a dead draw position or a repetition, most of the time he will just fight towards the, the very end. And often he manages to win some of those games um, that looks completely drawn and, and equal. Yeah. 
Mm. And, uh, and it, it comes with psychological benefits as well, because, you know, I mean, obviously Magnus is the obvious example, you know, if, if we were looking at this game and it was between Magnus and some 2750 Grandmaster, our assessment of the position would be it's probably a draw, but Magnus. Yeah. And, uh, and that's a scary thing. You know, it can, it might be the difference when you're playing your opponent that uh, they may choose not to go into this kind of ending. Because they're like, well, against anybody in the world, I'd be confident of drawing this position. But if I'm playing Magnus, he'll weave his magic. Mm. And after eight hours, I'll be sitting there with zero points. Yeah. So I can't carry on playing this perfect defensive game. I have to go for the counterplay. And then uh, yeah. then you win a, a nice game in three and a half hours because your opponent was afraid to play this ending against you. And I know, know of several players, especially when you play at a faster time with it. And... Uh, the any ending feels like it should be an easy one to hold until you have 30 seconds to make a move every single minute, and then you can mess up the simplest of endings, you know. Yeah, that's that's so true. Um, and um, yeah, I think several chess players are struggling, I mean, they get tired. Um, so when you're you know playing for five hours, uh, the chance of making mistakes are higher. But now it looks like has David achieved something here, or well, David has achieved a threat. We're threatening. Uh, he was threatening the move G three, mm -hmm. and if Rook H three would be trapping our own work after it. So, uh, so he has to play the move King G six, and now the question is: Is there any way of taking advantage of it? So we'd like to go Rook E five, but. But after King F6, we would simply have to move back again. Then we can play F4. And I mean, the black rook is a bit. Uh... Oh, yeah, the black rook is very, very stuck. Um, uh, but if you go back one, one move with the rook on uh, A5. What if you play uh, g3 in this position? Do you have to go rook? rook e4? Uh, but why, why would I give the rook on h4 an opportunity to join the game again? I don't know. Um, we don't. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think the rook would be able to activate on this square, and this feels. And then the problem might be that black can play. My, my dream was just to, to, to get to at some point. You have to play king f1, king e2. Yeah. It takes too much time. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it feels like I'm missing something concrete here. So rookie five, may, maybe David feels that there's another way of doing it. Uh, okay, let's see. Um, but but, but we, we're going to have to go back in a minute. It, it feels yeah. to me like Nils has made some kind of inaccuracy, in, inaccuracy, or uh, unless we've misunderstood this ending. But, but even this kind of position, so rook e5 does force king f6, king f7, and then f4, and it feels like we're, maybe there's no way to actually win the pawn here. Uh, I don't know, it, it looks to me like we can play king f2. Um, this here, for example, and our, our plan is to go king g3 or king h3. And then, look, and then look takes pawn on h5. But so this just looks like a, a simple way of winning a pawn to me, yep. unless I've, I've overlooked something. But maybe, maybe David says that we can do the same thing with this, and that the threat of going e4. So yeah, we're threatening to go e4, and then. Uh, actually trap the rook. Wow. This is amazing. This is this is the point. That's that's one way to win a rook and pawn ending. <laughs> so uh, so F3, uh, we're saying okay, you have to get out of there with your rook. 
but now now we can either play the move rook e5 or we can play the move f4. But this is this is very very bad. For, uh, if you, if you have to black. play, yeah, yeah. You, so we can't go king f6 without dropping this pawn. I think black is basically losing the pawn h5. Uh, is my understanding. And if you have to play rook b6. If you have to play rook b6, maybe we play f4, but just simply slowly simply move our king up to h4, and black has absolutely no moves at all. The rook is tied down to e6. Yeah, and whenever you try rook b1, you just capture on e6, right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so all, all black can do at some point is to play the move king f6, wow. and then we have rook to h5. And okay, we have a three versus two, but with the two double pawns, yeah, uh, this, should I, be... I, this, this should be this should be winning for yeah. us. Wow! But uh, but I'd like to go back because I feel like we missed something. We saw this rook a two idea, mm -hmm. and we talked about the king moving forward. But so I guess the question is, I, if, if black had done nothing, yeah, uh, how does white break the fortress? But could rook b4 be a um, be a mistake or a, an, an inaccuracy? Because I guess what he was concerned about was the king getting to g3 and mm -hmm. then him setting up something very similar to what we saw in the yeah, game yeah. with rook a4 to to here and then king h4. But 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 I I think it is a mistake because it. Uh, there should be some way. It, it feels like you've got some practical de uh, defending chances. I mean, let's put our pieces on squares like this. Uh, B5. It doesn't seem obvious to me how white breaks through. It's obviously incredibly fast. You know, we can go for B5 or do any number of things. Maybe the, the most scary prospect is the is the rook swinging behind this way. Yeah, that's with, also with, with, with the king h4 idea. Very good idea. We can also tie black down to these pawns. Yeah. Oh, but uh, but the, this feels like borderline. Uh, yeah. We're losing a pawn. We're not losing a pawn. Uh, the position that we have right now. Uh, well, actually, the position we have right now, what we're concerned about is losing the rook on h4. Yeah. So there is a there is a simple threat. White is is threatening to end the game with g3, rook h3, king g2, and the rook has to go to f4 immediately, wow. or that it that is it. And David says, "Thank you very much. I will I will take that pawn on on h5." Um. And okay. yeah, for now we see David um, got 30 more minutes, so that was his for this for the move. And uh, same with Nils. Yeah, same same with Nils. So they have made the time control. It will not be a it will not be a happy no. uh, situation for for Nils here. No, that's for sure. But, oh. but okay, and we'll see. I'm sure David may make one more one more quick move. Um, you know, it's it's very well known that uh, that move forty one is uh, is a famous move for making a big blunder. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, the, uh, the last Thorn CL event that I played in the British League, uh, I was in huge amounts of trouble. Uh, we had this big time scramble, and you know, some some very very scary moments, and uh, I had no idea what was happening, and my opponent made quite a quick move forty one, and at the time I thought he made a very good move, but after the game, uh, I discovered that probably was his best chance to win the game was was with a better move. On the side. It can be very hard to uh, to get out from moving, you know, relatively quickly to adjust it and having this extra time. Yes, yeah. but absolutely. And I think uh, all chess players who played quite a bit have <laughs> have made a bad move on, on move forty one. Unfortunately, yeah. yeah. It's uh, it's not always easy. Yeah. Uh, let's uh, check in with uh, with the chat now that we've reached uh, the time control. Um, so a question for you, Tom, from Burtnik. What are your opinion on chess player? Do you see them as athletes or artists, or 
for something else. Uh, it's kind of the classic, classic question. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I, I certainly feel like an athlete today. You know, it's yeah. you know, we're we're into our well, we're sweating. We're, we're well into our fifth hour of the of the of the commentary. Yeah. But um, I don't know. I think it's you know it it's a cop out answer, but it's it's all of those things. Uh, certainly, if you want to be an elite chess player. You'll, you'll find very few of them that don't take the um, the physical side of the game incredibly, incredibly seriously. Uh, if you're going to be playing five, six hours of chess, you have to still be, you know, awake and thinking almost as clearly as you were one hour into the game. Yeah. You know, personally, you know, like very, very many players, I, it's an area I feel I could I could deal with improving. I I, I consider myself to be a decent end game player. Unless the ending comes six hours into the game, then yeah. it's you know, and it, it's amazing what can what can happen. But um, uh, what are the options? Athlete, artist, um, mathematicians. Yeah, uh, I, th I think I uh, think every chess player aspires to think of himself as an artist. Yeah, you know, I play, I, I play a nice game, and you know, I want to share it with with my friends, or you know, you know. Uh, Get on Twitter and go. Oh, look! Look what a, what, a, what an interesting thing is. And I think uh, it's hard to play chess for a number of years without having uh, a feel for the beauty of the game. And you know, you have. Uh, and it's only something that chess players can can talk about uh, and understand with other chess players. You you always have something in common with with another chess player. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, on on our good days, we would think ourselves of, as a, as an artist. But uh, no, I I would go more to to sports person or athlete, because uh, you know certainly for for a professional player, uh, just like in sports, you you have many many more hours of of doing the hard work before the games and you know yeah. studying the endings, studying the openings, everything else, and what you see over the board is a is a small proportion work that a chess player does yeah absolutely um let's see and uh yeah uh john because us we do have uh we have reached the time control and they have 30 minutes now and also 30 seconds extra for um uh, per move and uh nils's rook was almost trapped as jay scott uh mentions but he, he managed to get it out by moving it to, to F4. Um, let's see. Jay Scott says chess players might be more like jazz musicians running a marathon. <laughs> that's a good, uh, yeah, that's a good mix. They do say that, I mean, many chess players have a, have a musical ear or an ear for language or, you know, uh, there, there are some, uh, yeah, some connections there. Uh, yeah, so th it's all of the areas where where you would expect there to be child prodigies. So, uh, so chess, mathematics, and music yeah. are where you have the you know the the stories of the you know the eleven year old wonder kids. Yeah, uh, and the so, most Mozart's and the Beethoven. Yeah, and, and, yeah. yeah the Mozart's and the Magnus Carlsen's yeah. and the whatever it is for mathematics. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure you know one or two names. I, What's the this movie A Beautiful Mind? Yeah, that was based on uh, John. No, what was his name? Uh, yeah, yeah, very famous. Uh, he died a few years ago in a, a car accident, I believe. Yeah, um, he actually came to Norway many years ago and met with Magnus Carlsen because uh -huh. he won the, I think he won the Nobel uh, Mathematician Prize or yeah. for physics or yeah. Yeah, uh, I can't remember the name. Yeah, John so, Nash. John Nash. Yeah. yeah. So for, ma for mathematics, it, it's the Fields Prize, I think. I'm not the. Uh, yeah, I, I think. Not, yeah, it's the. Yeah, that's correct. So, yeah. but I think the physics, physics has. Uh, yeah, physics has a Nobel Prize, yeah, and, yeah. and maths has the Fields. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks, uh, Scott. I was struggling there. Been a long day. Yeah, Nash, econ economist for game theory. Yeah, so he was obviously a, a genius in, in many ways. And Riders in the Wild, what's your aspirations as field playing or doing commentary? Loving Meltwater. So that's referring to that Meltwater Champions Jester. 
Um, yeah, to be honest, I just love working uh, with chess um, on the, the Champions Chess Tour, doing a lot of different uh, interesting uh, things. And uh, I do like to play a lot of chess, but uh, yeah, I, I can't say I have big aspirations of reaching a certain rating goal or yeah. I'm, I'm mostly playing for fun, and but it's uh, still nice to be a part of the community and I have a lot of good friends, both in Norway and uh, internationally, uh, that I'll, are also a part of the community. So, um, yeah, I'm really happy with with, uh, with that for now. Um, let's see. All right. Yeah, so I guess we have to to ask ourselves the question, you know, just how bad is it for black? Yeah. Uh, so, so without answering it properly for the for the time being, uh, to to give you some perspective, if the if the pawn on e six was um, if the pawn on e six across to f six, then we would still, of course, be a pawn down. But uh, but every time white uh, attempts to create a pass pawn. Let's just go back. Every time white attempts to create a pass pawn, the point would be that more pawns would get exchanged off. And the, the end game goal for black is always to reach a position with king and white against king, rook, and pawn, where so long as we can keep the king in front of the pawn uh, and the rook on a reasonably active square, the will be able to reach a well-known theoretically drawn end. So, so black wants to exchange off pawns and white wants to keep pawns on yep. the board. Now, because these pawns are doubled on e6, that obviously presents a, a problem for, for black. For example, if the, uh, if the king was to come up to e3, we could start pushing this pawn down the board. Uh, I'm not sure for the moment that this is necessarily the best plan, but we could push the ball back down to g5 and, and even further without the risk of swapping off pawns. And so that's uh, that's the biggest concern that Black has, or the biggest problem with the double pawns. It's not that they're weak, although that, that can be a, an issue itself, but, uh, but already without having done anything whatsoever, uh, White has themselves a past pawn and start asking themselves the question, how can I uh, get the pawn all the way down the board? Absolutely. And yeah, I think I think that's a that's a good good idea. Just slowly bring the king in, uh, start moving the, the pawn. And um, I just I, I like to have the, the white rook on, on the queen side uh, for some reason because then you can um, then you can both uh threaten things more easily because you have uh more squares and then uh and then you bring the pawn and the king uh, king to e3 and g4 and you also control the the e5 square still um, yeah for the time being um, so maybe even start with king f2 g3 yeah and then f4 maybe yeah or, although you, again uh, we only want to touch the pawns when we know that it's yep. it's a hundred percent a good thing. So uh, I'm not sure about the benefit of having a rook on a5 in terms of uh, in terms of attacking on on a7 for the moment because I think it's very 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 hard for us to to ever win the pawns like that. What I think is maybe more realistic in some positions. Uh, it's interesting that we see the move king to g6 because if if given enough time. What I would, uh, any time I've got this winning position, I want to get my king to its green position first, and then we'll worry about the committal pawn. Mm -hmm. Before we wanted to go to, to the e4 square, here, actually, uh, in front of double pawns, you know, we have the square on e5 is actually an outpost. If we can get our king to that square, it cannot be shipped from, uh, from e and so one benefit of having the rook on h5, that if black attempted to uh, have the king on f6 in some scenarios, we can check it from this side, mm -hmm. and the rook will never be able to approach the rook without losing one of the pawns. So, so in playing the move rook h5, I think he's setting his stall out and saying that, okay, 
again, if you do nothing, my plan is probably to try and get my king to eat. And what we see from Nils is, again, I don't want to give you the time for this. I'm going to attack this rook. Worst case scenario, we can always check this rook over onto this score. Okay, with h8, king g7. And yeah, David is saying, sorry, Nils is saying he doesn't want David's rook to be able to remain on this, on this h line. So it wouldn't massively surprise me to see uh, David repeat once, put the rook back on h5 and say, okay, you have forced me to play the rook over to a5. It wasn't it wasn't the move that I, I wanted to play, but that is a that's a little victory for uh, for Nils. I I don't know if it's uh, if it's enough in in the long run, but uh, but but again, if you if you have to play this position and it's not a bad enough position to resign, then uh, you have to find some kind of move to be optimistic. Absolutely. Uh, the, Gone are the hopes of, of winning this game. Uh, yeah, that's it's, for sure. Uh, I remember in, uh, I think it's one of Jonathan Rousen's books, I think uh, Seven Deadly Chessons, he talks about goalkeeper's glory, about, uh, you know, the uh, if you save a penalty, if you save a shot, you know, the, the score doesn't change. You know, your your job is to maintain the status quo. Uh, when, when playing moves like King G7 to H8, actually the way I feel about it is that I want to be as irritating as I possibly can. At the moment, I'm sitting here depressed with my position, and my opponent thinks he's going to win. If in an hour's time my opponent has made no progress, and they're really irritated that you know the game hasn't gone the way they can, that you know that's when you start to feel the you, you get motivated from that. You can see your opponent who was looking super confident ten moves ago suddenly starting to get frustrated. And so you have to take some, find some way of taking pleasure in the game because uh, this, is, this is not the, the position that Nils woke up this morning uh, dreaming of playing. Uh, but he has to find the... After the, five hours. After five <laughs> hours against, uh, against an incredibly motivated David. Uh, but it's the position that he's got in front of him. So, yeah, being able to go, OK, you know what? I'm not going to let you do exactly what you want to do. Um, if you're going to win this game, you are going to have to fight every single yep. step of the way. Uh, and prove to me that you that you can find them. Yeah, and if you can if you can uh, eat up some of David's time, uh, obviously the players are getting an extra thirty seconds for every move they make. But that that was the last time control. There's no added time at move uh, at move sixty as far as I'm aware. So. Uh, not that the players are, are desperately short on the on the clock for the time being, but, um, but yeah, it's amazing uh, how quickly the half an hour. It, it feels like it feels like an enormous amount of time to play the game when you reach move forty, especially when you've been short on time. Oh, I can relax. Yeah, I have thirty seconds to move, and I have. 30, 30 minutes. Have a snack, fine. walk around a little yeah. bit. And then, and then David, David has two or three things and he's back under the five minutes. Yeah. And, uh, and I, think, I think it's really interesting what you said, you know, to, to find uh, or to get to get these small victories for Nils in this case. Like, yeah, harassing the rook, uh, proving to David, okay, you cannot stay on your preferred square. And, and and as you said, just to to make him spend some time on the clock, um, because I, I think you made a really interesting point there. That in order to save uh, bad positions, you need to to convince yourself that it's, um, it's doable, and uh, it definitely helps. Um, yeah, with those, it... with those small victories, you know, uh, along the road. Yeah. Uh... Often you get a feel for how your opponent is playing, and you know uh, players feed off each other's energy. Sometimes, uh, if I'm playing an ending like this, uh, sometimes if I'm playing a lower rated player, I get the feeling that uh, you know they they play moves, but there's no feeling behind it. And you know, I'll talk to them after the game, and, and they'll say, "Well, you know, I knew I was going to lose eventually." And that that's what you want when you're when you're yeah. playing someone. You want them to think, "Well, you know." Uh, I suppose I can't resign here, but you know, 
let me play some names, but you know, David's a really good player and with the with the way the pawn structure is, you know, he'll win this game eventually. And then, you know, yeah. and then and you make a bad move and you go, oh, you know, I knew I was going to lose this anyway. Uh, whatever. Uh, but your opponent will pick up on that. You can tell that you can tell the difference between someone who's, you know, uh, sitting there going, okay, I might have a lost position, but if you're going to beat me, you're going to have to play perfectly from now till the end of the game. There is no... There's no way I'm giving this to you easy. Yeah. And yeah, and it's it's a scary prospect. And it's also interesting because the chess is about converting uh, advantageous positions to a win, but also sometimes to save, you know, uh, a difficult or even lost position and, and save a draw and uh, to get get the max out of, of each game, uh, no matter how, how it looks. Um but I think we're approaching uh, seven o'clock here, London time. I think this will be a long game. Uh, we've been going on for five hours. So let's take a, a short break and then we'll be back and uh, we'll, we'll see this uh, game through, uh, hopefully with uh, some interesting developments. So we'll be back in a couple of minutes. Uh, stay tuned. It's time to take control of your journey towards chess mastery. Magnus Carlsen introduces Chessable, the definitive solution for studying chess. Move Trainer uses the science of spaced repetition to identify your strengths and eliminate your weaknesses. There's no need to set up a board, remember which page you're on, or keep track of all the moves you miss. Get started now and join our growing community of over 100,000 chess enthusiasts. Chessable, take control of your journey towards chess mastery. I kept Chessable a secret for three years at least, uh, and I was using it for myself. And I, you know, maybe never expected how, how big it would become. I have always been into games, and uh, I think games are fun ways to, to pass your time. Um, sometimes they can be educational as well, but I think chess is the perfect game that, that has it all. It's a game that not only entertains you, but also teaches you about life skills, from things like time management to the consequences of your moves or your actions. You know, once you make a move, you cannot take it back. I really fell in love with the game. And of course, given my competitive nature, I wanted to get better at it. And I found it extremely difficult after watching countless videos and reading some books. You would um, put, in, put in all that effort, and then when you get to the board, it's like it all disappeared, it all vanished, and you performed at the exact same level you were before that. And uh, I looked around for a solution that could perhaps use the latest technology, the la latest learning science um, out there. Uh, to help you learn chess and there was there was nothing so that's how the, the idea was born i've been building things since i was 14 and i always enjoy bringing a community together around a product and yeah, i mean we got a lot of energy from the chess community as well uh really from from day one when we announced chessable there was thousands of people who who thought this was a good idea that had to be realized and They've been fantastic with words of encouragement, supports, advice, ideas on how to improve the product. And I believe they've been listened to over these years and Chessable is exactly what that initial community wanted. And it's part of our product process to actually keep listening to them going forward into the next years. Chessable is definitely a product that was built by players, for players, 
but I think we have stuck to that vision and it continues to be exactly the same. What has changed is we now have a lot more great people in chess helping us realize this. You know, when I started, it was John and I, there was two of us, and then at some point we had three or four people. We had a small community around it. But now there is really an incredible amount of people that I never imagined all pulling in the same direction. So the, the future is bright. It really excites me what we can achieve together. And uh, I just look forward to it. It's been absolutely incredible to see the reception by some of the top grandmasters in the world, um, like Grandmaster Anish Giri and Erwin Olami. And this sort of validation across the spectrum of players is fantastic and it's really what keeps the entire team going. So, fabulous. Hi, my name is David Sinemaza Kramali. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Chessable and the Chief Operating Officer of the Play Magnus Group. Everyone is welcome to enjoy the Swedish nature. I moved away from the city 13 years ago. I worked as a journalist, I studied in university, but there was a sense of longing towards something a bit more real where I could actually create things and, and uh, be much closer to nature. I'm a vegan farmer. That's a bit unusual, but uh, that's what I am. It's a long story. I used to be one of those people that thought that veganism is impossible, very deeply entrenched in, in like the small scale uh, animal farming uh, community. You know, I was a leading proponent for keeping pigs and, and uh, doing animal husbandry, but with a human uh, touch. Well, as our business grew, our farm expanded and our shop started selling more and more meat and eggs and milk. It felt less as I was doing something good for the animals and more and more as I was just showing a happy face for uh, any kind of animal product consumption. It felt like I was a poster boy for, for the animal industry in itself. So I, I, uh, that didn't feel so good, to be honest. So we're picking for the bags, and it's 15 bags. It makes uh, about three kilos, just a little bit extra to be sure. I came across veganism on YouTube, actually, and um, a lot of the things they were saying started to make a lot of sense. The first year or so was really difficult. I made a lot of enemies, unfortunately, because most of my friends were also farmers with animals on their farm. And when I started posting on Facebook that I was a vegan and I was against killing animals and all that stuff, and that wasn't too popular with my farmer friends. <laughs> there were just so many questions also that we had to answer. What are you going to eat instead? It's not easy to make a dietary change, but it's even more difficult to make a change in a farm. Our whole infrastructure, everything we had on the farm, was based around animals. We sold the animals, uh, took down all the fencing, we tore down the animal houses. Uh, and uh, if you don't have animals, you still have to uh, produce something on your farm, obviously. And we put a lot of effort into growing different beans and legumes. It 
there's enormous potential in switching from animal uh, agriculture into vegan agriculture purely from an efficiency uh, viewpoint. You know, if you grow one hectare of beans and uh, compare that to one hectare of uh, grass for sheep, you will find that the beans produce, I think it's up to 10 times as many calories on the same amount of land. Animals aren't a very efficient way often to produce food, you know. You, your food kind of takes a, an extra way through the animal, you know. You grow grains, you give them to the animal, and then you eat the animal, you lose a lot on the way. Instead, if you grow grains and make that into a product that's eaten directly by humans, you know, you're just taking a shortcut and, and being more efficient also. We're approaching nine billion people here on the planet. We need to be more efficient with the land we already have. And I think going into vegan farming, that will be one of the most important steps we can take. I still have. Hey, and welcome back to game four uh, in this special uh, challenge match between David Howell and uh, Nils Grandelius. Today I'm joined by uh, international master Tom Randall, and uh, we're now in the in this ending, which we believe David has a chance of winning. Um, and uh, what's going on now in the position? Yeah, so I'm not, I mean. David has, you know, more than a chance of winning. It, it has to be either winning for white or incredibly, incredibly difficult for black to defend. Uh, to the extent that if if I was playing this position as white against pretty much anybody in the world, uh, I would expect to be able to, you know, to win it most of the time. <laughs> but uh, okay, so let's start talking about some plans in this position. White's just made the move pawn to g4, and the rook on uh, h4 is again very, very short on squares. Uh, White would also like to be able to activate this king. So, uh, probably the dream square, as we've been discussing in a number of scenarios, is to get this king to e5. So, let's, let's, let's attempt passive defense for black, see what that would look like. So, we're going to. Uh, actually, not go, not go this way, go this way, and okay, black should try something like rook f6. I think it's the flash on f3, force white to play rook a3. Okay, let's say we just passively accept all of this happening. White is going to get to some situation like this, where black cannot move the king at all without dropping the pawn on e6. The rook is now forced to shuffle between squares. And if rook f6, for example, we can play f4, rook g6, g5, and black has run out of, uh, of moves to play. And the pawn on e6. Yeah, we have a Zugs run. Yeah, we have a Zugs run situation. And if uh, black could try and avoid it by playing rook h6, and okay, maybe we could win the pawn by playing f5 here, but we don't need to. We can just play g5. Rook g6 and then rook to b6. Any kind of move, yep. passing the move along to black. And black has none of those luxuries. Being forced to move the king or rook away, the compulsion to move, and that pawn on e6 falls. So again, this is our, our dream scenario. If you like. We get to the, the king to e5, we attack with our rook along this sixth rank, uh, and we, we try and achieve this pawn. So, uh, so again, we know both what it is that uh, that white is attempting to achieve, and what black has to prevent white from doing. So, uh, without committing to a to a definite prediction for the result, uh, I will say that the the battleground for the next few moves is likely to be over uh, either whether or not the king can go to this crucial e5 square, maybe. White is going to just try and push more pawns, but uh, we have to be a bit careful. Let me let me make some some uh, some pawn moves. Uh, if we were to just carelessly start pushing the pawns, uh, 
instead of getting the king to the dream situation first, this would be putting the horses before the cart. And suddenly uh, we don't have control over this crucial e5 square and black at some point has a nice well-timed move like e5. And uh, okay, we don't lose a pawn in this position, but we've allowed black to exchange off the, uh, uh, the double pawns. And this feels like a much more promising ending for, for black to yeah. potentially defend. Absolutely. Again, not, not maybe entirely out the woods, but uh, it, it seems careless to allow black this kind of opportunity. So the players will obviously calculate this position uh, slightly more carefully. But uh, but yeah, my my first instinct as white is to wander the king up to this e5 square, and uh, as black we have to to try and prevent that from happening. Absolutely, and um, yeah, Jay Scott says um, good commentary for practical chess here. Nils is making David burn clock time, which David <laughs> loves to do. That's correct. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, does it does look yeah, difficult for for Nils? Uh, I think David has uh, spotted this um, this idea, which might uh, win him the game. And Bert Nick saying both players and commentators showing incredible stamina. Yeah, thanks for that. We're we're hanging in there, and uh, I'm I'm sure the players are getting a bit tired. But we also had a question: Do they do they snack uh, during the games? And I believe so. I think they're taking uh, taking well care of at the, the Swedish embassy. They have uh, fruits and yeah, different snack bars and chocolate and uh, yeah. Yeah, I I doubt that they that they've broken for 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 dinner break with yeah. you know, with, uh, with burgers and stuff. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, bananas or, or chocolate bars or, or or energy drinks. I, yeah. I don't know if the players would be drinking coffee at this time. But, uh, probably not. But probably uh, not. yeah, I mean, for a long game like this, uh, it's it's definitely important to keep your energy levels uh, up and uh, yeah snack up a bit um. yeah so it feels like we have this this constant question of uh of should black attempt to do in this, do something in this position or or sit and wait a little bit longer i think we have a couple of options uh option number one uh or objective number one get the rook to a, to a more active player it doesn't feel like a h4 is clearly not its dream situation but you know as i say that it's it's pretty limited in in its num its roots to you know get over to the queen side for example we can't go go via h2 via h5 or h8 white is covering every single one of those avenues to the rest of the board so uh so that's an immediate problem for black uh yeah, I was about to say, uh, to segue into that, uh, does black want to play the move pawn to e5? Again, if you make a pawn move, it's committal. You can't, you can't move that pawn backwards again. Uh, one idea of playing, uh, one idea of playing pawn to e5 is that now the rook has an option to swing across over here. And also we're saying, well, if our pawn is on e5, we've already achieved one of our things. Which is that uh, that's that means that the king can't simply walk to that square, but uh, but every pawn move has to come with some kind of drawback. And for me, uh, David still has plenty of time on the clock. But the move I would be looking to play here is rook to a six, oh, preventing rook h six. And again, this comes with a direct threat in the game with rook e six. Uh, one pawn up in a rook and pawn ending. Could go either way. If we get the second pawn, yeah. uh, it, it's game over. You know, at least in this scenario where White has connected pawns, no problems whatsoever. So if we see rook a6, uh, king f7 will be completely and utterly forced. In this position. And the question is now: uh, Is there a way for White to make progress? Uh, and because the most direct way of doing this would be to play g5. Again, these are these are not my pieces. I'm I'm, I'm going to push them liberally. Yep. And uh, and if it turns out to be a mistake, come back. 
So if we go g5, then we, we threaten to play g6 check. Uh, so if black, if black was the boss and we went g6 check, again, this feels like uh, it should be a winning ending. We can simply uh, march our king up to g4. And OK, black can win the g6 pawn, but both e7 and e5 will fall in, in return, and white will be left winning ending. So get this position, black would have to do something else. And I had a move that I thought black would play after g5, but I've forgotten what it was. But, uh, but certainly white would be threatening g2. But would you ever put a e6 to try and get the Unf yeah, unfortunately, yeah, we can't. Doesn't work. We, we can't, and that's taken away the e6 yeah. um, and uh, and again, white picks up second. Yeah. So g5 is the move that we want to play at some point, but maybe there's just no reason to do it yet. Uh, David has just played the move king to g2, and. I don't know. My instinct is that this this should be white, but uh, uh, the only active move I can see is to go look h6 here, and then let's say we simply just play play king g3, and again this time instead of uh, aiming for the e5 square, we want to go g5 and get the king in this way. Yeah. And again, if the king can reach f5 without anything terrible happening to us. Then we will pick up the pawn on e5 relatively easily and, and go on to win the game. So uh, every time black shuts down one avenue for the king to come in, a new a new window opens up and yep. it's okay, I cannot get my king to e5. How about f5? Okay, you can you can stop me from playing king f5 with e6, but then you will drop the pawn on e5 because your king doesn't yep. have enough square to defend. And uh, and instead of going back to h6, Neil has treated his rook for this delicious h7 square. Wow. Mm. Uh, I guess it means that at least the rook cannot be attacked with tempo on uh, with g5. But... But okay, if we play King G three here, what move is Black going to to actually rook, play? Rook H one. There's Rook H one. And okay, so if I go G five here, then maybe maybe the idea is that we can now go King G six. And okay, we can always check from behind, and then the King comes back and attacks the Rook. Rook has to, has to move away again, and comes back to g6. And uh, okay, if king g4, then rook g1 check in h4. And rook takes g5 would be a, a horrendous blunder here because of rook g8, picking up the rook on g5. But, uh, but black does not have to, to play rook takes g5 here and can, in fact, just check the king until it goes back here. And then even in this position, black has two different ways of taking the ball on g5. I'm not sure either of them is correct. King takes again would lead to immediate disaster. But certainly this is not how black is, uh, sorry, how white is supposed to make progress. So, uh, so I think this is his defensive idea. Just to simply wait for the king to go forward to g3 and then play uh, rook to h1, but maybe now is the moment to play rook a6. Mm. Um, but again, David is, is burning time. Uh, I'm sure he'll be feeling confident at this at this moment. But, uh, but it's easy to be confident with six and a half minutes on your clock, and then once your, your time ticks below a minute, yeah. then uh, it's a constant thing in the back of your mind, you know. 
Uh, I know some players, I mean, David is hugely experienced playing short on the clock, but, you know, uh, part of the problem is that 30 seconds is enough time to play the move uh, and to think about your move. But every time you spend half of that uh, looking at your clock and going, OK, I have 34 yeah. seconds. Uh, should I play King G3 here? I've got 25 seconds. Uh, and you suddenly have 10 seconds left and you haven't actually calculated a single move. And the problem is that if you end up in, a, in like a constant time trouble, um, you never really gain enough time perhaps on the clock to, to have a deeper think about the position. And uh, that could be uh, Nils's hope. Uh, and, and as you showed, he does have a couple of ways to defend if, if David is to too eager to, to push the G-palm or, um, yeah, so it, it, it looks it looks strange putting the rook on H7, but um, so maybe it's a good good try by Nils. Yeah, I mean, the, the rook only had two squares to go yeah. to. H8 is a losing king and point ending, and H6 always would allow G5 to come with tempo. Um, but yeah, means, Maybe now is not a terrible time for David to make some non-moves because it really seems like Black can do very little. Yep. So, you know, we can, if we wanted to, we can go rook b8, rook b8, rook, you know, all the way along and then back to a and get, gain ourselves two minutes on the clock. But this isn't what David wants to, to do. David wants to... It, he believes that there is a winning line, here, yep. that there is a route from this end game to, to victory. And he wants to use his time, uh, even if it uh, takes him from now until he's got a minute left, to work out what that, that line is. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so candidate moves, so King G3. And for me, uh, if we're trying to win immediately rather than gain time with pointless rook moves, moving our rooks to these squares. And if I had to take an absolute stab in the dark i would say rook b6 is my uh is, oh, where's the rook at the moment it's on on a8 this is our yeah rook on this a8. is our current possession yeah so so rook a rook a6 but uh but yeah as david ticks down with his time uh Hopefully this will be the last long think that we, well, yeah. I'm, I'm sure it will have to be David's last long think. Uh, yeah, and as we said, I mean, he cannot really uh, have that luxury anymore. Yeah. So I, I definitely think this is the last think. And um, as you said, he's probably just calculating uh, many moves ahead now and trying to figure out uh, the winning plan. Yeah. Um, and meanwhile, uh, while David is thinking, we do have a question from Ed, Ed Ricketts. Are blunders more or less likely with fewer pieces? Um, obviously, the fact that they've been playing for such a long time uh, means that they're you know, more likely to be tired in this kind of blunders. You'd think it would be simpler, uh, but actually, I would say mistakes are less likely, but blunders are more likely mm -hmm. because... Uh, in uh, in the middle game, very often there are three or four good moves. Yeah. And okay, yeah. uh, for the most time, if, if you play one of the computer's top three moves, that's good enough. Yeah. You know, and, you know, we'd like to play the best move every time, but it but it's not possible. In an ending, it may be that only one move is the winning move, and only one move is the is the drawing move. So, and that can be the case for a long time. So there's no, you know. It doesn't matter when I'm playing the second best move in the position. The second best move might not be good enough. So uh, without doing anything ridiculous, you can blunder. So yeah, uh, yeah it's very, very easy to blunder, and, and, and even and that, with these few pieces on the board. Yeah, and that's what's so tricky about endings, as we've been uh, discussing earlier. Uh, just small uh, nuances in the position. If you move the rook to 8, uh, 6, or 8, 7, uh, could be uh, decisive. Um, and as you said, they've been playing now for close to five and a, five and a half hours. So they must feel uh, feel tired. And uh, yeah, just to play uh, long games every day. Uh, yeah, because they, they, this is the fourth 
fourth game in a row and uh, obviously no no rest day until until the halfway point of the match. Yeah. So there's, uh, there's today's game and then there's, uh, and there's an, another one tomorrow. Yeah. And then they have a rest day finally on, um, on Monday. Yeah. On, on Monday. Um, but, you know, the, this could be uh, the defining game of the match. Yeah. You know, uh, if David wins this game in a, in a six, seven hour marathon, then not only has he won a game, but very much like Magnus in the World Championship match, yes. you know he could he could break Nils' spirit absolutely uh, with with this defeat, especially as uh, as Nils was very very close to uh, to winning to, it already in game one. Yeah, to winning in game one, but also to it feels like just before the time control that that he'd managed to escape into an ending, which which we thought should have been holding for Black at some point. Yeah, and. Uh, uh, it's certainly Nils made some mistake in, in order to lose the pawn and end up in, in this, this horrendous situation. But on the flip side, if Nils is able to pull off the save today, then, uh, you know, a lot of the tiredness that goes out of, uh, of you playing this long game, he will be the one that, that comes back feeling fresh and that he's, you know, escaped from this, uh, this, yeah. this situation. Uh, and, you know, that can come with a a renewed sense of freedom and energy for, for tomorrow. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's uh, it's easy to say, you know, it, it could be the pivotal moment of this match, but I think it's the pivotal moment of this match. But, but we, we will see. And okay, we have a move from David. Uh, he didn't want his time to drop below the minute, and his rook has gone all the way back to A1. And this is a really interesting move uh, because uh, one logical idea here is that uh, he wants to play the move oh, uh, rook a1 he wants to play the move king g3 without allowing the rook to go behind potentially good check with rook h1 uh, so okay so nils has used that opportunity to activate his king and play king to f6 and david is thinking again in this position. I don't see, no, no, it's, uh, what's happened here? I'm confused. It's obviously Nils's move because his clock is tight, yeah. is going down. So we've seen the move rook a1. Ah, the rook's come from a5. Yeah, rook a5, king oh, six, and six. Okay, I, I think he played rook a1 through the right. Okay, he played rook a5, king f6, rook a1. Huh, it's interesting that he gives this move king f6 for free. Maybe his argument is that this bizarre h7 square is the dream square for the rook, where it defends the pawn along the seventh rank. We don't want to play rook g7. Because uh, it gives up any ambition of ever activating itself. So here, White can maybe play rook check and then king g3. And we, in this position, Black would like the resource rook h1 check. Uh, so Black certainly doesn't want to play the move rook h7. Uh, question to me is, is the rook any worse placed on h8 than it is on h7? So... Okay, and we see rook h8 from, from Neil. And this is a, a very understandable decision. Uh, wow. Oh, and, and, Dave, and David is just saying, aha, I'm going to reroute my this. I think David has found himself what he thinks is a winning plan. Yeah. Rook h1, rook a8. I'm expecting rook h6 check. King, King has to go back to f, f7. Seven, yeah. If King here then rook e6 feels like a good move, but that, but that would allow, I'll allow Trump to play with king f4. This would be a huge, huge mistake. But I, but what David intends is to play rook h5 to yeah, nice. And if this, then rook f5. So, uh, so the king has indeed immediately gone back to f7. But now we get king d3 in, and David has very cleverly found this way of getting his king to g3 without allowing any... Uh, without allowing this counterplay. Yeah, great, and, great technique. Yeah, David. great idea. Rook a1, rook h1. Yeah, um, and you know we were worried about the amount of time he was using. He went down to maybe a minute on the clock. Yeah, but now he's been able to quickly and confidently play 
three or four moves and he's back to a more respectable amount of time. I mean, he must be feeling great. I guess so. Right now. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to evaluate this in terms of number of moves for, for David to be winning. If we can go G5, King G4, I, I think we're winning uh, for sure. Uh, the threats of the G pawn pushing down the board and the king coming into F5 uh, are going to be too much. Yeah. And black is loath to ever touch this pawn. I'm not sure uh, exactly how we now we now win this pawn, but we probably have time to go G5 and swing the rook all the way back around again yeah. to, to pick up the pawn in, in that scenario. Again, you know, we we show some grandmaster technique at some point. You know, we we fiddle in a check here and there yeah. to whatever. Uh, normally, okay, we'll play a move like rook f six to force the king to the e seven, and then and then go and do something clever. But uh, but this feels like it should just winning for for white if uh, uh, if David manages to achieve that. Absolutely. Um... So so I'm not expecting to see e six. But uh, but yeah, most active move is rook a1. This will be the first move that Niels analyzes, I would get. So... And now with g5, you have rook g1. Yeah, g5, we have rook g1. We have king h4. Okay, you, you probably can't keep on checking. No. King, king, uh, king g4. And even though rook takes would actually pick up this pawn on... Uh, on h6, unfortunately here, uh, the king and pawn ending should just be winning for white, I assume. I assume this is just a winning king. Uh, yeah, it, it's going to be. Yeah, black can't play e6, for example, because of king b6. And uh, yeah, we're winning any Something like this, for yep. example. It's always... It's a little bit of a luxury being able to move the pieces over the board. Uh, normally, I'm, I feel just about okay about these kind of things, but I take so much time yeah, yeah. Uh, over the board. So I, I would I would hate to play this position with David's side because I would know, obviously, black can't play what takes it. But David, I'm sure, can calculate that in 10, 20 seconds. For me, that's like maybe a minute and a half, two minutes convincing myself that mm -hmm. it's 100 times out of 100. Yeah, you know. Uh, but okay. Uh, but, but can can black just stay on yeah. the g one and then try and uh... yeah? So we don't have very many passing moves because yeah. the king the king is on its best square right now. We'd like yeah. to play king back to back. Then. Maybe rook g two. Rook g two. Ah, uh, but then maybe you can start really pushing the, the g-file at some point, uh, rook h7. Rook h7 and then king e6, for example. Then I would we can put the rook behind the yeah, pawn. Yeah, either put the rook there or, yeah, maybe that's just a good move. Not easy, though. It's, yeah, it's not true. Well, what about, instead of rook g7, king, king h5? Uh, or is it a bit? Well, uh, I just feel the G pawn is now starting to become. A, yeah, a I, real I, I, I suspect you're right. There's mm. no real benefit to giving this back. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think so. Yeah, something like this, for example, and black, black regains the pawn, but play. I say it's just look at J and G seven, but yeah. you know. It's never too late to lose a game of chess. <laughs> but uh, yeah, in this position, maybe just, uh, yeah. Maybe, maybe king h6. Yeah. And yeah, it looks, looks very tough to prevent this plan of rook h8 and g7. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this, this looks like it should be, be winning for, for white, I guess. But uh, back, to the, back to the game position. I'm, I'm not sure what the alternatives are. Uh, yeah, my option is go rook a1 or be very upset. Um, I, I, think, I mean... This is the, this prevents g5. 
Okay, but now maybe King H4. The more I look at it, it looks really, really, really difficult for uh, yeah. this. Um, either he goes rook A1 or rook A8. David will have the possibility to to get his plan going. Yeah, um, it, it looks like it should just win right here to me. But uh, but yeah, we have to search for the for one one more trick for black. Yeah, yeah. But uh, well, that didn't that at least didn't seem the clearest after look to me. Let me say, if if all moves lose in this position, yeah. then I think he'll play rook a one. But uh, but we can almost we can start ruling out moves. King g seven, any king move loses to rook. Uh, and I simply don't. Yeah. Don't believe that e6 is, is a okay. is a move that, yeah. that, that black should play in this position. Yeah. Even if every move is losing, then you cannot play e6. Uh, so moving the rook along this line, all the moves are the same. So so our choice is to go uh, to play rook b8 and pass, which I I don't really believe. To defend passively with rook b8. Or to bring the rook all the way down to a1 and at least an attempt to to, uh, to get counterplay this. And at least it looks a bit more active going to, to a1. Yeah, uh, we found a way for, for white to blunder rooks in some yeah. positions. You know, yeah, that's true. You so, know, uh, there's always so. there, there's there's always there's always someone on the right? But uh, you know, earlier I was saying you know it's really really important to. To find something positive to say say about your position. Yeah. I'm running out of positive things to say about yeah. that position. I think Niels is, uh, agrees with you as well. Yeah, this but, is uh, yeah. This is where I'd say, you know, I trying not to slump in my chair. You know, it's, it's, we also have to give credit to David. Um, oh, no, yeah. enormous! Credit. I mean, it's just been so instructive, and uh, and for the chat as well. We've been discussing different type of end games. Uh, Throughout the day, and this has been um, a rook and pawn ending, which we thought would be uh, holdable for black, but somehow it, it feels Nils misplayed his rook earlier on in, in the end game, allowing yeah. uh, David to double up on the, the eighth pawn, and uh, after that he's just played really really good. Yeah, so we we got to this kind of ending here. Here I was thinking. Uh, so yeah, uh, here and takes and takes and uh, yeah, we got to this situation after h4, rook a4, and yeah, we felt that okay, this is obviously unpleasant with, yeah. with all of Black's weaknesses over here. But uh, what I was thinking maybe just play king f7, just yeah. What did he play? He went king f7 yeah. here, and then rook b5, rook b4. Yeah, some something some, happened some, there, yeah. something around about here. Where it feels like maybe he has yeah. a maybe he just had a fortress and yeah, uh, king f6 has to be there. King f7. Okay, it, it's unpleasant because David can, can try and go f3 and and, uh, and e4, but but maybe there's always some scenario where uh, I'm not sure it's difficult to pass. You know, just is just is really difficult. Some kind of position where as soon as White goes uh, e4, that we go here and then we go h4. And the, and uh, the rook may be very short on squares, but yeah. but we set up some kind of best. And yeah, it's never never easy at all in these conditions. But this is where we feel it it, it may be moved from yeah. uh, from from in theory it should be a draw to uh, one as soon as the h pawn as soon as the h pawn dropped off the board. Uh, yeah, and we got to this position with this nice f3 4 idea and yeah. kicked h5. And and here, okay, David's shown some interesting techniques. We we even talked about the rook coming back to h1, but we saw this fascinating rook move where the rook went uh, to h8. Okay, it spent some time on e8 for a little bit. It's Essentially, it's covered it's there. covered the four yeah. the four corners of the board <laughs> round to round to h1, yeah. and then finally finally back from h1 to uh, to complete its journey onto yeah. onto h6, uh, 
that's continually, really, really interesting. Yeah, continually. Fuss. I'm not sure I've seen this uh, <laughs> this this maneuver in a look and pull ending. Uh, no. Yeah, I mean, either. I don't know how many look and three against look and two endings I've seen. It's a, a large number of endings, but yeah. there's always something new. Absolutely. And uh, and I'd be surprised if David had seen this idea before, but obviously it occurred to him at some point. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, all right, let's see the game situate. Niels has picked a move. Okay, yeah, rook to a5. So this is pretty much just, uh, just sitting and waiting, and we're expecting to see G5 uh, fairly soon. Yeah. Maybe David can, could consider whether he wants his rook on B6 first. Again, the important thing, if you have more time on the clock than David has, if you don't rush the commit or call him to station. Rook B6 is not the best move, and we can push the, the thing back. I, I suspect David is gaining some time on yeah. I'm, expect, that makes sense. I'm expecting rook h7 checking f6, rook h6 checking. Because uh, David had just gone down to, to below 30 seconds. And, but okay, so king f6, and we'll see uh, a very quick rook h6, I believe. Oh, and then g5. Then either g5. Rook b6. Yeah, I mean, maybe you could even do this one more time and then play king h4 mm -hmm. is, is also possible. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not. I'm, nice idea. I'm not sure exactly how David intends to do this, but whichever way he intends to. And if Black has to play King E6, then the G pawn. Uh, yeah, to... yeah. This was some of the stuff that we were we were looking at before. And again, the rook is on A5 rather than A1, so we have we have no skill in the work. Yeah. So. Well. Uh, but uh, this is this is the moment for David to to show us the the winning line. Yeah. We, it, it's g5 is coming at some point. He's not going to touch this at all, even if there wasn't rook a3 check. The, yeah. we, he, he never wants to exchange off uh, a pair of pawns in this position. It's all about that's fun. Yeah, we, we, we either win with this g pawn, or more likely we use the g pawn as a distraction to end up picking up this pawn here. Okay, and we see rook h7 check, king f6, and I'm expecting king h4. Maybe rook h5, but I think king h4. So always good to hedge my bets a little bit. <laughs> and meanwhile, uh, Jay Scott on the chat uh, says um, Nils will fight back if he were to lose this game. Uh, and at Tata Steel uh, recently, Nils did not get his first win until round 10 when he won against uh, Daniel Dubo. Before that, he had five losses and four draws. So he believes. Else will bounce back. Uh, Bortnik thinks David will convert and, uh, and win. Um, five seconds, maybe, maybe David's about to overstep. Oh, and, the, and it's rook okay. h5. Okay. Uh, I'm glad I had a backup. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, it's a, the frustrating thing of playing David. You know, you will. Uh, yeah. Whenever you're sitting there and you know his time is ticking down and you're staring deliberately at the board, you're like, if I look at the clock, yeah, yeah. then he will move. <laughs> you look straight ahead and then he makes his move and you look at the clock and go, oh, he's not lost on time again. Uh, yeah, here I, is down to three seconds. Yeah. I wonder if he's ever overstepped in a, in a, in a better position than the 30 second increment. Because obviously if, you, if you're in a losing position... Then, then maybe we can ask him after, after the game. <laughs> if, he, if he wins. If he wins, yeah. If, if, he, if, he, if he wins, but... Uh, yeah. That happened to me once when I was I played my first Norwegian championship. I was 12 and I had like a summer girlfriend uh, uh -huh. at the time, my first girlfriend. And she was following the game uh, while I was playing. And then I lost on time in a, in a better position uh, at move 39. So I think I was a bit uh, unfocused uh, yeah. in, in the time trouble. So uh, uh, that's I've, a shame. Uh, not traumatized. Yeah, I, I have this memory. I played in the uh, when we had the big London Chess Classics and we had the, the Super Blitz event. I used to hugely enjoy that. You know, it's... I know that I'm not as good as, as most of these players at, you know, when it comes to slow play, but you have a chance against them all in sure. in, in, in blitz. And uh, and we, we reached one of the knockout stage matches and I was drawn against uh, this incredibly dangerous blitz player, uh, Marcus Harvey. 
Uh, he'd been, you know, he'd been playing in uh, in the event with the with the top British players and uh, having knocked out Luke McShane in the blitz stages and uh, and, and played Mickey Adams and uh, do the the rapid games and then drew the first four blitz games. So incredibly strong player. Mm-hmm. And uh, time limit three minutes plus two seconds of move. And I felt uh, peak flow that I, you know, at some point during the game, I was uh, I was enjoying it so much, and uh, you know, I was a pawn up against against him in the ending, and I I won a second pawn. I thought I was beautifully, uh, beautifully converting the game. I never once looked at the clock. I knew that I was somewhat short on time. I thought maybe 10, 20 seconds, but I was moving fairly quickly, and I thought, you know. I'm moving less than once every two seconds, and then mm-hmm. um, so, and I stopped and paused for a couple of seconds, just a bit between two moves. And Mark says, "Aha, you've lost on time." And uh, it's the wow. it's the only time that, that I've lost on time in that kind of scenario. Okay, only a blitz thing, but a yeah, like, a, cool. like a serious blitz game. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't know it was below ten seconds on the clock. So uh, must have been a devastating feeling. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, it happens. It, it happens, but okay, it won't. It won't happen to today. He make, he makes the move with with three seconds on the clock, and uh, he is now definitely threatening to go G five. We've said that a lot. I uh, don't think his idea is to go rook F five. You know, the fact that he he only moved for the few seconds. Uh, but, but, I'm, I'm but, not sure he's seen the definitive yeah. win yet. Yeah, maybe not. But one one important question: Let's say um, instead of rook b5, let's say uh, rook is a7. Just um, will David consider playing rook f5 to try and cut off the king from the and then start pushing? Is yeah, a... yeah. I mean, I, I think this is this is sort of game over. Yeah. Uh, it's the Lucina with with extra pieces, yeah. I guess. Because the the rook isn't going to be able to passively defend. Like, very, we should be fairly easily able to push the G pawn. Just trying to imagine. Yeah, I guess we would just move our king yeah, to king, 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 king G six to meet rook H. Yeah. Rook G eight check with king H seven. And as soon as the uh, the king reaches H seven, in in the king and pawn ending, I would call H seven the golden. Because it it covers each of the the squares that the pawn needs to get to to come out. Yeah. So at some stage the king the rook would have to come to find the past pawn, but we should just be able to pawn up That's incrementally quite, uh, and stick the rook behind the past pawn in yeah. some scenarios. Should be quite straightforward. For, yeah. Uh, this this seems this seems fairly trivial. Mm-hmm. So my guess is that the rook has to uh, has to stay on the fifth rank and play rook b five here. Mm-hmm. And we could see rook, at, and then if rook f5 check, the king would have to come back to g6. But yeah, but here uh, again, it's not impossible for us to play. We could theoretically win a pawn here. Yeah, with f4. With f4, but aha, uh-huh, maybe the idea in this position is not that we win a pawn. Uh, maybe black should try something like e6 here. I don't think it makes a difference. Uh, but we can we can just move the rook and then yeah. use it use it to push the pawn forward with this. Yeah, I think anything goes in, uh, in this position. Yeah. I assume so. Yeah, and you know there were some details. I mean it. Every position, there's still, there's always some. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's the, you know, it's so maybe, maybe, maybe just take on e5. That's the, yeah, yeah, if, maybe. If you get to play f4 and. Uh, oh, of course, we can play rook takes e5, yeah. right? Rook yeah, takes. We, go, we go rook takes e5. Yeah. Of course, I was thinking you'd have, we'd have to take the pawn. Oh, uh, yeah, that but, would maybe. But that, that would be maybe tricky. But, 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 but this king upon ending uh, is, is uh, winning, yeah. For is sure. winning for sure, yeah. Even if we can't push the G pawn, we can wander our king around. Yeah. yeah, winning for sure. So, so this is not a not a, a potential. Uh, so, I think I, I think we've concluded that moving the rook from the fifth rank doesn't hold, and leaving the rook on the fifth rank doesn't hold either. Yeah. Well, the threat is rook f five, and 
if the king goes to e6, then white wins, and if the king goes to g6, then white wins. Uh, oh, okay. So you maybe you're forced into playing the move that we really don't want to play. Okay, Niels has played king g6. Now we might see king h4 and the threat of f4. Let's go with that. Yeah. Yep. Uh, okay, so I'd like to go on the counterattack with rook a3. Yeah, okay, this is what we see from Niels. But now, so. What's the ending like with e and g? Is that winning? It should be, right? Uh, there's no king f6 because it's a yeah. back here. Right. Well, I mean, it's famous that rook f and h pawn uh, is a draw. Mm -hmm. uh, a very, very difficult draw. But that must mean, the fact that that's the only one that's ever quoted, uh, must mean that G and E is, is a win for here. Maybe it's not the easiest win for, for White. I would. Uh, I think we're about to, to find out. We're about to find out. It's saying David has uh, not made a move, but I'm. Yeah, so Rook uh, 3. Good. But okay, we see. See, look. So if we were to go look f5 instead, yeah. then, yeah, maybe this is... But what do you do um, if you're e6? Yeah, then you just... Yeah, then we get the similar, similar position, right? Because after rook f8, king g7. Okay, I think this is where we have uh, a couple of moves come in. Oh, sorry, it's gone. Okay. Oh, huh. interesting. So he doesn't, he chooses not to take the pawn. I'm sure that taking the pawn must be, must be winning in this position. But okay, he gives a check, he gives a check, he gains the time, and then he comes back. Uh, I guess, and then the book goes back to a5. Look okay, h5 again. I mean, it feels to me like David is going to be forced to take that and go into that. Anyway. Yeah. And it and it should be a win, but I think he's you know he's saying that he wants to win this without the technical difficulty, and it's not the it's not the easiest. Okay, one. and the chat uh, is saying we have a minor clock malfunction, so uh, we'll try and figure that out. Um, yeah, like, I mean, it, I mean they've given yeah it went briefly down to zero zero, but yeah. But uh, I I won't believe it until until the result appears on Chess Twenty Four and yeah. David and Nils appear here <laughs> and say that, that indeed White lost on time. And the uh, and the chat is uh, they're really liking this uh, exciting end game. Um, Kevin Winter saying David is in his element on the increment and uh, better he will grind this out. Uh, and Jay Scott saying David's pulse rate is through the roof. He can't sit still for more than a couple of seconds. Uh, Riders in the wild also think David will grind out this win. Is there is there webcam available of the players? Is there is yeah on, uh, on the is there an official website or we have uh, we have um, you know uh, their cameras. So it's always nice to see the players working working really hard. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, let's see. Kevin Winter, Oskil, have you had dinner at Simpsons in this round yet? A lot of chess history there. No, not yet, but uh, maybe on the rest day on Monday, I'll, I'll try and go there. Maybe um, maybe David and Nils will, uh, will join me. I heard that there's a picture of David on the wall oh. at this uh, restaurant. So, um, so we'll go there, definitely. Um, and according to Riders in the Wild, David found the best move here. And a uh, question from Moritz. Do you think David knows this is a winning position for him? Uh, um, yeah, I think he, he fills in his bones that, you know, that, that it's winning. Uh, and, I, and I think that it, I'm sure that takes E5 must also have been winning, but it, it, you know, it would have required, it, it could go wrong potentially. Uh, maybe, yeah, maybe it requires a bit more technique than he's... Uh, yeah, but I think, I mean, I guess he feels like he's got that in the bank. He can yeah. play king back to h4 at any point, and, 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 and the rook probably has to go to b3. Yeah. Uh, 
and defend. So we've just seen Rook from, from A5 across to B3. And okay, David is saying, I want more. Yeah. Uh, wow. But, uh, and I think, yeah, he's he's not happy with this ending after Rook takes E5. And so maybe we've seen the Rook already go from H8 to A8 to A1 to A1. So I can only assume that David's plan here is Rook H1 to, to A1 to A8 to H8, yeah. uh, just for the, for the symmetry. Uh, and then back to H1 again, and then back to H5, and he'll take this. But, uh, but Dave, I'm, I'm assuming that David is going for the well-known gambit of, uh, he had a very big pass to lunch, and he knows that, that as the game enters the seventh hour, yeah. that's just when he'll be warming up, and Nils, very foolishly, you know, he had a light snack for lunch. Just some yogurt. And, just, uh... just, just some yogurt, and you know. And a little bit of fruit, but, yeah. but not the not the real lasting power that so you, he's ready to, you to give the final lockout in yeah. the seventh hour. David hold doesn't David hold the record for for the most games sort of going like beyond 150 moves yeah, and all but, of this kind of yeah, why still... why why win a game in 80 moves if you can win it in 150 moves? Yeah, yeah. You know? I mean he so, he uh, loves these long games. Yeah, uh, it's it's incredible. I can't remember how long ago I, I I'm gonna say maybe an hour and and 20 minutes ago, uh, we were chatting in the break to a couple of people. And they said, oh, you know, game may be Now that they've reached move 40 and they've got a certain amount of time, game will be finished in 40, 45 minutes. I said, well, <laughs> that's optimistic. These 30, 30 second increments, uh, that's a minute total for the players every single move they make. And they're making they, a lot of moves they, now. And the... Yeah, they can make another 45 moves and yeah. then, then they have to take something or make a pawn. Yeah. So. Maybe maybe in 40 moves time, we'll reach move 100. And David will say, OK, I'll take this ball on E5. <laughs> but, uh, but, um... but speaking of that, should we, should we have a quick um, breather soon? Uh, this might go on for uh, quite yeah. some time. Yeah, I, I think so. We, we, we've just seen the move look to D1. Uh, David is attempting to... To enter another winning rook and point ending with rook t5. I suspect we'll see king f6 here. But uh, yeah, let's take a short break and then yeah. come back to the for the conclusion of this game. Yeah, sounds sounds good. So we'll be back in uh, just a few minutes. Uh, stay tuned. Everyone is welcome to enjoy the Swedish nature. Never before seen gourmet concept shaped over millions of years, featuring 100% natural ingredients and four Michelin starred chefs. So put on your best clothes, shine your shoes, and get ready because you're going to. 
Sweden. The biggest gourmet restaurant in the world. That's right, we have turned our whole country into a restaurant. You see, here in Sweden, fine dining is just around the corner, in our nature. And everyone is invited. Together with our star chefs, we have composed a do-it-yourself menu from ingredients that you can forage in our forests, fields and lakes. To make it easier for you to experience what our nature has to offer, we have placed tables and cooking kits in a few pretty nice spots around the country. Reserve your seat at visitsweden.com. If it's fully booked, don't worry. There's another 100 million acres of fine do-it-yourself dining available for you. Always close, always open. Simple, healthy and delicious. Welcome to Sweden, the edible country. I don't really know what my expectations were when I grew up. I just wanted to make games. I didn't really consider where that would take me. Today, I am the chief creative officer here at Mojang in Stockholm. We have more than 120 million monthly active users and more than 200 million sold copies of Minecraft. I often get a question on why is Minecraft so successful? I believe it's the way you interact with the world. It's very simple and uh, you have a big impact on just small actions. You quickly realize that you can build anything, so it gives you a very sense of uh, empowerment. <laughs> I came to Mojang because I've always been making games my entire life. Marcus Persson, he created Minecraft, and his idea was to create more games with the support of the success of Minecraft. I got asked if I knew someone that could help them develop a new game. I said, well, I volunteer myself. For the first year, it was just me and Marcus working on Minecraft. It was really in the spirit, as we say in the, in the industry, like we were just doing things for fun. Sometimes we could have an idea on, on the Monday that was released on the Friday. So it was very high tempo <laughs> and uh, a lot of fun. When I started, the game had already sold 700,000 copies, uh, which was amazing and more or less unheard of in the, like, in the game scene. We believed that we had peaked but we quickly realized that Minecraft is here to stay. So that meant that I would take over the lead development of the creative vision for Minecraft. I think the most fun part about making games is the early phase where everything is possible. And it's both about creating a world, but also creating the rule sets of this world. When I look around, I always look at things and think about them in terms of game development. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's a, it's a blessing or a curse. For instance, when we were on a holiday in Singapore, and they have these amazing plants that grow on the trees, like flowers. And I was thinking, oh, that we could use that. <laughs> like, Sweden might be a good place uh, to be a nerd. <laughs> Well, we have these really long, dark winters, uh, so it's not strange if anyone just stays indoors a whole weekend and working on something on their computers. That's potentially one of the reasons why we have so many good music artists uh, and also game developers, and we're, we have the time to really geek out on specific topics. Så vi har ju precis snapshotat lite olika features till Cubes och Clips, till exempel koppar. Och vi har fått in lite olika feedback, så jag tänkte kolla lite med dig vad du tänker. Today I'm more guiding and directing ideas. And uh, Agnes Larsson is now leading the design team for Minecraft. We know that kids play a lot of Minecraft. So when we add new features, we try to consider if we can make this feature in a way that teaches them something. 
one of the reasons why we added bees was to put attention to that bees are very important for pollination, but also for the way we produce food. And also, Minecraft is a fancy world, and not everything works as it does in real life, obviously. <laughs> When I play Minecraft with my son, I build things and my son, he wants to go on an adventure. <laughs> so he just says, come on dad, come on dad, we need to go. And I'll say, like, okay, I'll follow you. When we're out exploring, I'm more like, oh, can we go back now? <laughs> can, we, can we continue building on, on the castle instead? <laughs> and he's like, no dad. <laughs> I'm always thinking about what I'm working on next. <laughs> You never really sit down and say, oh, this is it. It never really ends. <laughs> you just follow your drive. All right, we're back for the fourth game of this special challenge match between David Howell and Nils Grandelius, played here in the heart of London. And I'm joined by international master Tom Randall and uh, wow. Uh, some developments, actually, even though we've seen uh, this position uh, earlier in the endgame. Absolutely. So it feels like they've, they've gone from playing chess to, to ring around the rosy <laughs> with the ropes. So, yeah. And, uh, I, I lose track of exactly where we were before, but uh, but the rook was sitting on h5. And, OK, David at some point had the option to, to win this pawn on e5 uh, and the pawn on e7 in exchange for the pawn on f3, and he rejected it. Uh, and decided that he was going to go for more by uh, by swinging his rook all the way around the board. It went via d1 and then back round to d8 again. And it seems like we reached some position where, for a number of moves uh, up until around about here, black could maybe enter some kind of fortress if uh, if chat is to be believed with something like e6. And this is a move that we were incredibly reluctant to play for for many many moves but maybe just where uh, where the rooks are and where all the pieces are black has uh, if not a fortress but the option to maybe check on b2 with the rook and uh, as soon as the king goes forward to g3 for example then move the rook behind and check over like this yeah but uh, but it, it seems like uh, that the the evaluation went from what what must have been a winning look and pawn ending for white we we were talking about it maybe not being easy but definitely winning winning in the long run mm -hmm. to at some point probably hold a booth but uh, but where we are now is that we've kind of gone back to this situation that we were in 15 minutes ago uh where okay the, the rook has now gone to spend along the fifth rank and we assume that if david wants to he can put his rook on h5 uh, play something like rook f5 check. If the king goes this way, we push the b-pawn. And if the king goes to g6, then we can organize some kind of f4 move, or we can go here. Yeah, we can go king g3, king h4, for example, and we're to go f4. And here, black 
has to play rook a3 and enter this ending, uh, which is not trivial by any 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 stretch of the imagination, but should be should be a win for white. Yeah. Uh, so this is roughly where we find ourselves, but we have we have a committal move from David as well. Uh, David has got up, got fed up with uh, moving the rooks and kings around the board and has pushed the pawn forward to g5. And this means that we will now not see that ending, uh, at least with the rook h5 and uh, the two pawns coming off for the pawn on f3. But this is interesting because maybe now uh, Nils will have a think and, and realize e6 might be something. Maybe not in this position, but... I don't, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's a fortress even here. It looks incredibly ugly, but we sit with the king on this square. And then we say, how are you going to make progress? But maybe, so let's just play some moves on the board. Here, rook g1, here, rook h1. This would be my preferred attempt at a fork. Yeah. Stop them from playing king h5. And rook a6. Rook h6. Uh, house is freezing for a second. We have some. We have a, a, a small scratch uh, for the moment, but technical issue. But um, let's see. Should we cut to a break? Yeah, very, maybe very have briefly. a just two minute break, and we'll try and uh, resolve the. Uh, this and get right back to the act. Was that we should maybe close and, yeah. and, and go back into the let's see. Yes. Mm -hmm. Let me click. Right. Okay, and we're and we're back. Sorry about that. Uh, so where we left it, David had finally committed the pawn forward to to G five, and we were just speculating as to whether or not. Uh, e6 was still a fortress. Uh, but, but okay, I think for the moment, let's just see what's happening in the game. So the rook has gone back to c1. Uh, King g2 seems like a, a classic parting move, rook a1. And, and yeah, Nils is, is saying if you move your king forward to b3, then I will check. Uh, then I will check from behind with rook g1. So king g3, rook g1. That's just move things around too much. Yeah. Like this. Okay, on the Okay, so so King G two rook A one, King H two rook F one. Yeah, uh, Nils is starting to to believe here. Absolutely. So David is finally committed to playing G five, but if he plays King G three, he then commits to the king walking forward to H four, and 
Yeah, but surely this is the only thing you can do now. Okay, okay, so we see King goes back to G2, Rook goes back to A1, but but you now have to have to show us the idea, David. Uh, and okay, King H3, so King H3. But I imagine probably Rook goes to G1 here rather than H1. So if we, if we give the check, then we're forcing the king to go in the direction that it wants to go. And uh, we talked about this king and pawn ending before, and uh, I think we came to the conclusion it was, uh, it was a fairly comfortable win for white. So I'm expecting the move rook g1 here uh, from Niels. And I guess you have to go king, king h4. Yeah, and then I guess the question is, do you have a threat? And does back have a person? Is this where we're supposed to go e6? Or do we play uh, rook g2 here? Was rook g2 an acceptable passing move? Maybe, maybe just king h5 here is enough to win. And if the rook ever checks, he comes back to Sorry, I can't see what A and B does. Ah. Better now. There was nothing too much going on the A, on the A and B side. Right? <laughs> That's true. You know, yeah. And as, as someone said, the, who needs the who needs the queen side? Anyways, um, in this position. Yeah. If we if we have a cut off the the G file and the H file, then please please yep. please let us know. But, uh, we had some technical uh, difficulties. Uh, yeah, we lost the H. We lost the H. Okay, we lost the H one. That's that's serious. okay. It seems to be better now. Or okay, I think it's okay. all good now. Can you go up to the live position? So... It's been a long day and with some technical difficulties as well. It's not so easy. But yeah, no, we're we're glad that you could be joining us in the in, this is the, the seventh hour now of this marathon battle between David Howell and Niels Grandelius in, in yeah, game four. And for the first time in in, uh, in a couple of hours. Uh, David is ahead on the clock. Wow. So Neil, Niels has finally used up all of his time, and uh, and okay, and has gone for Rook G one instead of uh, instead of uh, H one. This, this is what we expected. And, and and just look how focused they are, both of them. They're completely uh, and utterly focused now in this. Uh, okay. G2. Very tense. Yeah, so we've got this passing situation that we saw before. But we thought David could play King H5 here, uh, threatening to maybe play Rook H. Yeah, King H5 threatens to play Rook H5, uh, so Rook H7 check. And the idea is that if Black checks on H2, the King can come back to G. Um, yeah. Can't come back to G4, sorry. Um, um. So I think I think this is uh, this is winning for for White again. Maybe he needs to find some way of winning the F three pawn, but it, it it feels too slow. Yeah, okay, we have King H five from David. Uh, should we? No, no, that's fine. Uh, yeah, King to H five, and we didn't steer move for Black. Yeah, so this is the current position. This is the current position, and we think Rook H2 is losing, and we think doing nothing is losing. Maybe uh, if King G7, then Rook E6 yeah. would, would be game over, I think. So, okay, so Niels has opted for, for Rook H2 check, King G4. And we were fairly certain that the King and Pawn ending was winning for White after yeah. Rook H6. That's that one more time uh, and then we have to play the move h7 and the king comes into f5 yeah and, and this this, this should be forward. should be quite straightforward so okay uh mills chooses to keep the rooks on the board but we've been talking about where the king wants to get to uh, for a long time and for 
or we wanted to get the king onto the e5 square. But ever since the pawn uh, moved forward to e5, what feels like quite a long time ago now, white has dreamed of the king sitting on f5. And now that it's there, uh, okay, black has to go for this counterplay with rook g3. But uh, maybe it's just another way to get to uh, gin, e yeah. But this time around the pool, we've made some progress with how the pawns are going to be pushed. Uh, I wonder if we start off with rook h7 check. Yeah, okay, we start off with rook h7 check. And I suspect the king should maybe go, okay, king goes back to f8. And now we have a, a bit of a choice. I, I would like to play something like king takes e5 and then king e6. But, but maybe maybe black is still wriggling after rook g3. But uh, we should not need to play with that many more accurate moves in this position. King g6. Uh, Threatening that, checkmates. Threatening checkmates. Oh, they, yeah, this is this is game over, I think. Uh, if the pawn has to go forward to e6, then there are many ways of doing it. But yeah. King G8 to escape would obviously be a disaster as no, we it take, just feels take like, all yeah. the pawns off the board. Uh, so yeah, King A8, King G8. But yeah, I don't think David is interested anymore in this pawn on E5. No, uh, no now it's all about the G pawn and yeah. uh, trying. Ah, that's very clever by David. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I don't. I actually don't think it's even necessary. I suspect yeah. you can probably do other things, but, but why? Why yeah. give your opponent exactly? Why give your opponent the sliver of counterplay? Uh, and uh, and I have to say, I mean, it took some time, David. Uh, Danced around a little bit with the rook, but overall, I mean, I'm I'm very impressed with the with the technique uh, he showed. Even though he at some point maybe allowed this fortress, but that wasn't. I mean, either of the players uh, saw that possibility. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it one, wasn't one, on the radar. No, no. One thing I said for them a long time ago is we didn't want to touch the E6. Yeah. So it's very possible that both players basically deleted it. Yeah. From their, from their options. And, it just and felt uh, counterintuitive to, to even touch uh, E7 pawn. Yeah. And now it just looks uh, game over. Mm. Yeah. So the pawn uh, that Black has in this position is that his king cannot come over to, to help stop the pawn. And White can very slowly, so if we pass for, for Black, we play the move King H6. And every time that we're allowed to, we will push the pawn. And if the rook checks us, we don't go directly in front of the pawn, but we go forward to Jesus. That guarantees the pawn to move one square forward. So if the, the rook goes behind, then we have the same thing. If it's white to move, he'll go king g6 and then and g8 and, and g7. And slowly like this, we can, we can, uh, in fact, and then we, you just play rook f5. Yeah. But yeah, there may be other ways of doing it as well. Yeah, we can play rook f5. Uh, or maybe you can play. Rook h8. Um, yeah, we can play it. Yeah. Rook here or rook, f, yeah. rook f5 and king f7. Yeah. Um, you know, even to the end, you know, the some kind of way of, of building the bridge or shielding the rook away from the pawn, something like this, you know. But wow, we have a result <laughs> after, after rook f8. Um, Nils uh, resigned. Uh, yeah. Yeah, because well, of the the lines uh, you showed us now, Tottenham. Wow, what a marathon game! Uh, David must be super thrilled. Yeah, so been... so just the the eighty six moves. In yeah, the end, just eighty six. Not, not the one hundred and forty we were we were concerned about. Yeah, wow, what a game! Um, and imagine if he had uh, found these six there, Mills. He did have a chance. And uh, yeah, I mean, I I think one thing that's to say is that. Uh, by no means was e6 a forced draw. Uh, what it, it was setting up some kind of fortress, but uh, but they, David would have uh, would have been continuing to continuing to press for, yeah. for many many moves. And uh, uh, yeah, it's not as simple as you play e6 and then you draw the game. Yeah, no, of course. But at the same time, it also shows that 
often there are resources in a in a defending uh, position as well uh, and and this was a really instructive uh, end game uh, for all the viewers out there and uh yeah, yeah. I, I i personally learned a lot uh, watching this uh, this game so, yeah so study it and and take notes yeah um, um absolutely absolutely mainly not to get into rook and pawn endings against david but uh, maybe that's not the lesson i was supposed to take from this game but uh, <laughs> I, I don't know chess is a very very tough game but, absolutely um, and uh, we will be joined by uh, david uh, shortly i think we'll give uh, nils uh, the day off from the, the post-game analysis but uh, we're waiting for david to hear some some insight uh, from from the game and uh, yeah he's uh, decision making and the uh, thought process because there were a number of critical moments earlier on uh, in the game as well um yeah absolutely and so yeah just to to uh, to remind you of the match situation so this means this win is the first win for, for anyone in the match and that puts david in a two and a half one and a half lead yeah. after four games with, with obviously six games still remaining in the match so absolutely. so there's a there's a absolutely a long way uh, still to go in this match, and as someone pointed out in chat in the in the Tata Steel tournament, Niels didn't win his first game until the round ten. So yeah, he'll be hoping not to leave it quite so long in, in this this match, I I suspect, but uh, but plenty of time to to get that win. Yeah, absolutely. And and Niels is wiped tomorrow. I'm I'm sure he'll be uh, well prepared as always. And. It's interesting, all the four games uh, White has been uh, pushing and finally uh, managed to, to get, the, get the ball in the back of the net, Absolutely. as we say. Yeah. So uh, I think David yeah, must be thrilled about uh, the result and also the game. I mean, it was a well-played game uh, from, from, from David. And, uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, I guess when we come back and we'll, uh, uh, we'll chat to David, you know, the many many hours ago now, but this, it, it all came down to this uh, this nice bit of preparation he had. Uh, assuming that most of these kind of moves are things he'd seen before, and yeah, this move h4 yep. that which we sort of joked about very very early on. And okay, it wasn't quite the h pawn that uh, that saw us to victory, but 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 very much nearly. I would Absolutely. I, I would suggest yeah. and uh, yeah. For the for the first time, David got a very very pleasant position out of the opening, and Nils was was probably very close to solving his problems without without ever fully equalising. But uh, but yeah, sometime in the run up to the first time control, uh, Nils lost the pawn, and and after that we he was stuck in very very unpleasant looking pawn ending that yeah. we've been uh, yeah, we've been analysing in depth for the last couple of hours. So uh, yeah, no, absolutely fascinating game, and, and yeah, big congratulations to David today. And um, looks like the chat enjoyed it as well. Um, many comments. Andre saying, "Well done, David." Um, and yeah, J Scott, perhaps the missed defenses could be instructive. Uh, absolutely, uh, I think. Also, the players probably. We'll learn a lot from analyzing uh, this game and the, the position uh, that occurred in, in the end game. Yeah. And this whole idea uh, with E6 possibly being um, a fortress is uh, is something to to keep in mind, even though it looks, uh, I mean, it looks like an ugly move and uh, it's, it's probably difficult to hold even yeah. after E6, but uh, yeah. I I will I'll ask David about it. My suspicion is that he will be very surprised. Yeah, that uh, uh, it even existed. Yeah, as that, that it existed. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure when he played, when he decided not to play what takes e five, that he felt that he had the luxury of always being able to go back into that. Yeah, and uh, for there to be a moment, yeah, I I think he'll be he'll be he'll be shocked. I don't think he'll mind that much, having oh. ha having won won the game. Yeah, uh, it'll mostly be a be a curiosity. Yeah. Um, but imagine if Nils had found it and uh, the game ended in a draw in uh, another 50 moves. I think he would be, it would, would have felt like a loss for David. Yeah, I mean, no, 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 absolutely. absolutely. And uh, as soon as you win the game, you know, yeah. it's not that he won't still be tired from, the, from this game, but uh, 
you know, just it also just gives win. you energy. Yeah, yeah. boosts your confidence, boosts your energy levels, and uh, yeah. And in a match situation like this, it always it's always good to get the first win, and uh, I think this will also uh, change the dynamic a little bit for the the upcoming games. And uh, I think uh, Nils uh, will see some aggressive play from Nils, and he has a good chance tomorrow with the white pieces. And if uh, history is to repeat itself, uh, he might uh, get a good position. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm certain he'll come out fighting tomorrow, and uh, yeah. Yeah, hopefully good things for the rest of the match. Yeah, absolutely. And Ed Ricketts, uh, uh, enjoyed the game. Thank you, Askil and Tom. Great effort. Thank you so much. My pleasure having you guys in the chat here today. Uh, Bortnik, result. Good game. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Andre, fantastic game. Uh, both players in great commentary. Thank you so much. Uh, are these games federated? Uh, yeah, I do believe they are. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, it'd be plus plus five points for, yeah. for David's FIDE rating, I guess. Yeah, so, um, that's a nice yeah. nice little boost as well. And yeah. uh, I mean, we have to mention the the prizes in this match uh, are mainly focused on uh, the result in each game. So David gets a nice fifteen hundred pounds for his win today. That's not. That's, that's a know, nice chunk of money. I mean, e even even at you know for a six hour game, that's yeah. not a that's not a shabby hourly no, rate. That's that's pretty good, I would say. Yeah. And uh, Jambi, great win for David. Jay Scott, uh, he believes in Nils tomorrow. Maybe Nils will bring out his best preparation against the Berlin. Yeah, it, I mean, tomorrow's game will be very interesting. Uh, and we discussed it earlier today. Uh, maybe you save some of the preparation for later in the match when you when you need to to bring uh, up the ante a bit and uh, surprise uh, your opponent. So, yeah. Yeah, maybe you, know, you probably do. You don't start going all out tomorrow, uh, you know, in, uh, in game five, you know. Uh, you've still got plenty of white pieces left, but uh, but maybe you choose a slightly riskier option, you mm -hmm. know, uh, something a little bit sharper. Maybe maybe instead of taking on the Berlin, we'll see uh, Nils move a move a different piece on the first go. I I don't know Nils's opening repertoire particularly well, uh, but I I assume most most top players can play both d4 and d4, as well as you know catch some of these knight f3 things. So yeah. maybe, maybe he'll sidestep David's Berlin. And uh, and do something else. Yeah. But, uh, but I mean, hopefully, yeah, I'll be looking forward to to seeing what happens and uh, and what it is that Niels chooses to do. Absolutely. And uh, we will be joined by David uh, shortly uh, to talk about his uh, win. And uh, Ratters in the Wild early prediction: David will win again tomorrow. Mm. Wow, that's. Uh, that's a bold prediction. That's a bold prediction, uh, at least based on how uh, black the black player has done so far in this match. Um, but yeah, I mean, it can happen if, if Nils kind of tries to over push a bit with the white pieces. You never know. Uh, maybe some maybe comes out with the king's gambit to, to yeah, avoid the burden. Who know. knows? And, and we, we saw that in the in the world championship match, uh, Magnus uh, winning with the black pieces as well in the second half of the match. So. Um, I mean, it can definitely happen, um, but I, I would assume David is is uh, more than happy with the draw with the with the black pieces tomorrow. But obviously, they do have this extra incentive of winning each game. So um, yeah, I if, mean, if he gets a chance, he'll he'll go for it. Yeah, he'll, maybe he smells blood in the water and he'll yeah. say, you know, uh, Nils is a wounded animal. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. But uh, but no, I, I think all, all things being equal, David will not be unhappy with the draws. And because uh, yeah, it's, it's always nice, you know, uh, you plot the first half of the match and the second half of the match. It'd be nice to go in into the into the second half with with the lead. Uh, I believe David will also have uh, have three whites after the rest day and only two blacks. Yeah. So it'll be a, a very positive situation to be in the match. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, at the halfway stage. But, and, and with the rest day on Monday, I do expect, I mean, they are probably tired right now, but I expect a, a great fight uh, tomorrow as well and, and another long game. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. And uh, my call, it will be a grand victory by Nils tomorrow. And Jay Scott, Nils typically keeps Queen on when Black plays to Berlin. Yeah, absolutely. 
so far. Uh, we haven't seen an early clean trade uh, in the Berlin, so that's um, so an interesting game. And Gorman, well-deserved David, great player and commentator. And speaking of the devil, both players are here, I think. So, um, yeah, I'll give up my uh, give up my seat, and uh, we'll figure out the logistics here. Absolutely. Yeah, both of you just want to sit down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys. No, no, no. Saturday night. Okay. Honestly, we, you know, at some stage we thought maybe even far more moves than 86. We, we, we <laughs> do you hold the record for the most games going sort of beyond 150 moves? Something like that. So uh, we were having having that. I mean, oh, it's always a pleasure. Yeah, maybe Neil's can join us. Oh, sure, sure. Just stand uh, yeah. the. Yeah. Uh, we can go here, yeah? Yeah. 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 At some point I was tempted to just kind of wait 50 minutes and play G4. Yeah. 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 <laughs> But okay, there's no real point. Yeah. I might confuse myself. So, yeah, yeah, so you have you have this board, and uh, I see, yeah, 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 so I guess the opening is some kind of modern area, yeah, it's modern, 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 just three five is modern theater, and this is one of the lines, it looks a little bit strange, but yeah, uh, this I think has all been played, or at the very least, it's I think they've corresponded. Uh -huh. I briefly yeah. looked. Think, but I'm relying on opening preparation from once Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, so h4 is interesting because in general you have to do something here, but otherwise the two bishops will compensate yeah. for uh, at least. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, but okay. So here you are saying f6 probably. Ah, uh, f6. Or no, or we should be six first, or what did you yeah, say? Yeah, bishop b6. I mean, this is what I was looking at. Ah, we should be six. H5 H5 and just bishop g. Ah, bishop g7 instead, yeah. I mean, black has to be slightly careful. Because you have this pawn on h6, yeah, a little yeah. bit of a hook. But then, okay, king of a bit dangerous, but like a, yeah, yeah, yeah. a king g8. And... and the point is that I'm liquidating the king queen side. Like, yeah, if you go here, I will always play a5, h4, and everything comes off basically. You know? Yeah, yeah. And then at least you just go f6, I think the king's safe enough in g8. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. So, no, I understood that it's probably more solid, but I wanted, I thought this was in interesting because. At H5 could turn out to be a witness as well. On the other hand, this bishop on H6. Yeah, G5 is much more ambitious. I mean, it's more ambitious, but it's also uh, more risky, of course. So take. Oh, yeah, take. Yeah. Uh, we take C6, bishop E6. Oh, yeah, here I was expecting F6. I hear you were expecting F6. Just because you get king F6. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I wasn't entirely sure what happens if rook C7. Yeah. Um... Maybe just king f7. King f7, yeah. And if I take, if you take, let's say. Yeah. Or knight c3 first, I don't know, let's say you take. Mm -hmm. oh, gosh. I should remember from a couple of months ago. I have from a couple of months ago. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, it's it's, it's hard to say, probably it's also, it's possible, yeah. But I thought this is principle because I'm trying to keep. Uh, uh, but here, yeah, maybe I should not go for this sort of depressing ending. Yeah, with a rook fb8. So David, we had we had a question about about this position because sure. obviously, obviously you spent maybe fifty minutes on on castles, castles and uh, originally we had this position, and I said I, I would want to play king d two very very quickly in this position. Yeah. But when you when you played castles, we thought maybe your idea was to to go f four if if black didn't go rook from f uh, f eight to c eight. Yeah, uh, f four is definitely an idea in some position. I have basics the whole time between king. D2. Because king d2 is right, and uh, I love having a king in the center, just <laughs> let alone in this position. But then it's sometimes tactically a bit weak with d2, as was mentioned. D8 or even yeah, rook fd8. Maybe even rook fd8 yeah. and some tricks. Yeah, rook fb8 and then black's always king b7 very quickly. And b2 will hang with check, and it's a bit. Uh... I was trying to make it work, but as you mentioned, castles, at least it has the benefit of quick and f4 sometimes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Rook a1 very quickly. Yeah, like if I play something like Rook FB8, which I think is more more ambitious than, I mean, I wasn't sure about that for, but I also don't think it's uh, it's winning for White. Yeah, it's... I at least wanted to pay you with the step already. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not so easy to, uh, to tell what is going on here. Yeah. So I don't know what you guys thought of commentary, but 
And well, actually, uh, the conclusion passes is the only way to. Yeah, so basically, we came to the conclusion if if you could go King D2 and Niels would play Rook FC8, you'd be very happy. Oh, but, 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 uh, yeah. but maybe castles would force Niels into going for this, this ending. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. The problem is, this ending is just a really twice at 50. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I also consider it to be a sort of very easily drawn, so I probably relaxed even a bit. I was also, I don't know if you guys, instead of castles, looked at Rooks, and um, um, there's some lines. Uh, <laughs> yeah, not so much. Yeah, yeah, actually, seven, uh, Rook FC8. Yeah. Think, seven, but the, yeah, yeah. Yeah. To be honest, I think we got as low as Rook C2, and, and uh, we said that this, was, this wasn't how you were going to play the position. Yeah. But, uh, but I think if, maybe if Black doesn't have Bishop here, then I'm just castling and. Bishop c4, there's having followed by king one. It should be f8, there yeah. would be seven. It would be seven. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting, but bishop. I, I think bishop b7 will be pretty kills all the fun because b2 hangs. No, I mean, maybe. I mean, maybe this ending is. Yeah. I mean, but, but here I started to uh, miss a lot of things. So. Because, of course, my idea is that I want my bishop on g7 and go on the diagonal. So it makes no sense to go to f8, but I can play. Rook uh, B7, for instance, instead. I guess you Maybe have to Rook take... A1. Rook A1 first, yeah? Try and delay it. I wasn't sure exactly where you put it. Yeah. It doesn't allow me to make okay. it more. Uh, and never mind. Yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe you can play Rook A1 first, yeah. yeah. And then uh, it's still not so easy to... Uh... I was at least trying to scare you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit scary, yeah. But so, so Bishop F8. Uh, it has the yeah. benefit of forcing you to take, but the rook c1, and here I guess I should play something like rook b7. Yeah, and the bishop c7 immediately. And yeah, as soon as you move, let's say I go here, and once we trade the bishops, it's um, very close to a draw. Yeah. Basically, just to go on. Yeah, but I don't know, I mean, I mean, you probably wouldn't have played the... Uh... Bishop d4? But what else? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. You're going rook c7. Maybe rook c7. I wasn't bishop sure. My bishop. I thought trading rooks is not so easy, but yeah, just continue the harassing. Yeah. But bishop g7, also, yes. Yeah, I mean, I was slightly hoping for king f7 because at least then I get this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I assume I completely missed uh, the idea to go rook c7, bishop c5. It's, uh, after this, it's uh, already a bit unpleasant, I guess. And if I go here now. Rook c6. Yeah, rook c6 or even rook c5 first, actually. Ah, okay. I mean, just uh, it's a little bit annoying to have this pawn on a dark square, so now I have to go here. Rook c6. Rook c6. I cannot really trade, yeah, that's the problem. So I basically, I just lost this very important. Uh, yeah, I know we were looking at this, and then, you know, the, yeah, white plays g4, rushes the king to e4. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if I can't trade yeah, the bishops. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. If I can't trade the bishops, it's very scary, of course, yeah. yeah. But if I play like one accurate move, then I'm trading bishops on the next move, and it's not really. Yeah. I mean, no, it's, of course, white will play on. It's definitely uh, white will make make move, but the drawing modern, I guess, is quite big. Yeah. Also, when we trade, king takes, I can maybe also king h6, provoking g4, and then it's even safer. Uh, so sure. In general, it's four against four, and I have very safe. Uh, yeah. White one, cannot penetrate. Yeah. only one weakness. Exactly, exactly. And also, my king is sort of safe. Yeah? But now it's already very, uh, very scary because. I mean, I could try rook b8, rook e8, and then bishop e7, but uh, it's very slow. I was wondering if you... <laughs> but the problem is when you go rook e8, I go rook e6. Uh, then you go, yeah, exactly. No, but it's simply, I, simply I mean, I'm trading the bishops, yeah, yeah. so it's very unpleasant. That's why I went for this rook ending, because I thought uh, by force it could be... Yeah. No, I, I think we thought this was the right decision to... Yeah, yeah you, get, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't sit and wait. For, yeah, yeah, for exactly. Really but yeah. on the other hand, it's very bad. Uh, it is. It's very hard. To it's very hard to defend. I think. Yeah. yeah, but yeah. it's on the other hand uh, probably a draw if we correct them. But very hard to take. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I think. So. I don't know. Maybe five king e six, king f. I mean, try to keep the pawn back on h seven because uh, when the pawn advances, it's much riskier. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so probably, but on the other hand, yeah, it's very hard to not play g four as well here. Uh, yeah, I, I I don't think G4 was a mistake at all. But, you know, it's I hard think, to say. Uh, but uh, and then okay, I don't know where it went from, like objective to objectively lost, but uh, very unpleasant. The whole thing. Maybe just Rook B and Rook A5 was the one. Uh, yeah, here I have blundered the pawn with B4. But already, I mean, I mean, it's but if King H3, King will come F3. I mean, hard to yeah. say if it's a draw still, but it's very um, with the pawn on H7. Of course, it's better chances, much better chances. Yeah. Uh, 
I mean, here I, mean, I think it's normal. Like in a practical game, it's very hard to get. Yeah. So e even after the H pawn, it, it looked like you. Uh, no, but okay, yeah. this is just having I mean, easily winning. Yeah. So. But actually, uh, yeah, I wasn't sure if I don't get chief very quickly if your rook comes round. That's why I tried to keep the rook stranded on. Uh, like this, yeah. Uh, because I couldn't really see a way. Like for example, if I, I don't know, your rook out, put it on B two, E two, something. It's hard for me to actually start pushing it. Why? Um, I mean, for example, if your rook was on e2 here, it wasn't quite exactly how I'm uh -huh, So, like king, uh, king h3, you put the rook on f2. I put it on f2, but the rook h3, yeah, g3, king d4, f4. Maybe by then you just, yeah, I mean, probably it's still. She's helping me like it should be. Uh, I mean, too many problems. It's one yeah. pawn, but also very bad structure as well. Yeah. We, we, we had the situation uh, around about when he got rook h5, and yeah, uh, so. Got the cage five in for the first time and I'm okay. around so much. Yes, yeah, so you're messing around around like, right here. I was annoyed at myself for not going G five actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Silly, yeah. No, we, we and then you you reach the situation where okay, we get to A three at some point. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Yeah. So, but you rejected going to, going into this ending. Uh, with, with yeah, with the G with the E and G pawns yeah. against. Uh, I, I mean, I, yeah. I assume that you you thought that was winning for white, but maybe not technically the most easy. Exactly. Um, and, and I thought, okay, I can do it in 40 minutes if I want to back around. And, so like, we uh, we thought that what you were doing was made an awful lot of sense, but uh, but chat pointed out that actually at, at some stage things got a bit got a bit strange. Close to a threefold, right? Well, no, no, no. I mean, not even not the threefold. Basically, around about here, it's. Uh, uh, black can play e6 and set up some kind of fortress. Oh, with the rook with the, yeah, with the rook over here. I, I think I thought I could always come round. You can always come round. I think even even in this position here with rook h6, I think apparently oh, wow. okay. pawn to e6 and king g3. I I, I'm not sure. Yeah, so here and I, I assume the idea there's rook b1 here. Oh, no, there is no well, g5. The idea is because if you're in position with white to play with the rook on b8, then I go g5. I'm just winning, but yeah, oh, with the king on g2. Oh, there was a moment with the king on g2. Ah, the point is, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I mean, e6 was such a bad move for, for so long, we assumed yeah. that you basically deleted it from uh, yeah, but okay, from possibilities, but no, but of course, with king, yeah, like it doesn't make that much sense to white have the king on g2 when it could be on g2, yeah, it was on g3 all the time, yeah. I, I just kind so, of panicked earlier, so e6, yeah. uh, ah, e6 is yeah. interesting. But that in-game with E and G, I was just worried that if my G pawn drops, then there's this kind of defense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but you know, E and G is never easy. Yeah. yeah. I had it once. Uh, it was uh, I won it, but it was a penalty draw. So. Yeah. No, no. I think I think we were surprised that he didn't go G five as well. That yeah. Was, yeah. That, that, that yeah, seemed, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. seemed like this, the, the way that he planned to do it from from a long way off. Exactly. We, we loved the book maneuver and, and everything seems seems fantastic. But, yeah. yeah. I but, think I just got enticed by winning a second pawn, and then I realized, oh, God, it's not so easy. And then I went back <laughs> yeah. to square one and lost the trade slightly. So. Wow. I mean, thank you to both of you yeah. for, for coming along. It's, you it's know, a fan, fantastic fighting game. Like, you know. <laughs> yeah. Fighting uh, chess indexes. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, uh, absolutely. And, you know, congratulations, David, for, for today, and best of luck to, the, to both of you for the rest of the match. Yeah, cheers, Tom. Thanks. <laughs> You wanna you wanna come join me and we'll uh, we'll wrap this thing up. We'll do six so, six more hours. <laughs> <and I'll> do... <laughs> so so where where was this this ending? Uh... Yes, uh, Saturday night. This, the party is just about to come to start. No, so that was great to get the the players' insight to this uh, fascinating game uh, and tricky end game uh, with this e6 idea. Uh, but as we assumed, uh, none of the players actually found this. Uh, very, uh, yeah, very interesting way of setting up a fortress. Um, and uh, yeah, you have the first win of the match, which uh, hopefully will, uh, will uh, give us more uh, fighting chess uh, in the days to come. Absolutely. So, so you'll be back uh, same, be, same time tomorrow. Same time uh, tomorrow. And uh, another uh, international master will join me then, uh, Callum. Uh, Callum Kilpatrick. Callum Kilpatrick, that's correct. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh -huh. And thank you so much, Tom. You oh, did yeah. a great job today. Yeah, you're very welcome. I, I, I definitely enjoyed myself. And uh, tomorrow I'm going to enjoy myself. I'm going to sit and, and watch this game from afar. And, yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah. Uh, maybe maybe we'll see an explosive King's Eye attack and a nice 
a nice 30 move game instead of yeah, we'll, we'll 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 I'm up for anything. We have the rest day on Monday, so I'm ready to go again tomorrow. Fantastic. So thank you all for watching, and uh, we'll be back tomorrow at uh, 2 GMT and 3 CET. So hope to see you then. Have a good night. Bye, everyone. I'm ahead of the game. Remember who am I? I'm a boss and I'm honestly up my rocker, but follow me, I'm ahead.